Okay, thank you all for joining us. We have two minutes before the beginning of the program. We're joined at nine o'clock sharp. And I thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I'll begin at that point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for joining us and welcome to the eighth annual beekeeping in the panhandle um, workshop and conference. This originally has been an event we've held live for many, many years, uh, for eight years actually, and uh, live at the UF IFAS Extension office in Washington County in Shipley, Florida. And we've have uh, this started uh, about 10 years ago, we, we, we skipped a couple of years, so that's, a, it's, well, that's why it's the eighth annual, but uh, with uh, Roy Carter, uh, extension agent of Gulf County, and his uh, successor after he retired, Ray Baudry, is, is on this, this, uh, this event today uh, uh, in Gulf County. And, and it started with a need for beekeepers requesting education. So we developed this program in conjunction with the UF IFAS Extension Bee Lab, the uh, FEDAX, um, Bureau of Apiary Inspection and uh, with speakers from all around the U.S. that we've, we've had and the state of Florida. So thank you all for joining us. My name is Matthew Orwat and I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent for Washington County and we have a lot of uh, uh, great people here today. Uh, this this is uh, uh, Scott Jackson is here today. He is our lead Zoom uh, person. He, he is running the Zoom uh, for us and he's also an expert at technology and he's also the uh, county director and Sea Grant agent in Bay County and we also have Ray Baudry with us and Ray is the um, county director Sea Grant and everything else agent in Gulf County and he uh, when Roy Carter retired he has that position now we have Daniel Leonard here and Daniel Leonard is from Calhoun County he's a county director in Calhoun County and he took Judy Biss's position and Judy Biss was the uh, chair of this before I was, the uh, beekeeping in the panhandle. And due to this coronavirus, we had to move to an online format. And I thank you all for being flexible and, and joining us this morning. We currently have 128 participants and I expect several more. So let me get on uh, to talk about some of our uh, panelists today. Uh, most of them are with us. This, actually, all of them are with us right now. So let's, let me go down the agenda and, and, and relay this information to you. So. We have David Westervelt, and he will be doing a brief introduction uh, to beekeeping and talking about his role with the Florida Beekeeping Association as educational coordinator. Did I, did I get that right, David? Okay, and then we have, um, we have actually, we have Brandy, Brandy uh, Stanford here, and she is the uh, uh, FDAX uh, a Bureau of Apiary Inspection Chief. She is here. And her husband, Brandon, uh, Brandon is here and he works for the UF IFAS Bee Lab and we'll giving a, a presentation later today on bee equipment. We have uh, David Wick, our keynote speaker, is from Montana, joining us all the way from Montana. And he 
is an expert on B viruses and has worked in that field for a while and has a business devoted to that. We have uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Pippin, uh, and, and Jeffrey Pippin is a B inspector with uh, FDAX and he will be giving a presentation on open hives today. And we also have uh, Stephen Cutts. And Stephen Cutts has been a, uh, what I call a, a fixture in our beekeeping in the panhandle uh, events for his smoker lighting uh, contests and his open hive demonstrations. So we're gonna get to have him too. So we are really excited about the lineup today. Um, we also have, we'll be having at 2.30, to, from 2.30 to 3, uh, a Q&A session. So please feel free to ask your questions. So what we'll do is we will answer a limited number of questions after each talk. Uh, you can type, and you can type all of your questions in the box down at the bottom that says Q&A, and you can type those. And then what we'll do, and, and then uh, during David Wick's talk, we're gonna interrupt him periodically to answer questions, or uh, so he'll pause and we'll have some questions that can be answered during the talk, and that's fine too. And the person moderating all the questions is not me, actually, th thankfully, it's Ray Baudry. And so Ray will be moderating all the questions for us. Um, so with that, without further ado on, on that, uh, we're gonna, until 9.15, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, David Westervelt. And David Westervelt used to be the, uh, Apiary uh, Bureau of uh, Apiary Inspection Chief until he retired and, and then became connected with the uh, Florida State Beekeepers Association. So I'm gonna, let's turn this over to David. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, it's great to be back here and uh, social uh, distancing uh, has got us all sitting on our couches and enjoying our uh, new office spaces, I guess you can say. And uh, it's great to actually be able to do some of these talks uh, even though we're not together, but we can all believe we're all sitting around together. Uh, one of my new job titles since I've retired now is actually being the CEO, as I like to call it. It's the chairperson of education and outreach for the Florida Department uh, or the Florida State Beekeepers Association. And what we actually do is with the Florida State Beekeepers, I was doing workshops and doing the educational programs exactly the same as what we've been doing. Now we're all going to have to go online. Uh, we've been planning our 100 year anniversary, which as of yesterday, we've decided it's going to have to be uh, online. We're going to do virtually the same, either Zoom or some of the different uh, media programs that are out there. Uh, staying in touch with the beekeepers, making sure that everybody can get information that they need. With Florida gaining so many new beekeepers, backyard sideliners, and actually getting new commercial beekeepers in there, we need the education to continue. We need to be able to reach the beekeepers, uh, keep them happy with what's going on. Uh, just in the last three weeks, it's amazing how many new backyard beekeepers i guess people not being able to get out they want to do a new hobby so they're starting by going by beekeeping operations that are still open they're essential to uh, agriculture so all of the data ant man lake dnj apier south florida bee supply millie bee all of them are still open allowing people to purchase bee equipment and uh, that has really gained an interest we're seeing. Uh, we, I've been contacted fairly often, almost every day by new beekeepers. Uh, the other programs that we're working on still are queen breeding. We're trying to get queen breeders that will be in a sideline facility so that they could actually produce queens uh, certified through the state so that the backyard beekeepers can get the supply of queens, which is something that's very needed right now. Uh, beekeepers in the backyard operations are not able to purchase queens from some of the larger commercial queen producers. So that's something we're working on. The other programs we've been working on was uh, trying to get a bee tag, uh, save the bee. Uh, and as of 
the end of March, it was actually sidelined along with the funding that we were trying to get $250,000 for the B lab. Both of those were sidelined uh, due to uh, probably COVID-19. So uh, they didn't want to spend extra money right now for the bees and save the bees. So those are some of the programs that the Florida State Beekeepers Association is working on. Uh, you can join actually by going on the Florida State Beekeepers Association website. Uh, there's a free application that you can do if you want to be a voting member. You have to be a paid member. So those are good spots to start with. Uh, you can also go on Facebook. We have Facebook and we have a Twitter account. So those are some of the things for the Florida State Beekeepers. Uh, the other program I work with is a nonprofit, which is Bees Beyond Borders. We actually do work educational programs throughout the Caribbean and South America. Uh, right now, all of that's been put on hold. We are looking at doing some uh, online outreach with that. Uh, some of the areas we've worked in are Haiti, Barbados, uh, Guyana. So those are areas that we're still looking at to work with. And uh, the other stuff that I actually work with, uh, other title I have is with uh, chairing the research committee for the American Beekeeping, uh, which uh, the American Beekeeping Federation has a program right now that's uh, citizen science. You can go on, register as a beekeeper, and actually start uh, working with BIP, who does citizen science. Uh, they actually sample your hives once a month and see what they can find virus related and bacteria and make sure your mites and everything. Uh, it's mainly a citizen science program that uh, the ABF actually pays a part of your fee that the BIP would gain on that. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Matt. I won't eat up all 15 minutes of it. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, David. Uh, somehow my video, Scott, are you going to fix my video here? I can't get the video back. It says because the host has stopped it. So I guess Scott, there we go. Scott fixed it. There we go. Hey, Scott. Okay, thanks. So, um, so what we're uh, doing now is, uh, I, there we go. I, I'm having a hard time seeing myself on here. Scott, can, can anyone, can everyone see me? Can you see me? Yes, I can see it. I can see you, Matt. Okay, for some you. reason. Okay, good. So, uh, so what we're doing now is uh, I just I just wanted to open it up to Ray in case there are any questions for David. I saw some questions pop up, so let's just let a few minutes go for uh, maybe two or three minutes of questions for for David Westerville, and Ray can moderate those. Ray, are you there? I think we lost her. I'm here. No, I think I think he's here. Okay, so uh, could, uh, we have a, might have a couple questions for David. If you if we spend a minute or two, we can uh, answer those questions. I've got a couple um, that um, we can I can ask now, but it looks like um, they were just before his talk. Uh, more general questions. We'll save those for. Uh, after, um, after okay. some of the later talks, okay? Okay, it looks like okay for now. Looks like we're good for now then. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. So, uh, excellent. So now uh, we're gonna get a little ahead of schedule, which is fine uh, for Brandy. Uh, Brandy uh, Stanford is, is going to be giving a talk. Uh, she is uh, the uh, Florida's Apiary and Inspection, uh, Bee Inspection Program Bureau Chief. 
and she's going to be giving a talk on uh, apiary inspection program and the rules and regulations uh, uh, in that um, in that area. And this will be going on. Um, this will be going on at uh, from nine fifteen until ten fifteen. So I'm going to turn the floor over to her. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, like you said, my name is Brandy Stanford. I'm the Assistant Bureau Chief for the Apiary Inspection Program within the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about Florida's Apiary Inspection Program, what we do, as well as some of the rules and regulations that affect you guys as beekeepers here in Florida. So I'm going to try to share my presentation with you all. Are we good there? Can everybody see that? Yes. yes. All right, perfect. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Florida's apiary rules and regulations. So a little bit about me. Like I said, that's my title as the Assistant Bureau Chief of Apiary Inspection. But before coming to the Department of Agriculture, I worked for Jamie Ellis at the University of Florida for about five years. So I started out as a research assistant in his lab and then later became the lab manager. Um, then David Westervelt hired me over to FDAX and I worked with him for about a year before he, his retirement. And then I became the um, assistant bureau chief about a year and a half ago. Um, Brandon and I, you saw him earlier in the video, he and I got married last April and Jamie Ellis officiated. So for those of you who know him, you'll see him up there in that picture. Um, and we're also expecting a little girl in two months. So that's a little bit about me. So now um, let's get into Florida's apiary industry. So here in Florida, right now we're around 4,700 registered beekeepers. So we have quite a few beekeepers in the state. With those beekeepers come approximately 630,000 managed hives. So we're one of the largest beekeeping states in the country. Um, you know, beekeepers can do all sorts of things. We have backyard beekeepers who do this more as a hobby with just a few hives. We have commercial beekeepers who do this as a full-time living. And those in between who, you know, maybe it started out as a hobby, but you're working on transitioning more towards um, this becoming a full-time thing. So beekeepers, Commercial beekeepers do a lot of pollination services. So that's one of the arguably the most important thing that um, beekeepers do, pollination to get increased crops for, for growers. Um, honey production, of course, that's what most people, a lot of people get into beekeeping for in the first place, you know, have that honey. Um, uh, some other things that beekeepers don't, or that we don't always think about beekeepers doing is product and like hive product. Um, production or hive product sales. So you can do all kinds of things with wax, with honey, you can make lip balms, you can make salves and soaps and tinctures and all different things. Um, so that's another reason that some beekeepers get into the, to this um, hobby. There's also equipment sales, bee sales, you name it. You can do kind of all, all sorts of different things as a beekeeper. So here in Florida, this chart's a little bit interesting. We have a lot of backyard beekeepers. Probably, let's see, 88% um, of the beekeepers we have are backyard. But with that, 94% of the colonies that are managed in Florida are managed by commercial beekeepers. So if you think about that, we have so many individual people who keep bees, but those, those individuals keep many fewer colonies than the smaller number of individuals who keep the 94% of the hives here in Florida. So that's just an interesting, you know, breakdown. So you can see that most of our beekeepers are backyard, but most of our bees are operated by commercial beekeepers. So a little bit about our inspection program. We have currently 10 full-time apiary inspectors here in Florida. We have two inspection supervisors. So Florida is split into districts and each inspector is assigned to a district. And then each in, um, each supervisor is oversees a region. So North Florida is region one, and then South Florida is region two. We have an administrative assistant who helps us out with, you know, administrative things, and then also myself. So we have a staff, a full staff of 14 individuals right now. Um, you can see, so 
these numbers I just pulled yesterday. So we have quite a few beekeepers in some of these districts. We're working on thinning that out a little bit, but if you notice, the teal area has 700 beekeepers to just one inspector. So it makes it a little bit hard sometimes for us to get out to see everybody, um, but we're, we do our best to make it out there. So about an average, of course, this isn't even across the board, but an average of about 470 beekeepers assigned to each inspector and about 63,000 colonies under each inspector's purview on average. The rules that we follow, or the, the laws and the rules that we regulate under is chapter 586 of the Florida statutes and rule 5B54, the Florida Administrative Code. If you guys ever want to have some light reading, those are great places to go, but I'll give you some, I'll try to go over the, the parts that are important to you guys today so that you don't want to go read that paper. Um, you'll get most of the key points out of it. So a little bit about what we do. We do, the biggest thing we do is routine inspections. So that's what our inspection program is here for, to inspect. Um, there's a bacterial disease called American foul brood that is our primary regulatory focus. So whenever we go out and do these routine health inspections in beekeepers colonies, we're looking for symptoms of American foul brood, as well as any other pest or disease concerns that might pop up. We also monitor apiary compliance with the best management requirements, which I'll get into in a little while. Um, and then just like I mentioned, pests and diseases in general is kind of our, that's what we're here for is a regulatory mission. We inspect backyard beekeepers and we inspect commercial beekeepers. Those inspections look quite a bit different. So if you notice in the picture, the backyard beekeeper inspections might just be, you know, very calm and casual, whereas the commercial beekeeper inspections can get pretty, pretty chaotic. There's a lot of hives, a lot of bees going on. Usually commercial beekeepers will send part of their crew out to help conduct these inspections. So um, every day as an inspector looks a little bit different, just depending on what you have going on. We also do certifications. So we, as I mentioned, pollination is a really big deal. So bee, beekeepers, especially commercial beekeepers, will send a lot of their hives out to California each year for almond pollination. And Florida supplies about 10% of the colonies needed for almond pollination in California. So it's on average, they need about 2 million colonies. I think that's growing a little bit, but around 2 million colonies in California to sustain their almond pollination. And Florida provides 10% of that from all the way over here across, across the country. So our inspectors issue out-of-state permits. They inspect those colonies, make sure that they're free of unwanted pests or diseases, issue these certifications so that beekeepers can move throughout, the, you know, to the state that they're going to for pollination, for honey, or whatever reason. Also, if people are planning to sell queen bees, then we can do an inspection, pull some samples, and issue a queen certification so that beekeepers can sell bees. And for those of you who are up in the panhandle, you may have already done this with Jeff, but you, if you're um, planning to sell Tupelo honey, we can take samples of the honey and do a Tupelo honey certification. So a few different things going on there. One of my favorite slides. Um, in addition to just the inspections, we do consumer services because believe it or not, sometimes your neighbors are not always thrilled that you have bees. So our inspection program serves as sort of a liaison between you as the beekeeper and other individuals who may have problems, you know, they could have been stung, they could just be concerned about having bees next door. So we, we really work to try to resolve consumer complaints about bees and try to educate the public about the importance of them so that there are less issues in the future. Um, we get calls a lot about feral bee colonies. So we serve as a resource. We have a list on our website of people who are trying to get rid of their colonies. We have service provider, a list of service providers who we can share that information with to the homeowner and they can find somebody, either a beekeeper or a pest control operator who can come out and remove their bees. Um, you participate in bee kill response. So if you as the beekeeper have a concern of a pesticide kill or something else in the going on in your hives, you call your inspector. Inspector will come out and take a look and see what's going on. Um, if there are, if it seems to be a management issue, we'll talk with you about that. 
but if we can't pinpoint some pest or disease issue or management problem going on, we'll work with the Division of Agricultural Environmental Services. And they're just another division in the Florida Department of Agriculture. Um, and they will come out and we can pull samples with them and they will run the samples from the contents in your hives, like honey, wax, dead bees, whatever they're, whatever we need to pull. Um, and they'll screen those for pesticides so that we can see if there was any misuse of chemicals that happened in or around your apiary that could have contributed to the bee kill. And lastly, we also work with um, the Office of Agricultural Law Enforcement, local sheriff's offices, highway patrol, whatever um, enforcement agencies are involved with bee thefts, with trespassing hives. So sometimes, unfortunately, beekeepers may not have permission to put hives on a certain property. So we'll work with law enforcement to try to either identify that those hives, who which beekeeper they belong to, so that we can reunite those hives with that beekeeper, um, or just work with the with the agency to get them moved um, in the interim. So as our inspection program, we also participate in a few um, exotic pest monitoring programs. So we participate in the National Honeybee Survey each year. Um, this is just a survey of like, it's a comprehensive examination of colony health across the country. So here in Florida, we sample from beekeepers, from usually migratory beekeepers, we sample for varroa, we sample for um, viruses, bacterial diseases, other exotic pests that have not yet made it to the United States, like tropolalaps, um, and a few other things. And so we send those kits off and the, the results are provided online on um, USDA's website for anyone to see. And then we also do our own bait hive survey here in Florida. So we have a lot of ports of entry being that we're a peninsula. So our inspectors manage bait hives or kind of like swarm traps as you would know them at the ports around Florida. And we monitor those and pull samples from the bees inside to make sure that no exotic pests are coming in because bees could be coming in on cargo ships from other countries, cruise ships, you name it. And they could have feral swarms on them. So we just, we maintain these traps to try to protect Florida's beekeeping industry and the rest of the U.S.'s beekeeping industry as well um, to make sure that no pests are coming in that come in quietly that we don't find out about until it's too late. And then finally, we do a little bit of outreach here and there. Um, we all, our inspection program always participates at the Florida State Fair. We're heavily involved with Bee College. Um, we work closely with UF IFAS on a lot of these events, like, um, like the Panhandle Beekeeping Workshop. So thank you, Matt, and everyone who came together to put this together again. Um, we love being a part of stuff like this, and we're glad that we can talk to you guys about beekeeping and, and the rules. So that's an overview of our program, of our inspection program, and what we do, what we're here for. So now the fun part is what the rules and regulations are. So we'll get into that. Um, I do have some true or false questions. I don't, I don't know if we're able to pull those polls up, but if we are, then you guys are welcome to answer. Otherwise, I'll give you a few seconds to think about the question and then we'll move on and I'll, I'll help you out. So true or false, only beekeepers with 100 or more colonies must be registered with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. You guys think that's true? False. So every beekeeper, regardless of the number of colonies that they have, must register with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So this image on the right side is what that certificate of beekeeping registration looks like. So you'll get one of those renewed annually when you're a bee when you are registered. Um, and so the question I usually get at this point is, well, how do I register? So the easiest thing to do is for you to get in contact with your local apiary inspector. Have questions about where to find their contact information or you know who your inspector is feel free to put those questions in the chat or you can visit fdax.gov and you can just google apiary inspector or type in the search bar apiary inspector and it will give you the full list of inspectors by split up by county so that you can get in touch with them usually what happens is they'll come out and visit your hives do an inspection 
you can provide them with the application and your um, your registration fee and then you're good to go for a year. Um, alternatively, you can register online before getting your inspection. Um, so you would similarly just go to fdax.gov, submit this application that you see here on the right and pay your registration fee. Registration fees in Florida are based on the number of colonies you manage. So if you have one to five colonies, you'll pay $10 a year as a registration fee. And it goes up to, if you have 500, 501 colonies or more, then it'll be $100 a year. Um, and so you'll submit that information. You'll be issued a registration number or a firm number, which we'll talk a little bit about shortly. And then your inspector can contact you to schedule your first inspection. So there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to put those in the box and we can talk about them at the end. So I mentioned this inspection, right? So what does that really look like? Um, our inspections are visual examinations of the colony. So the inspectors, they're with you. They're going to talk to you a little about a bit about what's going on in your hives. Have you had any issues? Anything that you're concerned about? We'll open up the hives with you, go through your colonies, look for any symptoms, any regulated pests or diseases, and then close them back up, fill out some paperwork, and send you on your way. Or well, we'll leave. You'll probably be at home because this is your apiary. Um, whenever we inspect, we always inspect at least 10 colonies if you have that many. So if you have 10 or fewer, we'll inspect 100% of your hives. And then if you get up into those higher numbers, if you have hundreds or thousands of colonies, then we'll be inspecting at least 5% of your total inventory. Um, you know, we don't, if there are some beekeepers here in the state who have 20 or 30,000 hives, so we're not, we don't have quite, quite all the resources to inspect all of those hives, but we will do at least 5% of the inventory if you are a larger scale commercial beekeeper. Just a couple of things to remember, hives do, or bees do have to be kept in hives with movable frames in Florida. So can't keep bees in like a five gallon bucket that doesn't have movable frames. And the main reason for this is as our, for our inspection program to work, we have to be able to see the brood. So we have to be able to move those frames out so that we can look at the brood, make sure that there are no symptoms of these, um, regulated diseases like American fowl brood. Um, so that's the, that's the biggest thing is just make sure that those hives have movable frames. If you're using top bar hives, or Langstroth equipment should be, should be just fine. If you are using top bar hives, however, something to note is you'll have to pull those frames out um, during the inspection, just so that we don't, as the inspector program, we don't, we don't damage your, your top bar frames. And then last but not least, make sure that your apiary is at least accessible. So um, we have to be able to reach your apiary or your hive location of course, in order to be able to conduct an inspection. So that is a part of the rule that you have to at least have a path for us to get there. Um, seems pretty straightforward, but have to mention it. So now a little identification of ownership of your hives. Um, you might have an FL number or a registration number. So that's fine. Um, we've transitioned over to using firm numbers back a few years ago. Um, so any new equipment that you're marking or you're branding, you'll need to mark with your firm number. So that's just an eight digit 4800 number that's assigned to you at the time of your registration and never changes. So you'll just need to mark your hives with that number. This is good for you as a beekeeper, and it's also good for us as the inspection program. If any of those hives are ever stolen, we can make sure that they are, you know, if, if they have your registration number on them, then we can know that they are yours if we, if we are able to recover those stolen hives. Also, if law enforcement or emergency management medical or um, emergency response services come to your property, they need to know whose hives these are. We can, they can give us that number. We can look it up in the database and get in touch with you promptly. So there are a lot of reasons that marking hives is a good idea, um, but it's also required by law. So it doesn't, you don't have to have a formal brand 
like a branding iron. Um, you can spray paint your firm number on these hives. You can use a Sharpie. If you use a Sharpie, the sun is probably gonna fade it out every three months. So um, you might have to re refresh it every, every few months if you use a Sharpie. But um, again, that's just mostly to protect you as the beekeeper and allow us to identify those hives when, um, when needed. If you're a commercial beekeeper, we also ask that you have a sign with some contact information posted in your apiary. Um, this is just to allow quicker, like quicker contact between you and whoever needs to reach you regarding your hives. So the next thing we're going to talk about, true or false, honeybee colonies may be kept on land, may only be kept on land classified as agricultural use. Is that true or false? That is false. So colonies can be located on land classified as agricultural, or it, they can be placed on land classified as non-agricultural, that's integral to a beekeeping operation. And you as the beekeeper follow the best, the best management practices in the beekeeper compliance agreement. So what is that, right? Um, there are a few different things that go along with this compliance agreement. This is what it looks like, but instead we're gonna talk about it on this slide. Um, so one of the big things is, is colony density limits. So if you notice in this top right box, we have a quarter acre or less, and there's three boxes there. So colony density requirement or colony density limits refer to how many hives you can have on what property size if you're on non-ag land. So this, the BMR, this document here, lines all of these different requirements, but it starts with a quarter acre or less. So if your property size is classified as non-ag, you can keep three hives on your quarter acre piece of property. If you have a, half a, a quarter acre to a half acre size property, you can have six colonies and it goes on and on and so forth. Your inspector can help you with this if you have any questions about determining how many colonies you can have. Um, but that's one of the big things that's in the BMR. Another thing is you must have gated controlled entrance. A fence, your, your apiary must be fenced and have gated controlled entrance. So if your, fen, if your yard is already fenced in, that's great. You're good to go. Don't worry about it. But if, you're, if your yard isn't fenced, then we do need to have something to just restrict access to your property. So, you know, the neighbor's kids or pets don't accidentally encounter your bees um, unintentionally. So it doesn't have to be super duper formal structure, but it does need to be a fence of sorts. And um, there we go. A fence and have, a, have some sort of gate source. This is good practice for any beekeeper, regardless of where they're keeping their bees, ag or non ag. But um, it's especially important in those residential areas where your neighbors might have swimming pools or your neighbors might have air conditioning units that condensate in the summer. And then all of your bees decide that they're going to go get water at your neighbor's house. Um, so if you put water closer on your property in your apiary when you set it up, then your hives are going to learn, this is where I should go to get water um, and hopefully mitigate some future issues with, with some of those neighbors. Um, if you're a beekeeper in general, you should also always be practicing swarm control inspecting your colonies regularly and requeening any feral or collected swarms or colonies that you encounter. Um, that is a requirement in the BMR, but it's also just a great practice for, for all beekeepers. And then there's one more thing about distance. So if your colonies are located 15 feet or less or closer than 15 feet to your property line, then it is required for you to have a six foot high flyway barrier. So if your colonies are more than 15 feet from your property line, this is not required. So don't, don't even worry about it. But if you do have your hives within 15 feet of your property line, 
you do need to have a six foot flyway barrier to get those bees flying up and hopefully over your neighbor's property instead of straight through their backyard and causing a nuisance. Um, this could be a, a wall, it could be a six foot privacy fence, it could be a really dense shrub or something of that nature, but again, it does need to extend six foot high. Um, the last thing I'll say about, so, so basically, all of these things, all of these rules are part of keeping bees on non-ag land. So we as the Department of Ag have jurisdiction over where you can place bees. Um, back many, many, many years ago, there were certain counties that tried to do away with beekeeping completely, not allow any, any hives in the whole county, or cities would try to say, all right, no, no beekeeping in this city. There were certain restrictions like you can only have four pets in this city, which is fine, except to them, a colony was not a pet. A bee was a pet. So you weren't able to keep more than four bees, which essentially meant you couldn't be a beekeeper. So there were some issues back, back then, and that's when it was decided that the state would, would regulate location of beehives instead of leaving it up to each individual county. So as long as you're a registered beekeeper and following these rules, we will support you 100%. If code enforcement or other entities are, you know, having issues with, with the bees in your area, we will try to do everything that we can to make sure that you can do that. The two, the two, I guess, jurisdictions that we don't argue with are homeowners associations or deed restrictive communities. The reason for this is homeowners associations, if you live in one of those, you pay fees to be there just like the other members. And by being a member of the, one of those associations, you guys get to come up with your own rules and you pay to have that right. So if your HOA has specific bylaws that say no beekeeping, then this, we're not going to come in and tell them otherwise. And same, with, same goes for those deed restricted communities. If there's a specific deed restriction in your area that says no beekeeping, no agricultural use or anything like that, then that is the rule and you as the beekeeper made the, de the, the decision to, to live there. You can still be a beekeeper though. You can join your local bee clubs. You can work with friends who have properties that can allow, accommodate beekeeping. Um, and you can still be a beekeeper. You just wouldn't be allowed to have hives on that particular piece of property if those rules were in place. Okay, so I hope that is clear as mud. Again, this is just that, this is that document that outlines all of these things. Um, it can be found on our website. You can email me and I can send it to you. You can get in touch with your inspector. They will go over it with you at the time of your inspection anyway. Um, but it is fully available um, if you would, would like to read it. Um, and I can, like I said, I can email it to anyone who's interested. Okay, so. Moving on from that, true or false, it is legal to keep all races and subspecies of honeybees in Florida as long as they do not appear to be aggressive. Do you think this is true or false? False. So in Florida, we cannot keep African subspecies of honeybees, whether they are defensive or not. So a word, the word aggressive gets thrown around in the bee world sometimes, and we don't like to use that word, um, mostly because bees, by nature, are defensive creatures. So bees are herbivores, they feed on plants, so they feed on nectar and pollen from plants, and what do plants not do? They don't really move around, they don't need to be stalked or attacked, so bees don't come with the natural instinct to attack um, or to be aggressive. They will, however, defend. So if you disturb their colony or disturb their nest, they will defend themselves. They will defend the brood. They will defend their food resources. So we like to say honeybees and bees in general are defensive, not aggressive. Um, wasps and yellow jackets, hornets, things like that, they prey on caterpillars, spiders, other insects. So they actually can be described as aggressive because they are you know, they actually have to go attack something to get their food. So that's a little bit of a sidebar, but I just wanted to clarify the difference between defensive and, and aggressive when it comes to honeybees. So bees in general, uh, in Florida, 
well, I think pretty much the whole US says that you can only keep European species of honeybees, subspecies of honeybees. So if we find African bees in your operation through diagnostic testing, we will ask that you re-clean those colonies with European clean that can be purchased by in, from beekeepers in any state, but especially from beekeepers who are certified queen breeders in your local area. Other things that cannot be kept, since we're on that topic, include American foul brood. So we talked a little bit about American foul brood. We'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end of this talk. Um, but foul brood cannot be kept in your operation. It's a regulated pest, regulated disease, sorry, and it will um, wreak havoc in your operation and it's con very contagious to other beekeepers. So we don't want that around. There are also other pests like the triple A mite that are not currently found in the United States and we definitely want to keep it that way. So those might, or if those are found in your operation, we will quarantine and not, um, not allow you to keep those. So a few of the other things that we do here or that we require here in Florida is if you're moving your colonies, you have to have your certificate of beekeeping registration. So if you're moving out of state, you have to have your certificate of beekeeping registration and other states have certain requirements that make them um, like require us as the inspection program to have um, an export certification of sorts. So we as the inspection program will issue those out um, after doing an inspection. Um, let's see. If you're moving into the state, we as Florida require that you either have an inspection certificate from that state or that you have a, um, a registration in Florida already. This is so that we know that you as the beekeeper um, who's bringing hives into the state have clean hives. They're not going to negatively impact Florida's beekeeping industry. Um, so that's, that's really important for us. And then if you're moving hives from apiary to apiary within the state, Again, we just ask that you have that certificate of beekeeping registration. It should show that the numbers on your boxes match the certificate of registration you have, proves ownership of your hives, and it makes sure that if you get pulled over, if you're stopped by law enforcement, you can prove these are mine, I didn't, I didn't steal them from anywhere, and you will be set on your way. So the last thing I had was um, we're going to get into a little bit about American foul brood here. So, true or false, any colony showing symptoms of American foul brood must be destroyed by fire. This is true. So, American foul brood is a spore forming bacterial disease that um, can do a, quite a bit of damage in your hives and then the bees from the surrounding area can come to steal the resources from your hives and they will spread those spores throughout their colonies and it just leads to this domino effect of, of destroying hives in the area. So because this bacteria is spore forming, this means that if it's exposed to dangerous conditions like a antibiotic treatment or some extreme climate, then the, the bacteria can just put a spore coat on and protect itself. And then once that danger or that threat is gone, it can shed the spark coat and be active again. So there are only two main ways right now that we can completely confidently destroy, um, destroy this bacteria. And that's with fire. So burning that colony, bees and the equipment, unfortunately, or by um, treating it with irradiation. So these are the two options if symptoms of American foul brood are found and then confirmed by our diagnostic testing. Um, you can irradiate your equipment. Usually this isn't an economical option for backyard beekeepers. Usually irradiation services are fairly pricey and they're done on a large scale, um, but that is an option if you prefer to go that route instead of, um, instead of burning the equipment. So if you want to treat prophylactically for foul brood in your, in your operation, um, you have an option to treat with antibiotics. Again, 
once American foulbrood is found, we do have to burn it. But some beekeepers choose to treat preventatively for both European foulbrood, which is a non-spore forming bacteria, as well as American foulbrood. So you can do this by visiting, you can get a prescription for this by visiting www.bvfd.com. If you're a registered beekeeper, you can type in your name, type in your firm number, type in how many colonies you're wanting to treat and which treatment you're asking for. And this, this form, this request form will come to our, our inspection program. We will confirm it and like cross-reference it with your apiary registration. And um, then we will go ahead and approve it. It will be sent to a veterinarian who will issue a prescription and you can go buy your prescription at your store of choice. Um, a couple of things about American foulbrood. So how do you look for it in your operation? What should you be looking for? What are the tall tail signs? Um, number one is concave cell cap. So normally healthy brood, very, you know, it's convex. It maybe looks a little bit velvety in, in texture. Um, American foulbrood causes that larva or sorry the pupa underneath that cap to start to deteriorate into rot. So that causes some fermentation and moisture buildup underneath that cell cap and causes it to sink down. So that's why we get those concave cell caps. One of the most sure signs of American foul brood is roping brood. So if you take a toothpick, you know if you know if an inspector's on an inspection and they see concerning brood, you'll see them pull out a toothpick or maybe a little twig from the ground and they'll swirl it around in the cell cap and pull it up. And if the slimy brood actually kind of pulls up with that toothpick, then that's a pretty sure sign that it's American foul brood. Other some more, um, more advanced stages would be dried scale. So this is after that pupa has already had time to rot and go down to the kind of dry down on the bottom of the cell cap and form a scale. So here you kind of see it just looks like almost like a little fish scale down at the bottom of the cell. Um, so that's one of the signs, as well as pupil tongue. So this isn't actually the pupa's tongue, it's just that the, the lar or the pupa has stuck to the top and started to drip down while it's rotted. Pretty, pretty gross. Other signs that um, we will be looking for, but again, these aren't necessarily diagnostic signs, would be perforated capping, spotted brood, or spotty brood, and weak hives. You'll notice a lot of these are also symptoms of varroa or pests, like other pest problems. So we do try to make sure that we have some of these sure, like sure signs, as well as confirm with diagnostic testing if there's any question. And then foul odor, of course. So if those bees just aren't smelling quite right and you see this incredibly, incredibly intense smell, there's, there's a good chance that that's American foul brood. Here's just a full picture of what um, some of the symptoms of American foul brood look like. So here's again, a picture of some of that, the pupil tongue. You see some of these cell cappings are sunken down instead of being, you know, the healthy uniform con con part. Um, see, this is an image of a scale, some melted larvas, perforated cappings. So again, lots of, lots of uh, features on this, on this particular frame of the foul brood. So that's pretty much sums up the rules and regs that I had that I wanted to share with you today. Um, if you are interested in following the division of plant industry on social media or keeping up with what we what we have going on, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook. They recently our our section started up. Um, Vision started a podcast called Plant Industry News. So our director gets on and talks about updates going on in, um, in the division of plant industry. And they also have a blog. So you guys are welcome to follow us on any of that if you would like. And then to conclude, I will happily take some questions. Here is my contact information for anyone who does not have it already. Um, and if you have specific questions, you can also contact our DPI helpline at that number that Okay, thank you, Brandy. Yeah, absolutely. Just a quick
quick uh, recap that everything that we're doing now is being recorded, so you'll be able to view uh, this presentation uh, at a later date. We're going to post it, and it will be available. Um, it'll be available online, and I'll send that out to all the participants that registered on Eventbrite. So um, we have some time, so I'd like to turn this over uh, to Ray Baudry to moderate the questions that have been asked for Brandy, or if there are a couple in there that David needed to answer to. So I'm gonna turn that over to Ray. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Brandy. Uh, lots of great information, very informative. Uh, do have a number of questions for you. Uh, one, uh, and something that's probably on all of our minds, uh, COVID questions, uh, as it refers to extraction and bottling and handling. Um, do you have any insight on anything, any of that? So I personally don't have any um, on that, all honey or honey bottling and honey certificate or not certification, but honey bottling and extraction is something that's regulated by the Division of Food Safety. So it's not actually regulated by our apiary inspection program. Um, I'm happy to reach out to them though to see if there are any changes um, and I can report back. But at this time, I haven't heard of any restrictions or changes um, with the bottling rules right now has anybody has anybody else heard of anything um, david do you have any insight into that maybe from what we've heard on uh the national level there's been nothing shown that you know the virus could uh, survive in the uh honey or it would be a problem in the extracting uh dave wick may have a little bit more on that but uh at the national level we've not heard anything on food processing and uh, the extracting, so. We have tested for COVID-19 in honey and in bees. And we, uh, over the few hundred samples that we've looked at, we are blank. We're not seeing anything in the honey or the bees. And that's using mass spec proteomics, looking for genetic markers. All right. Um, so, Brandy, another question for you. Um, uh, is bee theft really a big issue? So it comes up every now and then. We actually had a few, a beekeeper who unfortunately had a few hives stolen up in the um, Nassau or Duval County area not too long ago, actually. Um, especially as the population pollinations like California almond pollination season comes around we do unfortunately see some bee theft it's not like it's or you know it's something that's reported daily by any means or even weekly but it does come up um, as pollination prices continue to rise um, and contracts need to be fulfilled sometimes we unfortunately do see some some hives go missing I've heard that it's much more common in California but we do have some cases um, that happen in Florida too unfortunately Okay. As a backyard beekeeper, do all deeps and supers have to be identified with their account number? No. So only if um, we ask that every like one box in every stack, if you will, um, is is identified. So basically, we just require that the brood box is is marked, and you don't have to brand all of your supers and any um, whether they're deep or medium supers on top. Just, just that brood box so that we can um, know that that colony belongs to you. Okay. Uh, here's another question. I caught two swarms. Can I register these bees since I didn't buy them? Yes, absolutely. And we would encourage you to do so. Um, we will ask that you requeen those with a European honeybee queen just to make sure that, you know, you have strong genetics going on in that hive. Um, make sure they're not showing any like defensive traits or anything like that. Also, you never know the age of the queen in a swarm. So she could be older and may lose some of her productivity in the next few months anyway. So it's just a good practice in general, aside from just the African bee issue we have here in the state, um, to always requeen any captured swarms or, or even um, remove feral colonies. But yes, if you reach out to your local inspector, um, they can get you the application walk you through the process and come out and get your inspection. So absolutely, you can register those. 
on the application, I know down at the bottom, it does say hives purchased from, and there's a blank. You can just say captured swarm. Um, don't worry about, about completing that whole section if, if they were captured, um, captured and not purchased. But yes, absolutely. Okay, and then more along those lines, as we get more hives, do we wait until the next year to notify the department of the increase or do we reapply as our colony count goes up the pay scale? So you can actually just reach out to your inspector for that as well. Um, they can make that change in the database with a simple phone call. Um, and then the next time they come out to do an inspection, we'll confirm that inventory on our apiary inspection reports. But yes, whenever, you know, if you're jumping into that next pay scale, you can go ahead and let us know around the time that it happens. That way we can make sure that there aren't any issues with billing in the next cycle and, and things like that. So yes, you can, you can let us know at any time that's convenient for you. Okay. Uh, here's a rule question. So rule 5B-54.0105 requires a six foot high barrier if hive is less than 15 feet away from a property line. Now, is there a requirement for length uh, for this barrier? No, there is not. Okay, that was easy. All right. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so on that um, VMR that he's referring to, I have it in front of me, give me just one second. Um, so it specifically states, when a colony is situated within 15 feet of a property line, the beekeeper must establish and maintain a flyway barrier of at least six feet in height, consisting of a solid wall, fence, dense vegetation, or combination thereof that is parallel to the property line and extends beyond the colony in each direction. So there's not a specific length that it has to be. It just does have to be as wide as the colony is wide and extend slightly past that. Gotcha, makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next question. Um, let's see, covenants frequently prohibit livestock. Are bees considered livestock? So I've gotten this question a couple of times. There are certain areas like in the USDA that it's kind of refers to bees as livestock. They're, <laughs> I think there was one place on in the Florida statutes that referred to bees as livestock. There's nothing specifically in Rule 5B54, which is the rule, of course, that I'm very familiar with. Um, so I will have to, is there a way, Ray, to get contact or like to find out who asked that afterwards so maybe I can follow up with them? Um, I just want to be able to accurately answer that question instead of just kind of. Yes, I believe, what I, think to be true. I believe we can do that. Okay. All right. I'll follow up with you on that question just so okay. that I give you accurate information. Okay. Um, here's another question for you. Uh, I have a flyaway barrier, which is a loosely weaved bamboo fence, six foot high, but the ivy hasn't filled in yet. Is that a problem? Uh, note that it faces a city, a uh, huge retaining water ditch where an old unused railroad line was. Hmm. So I would probably, in that case, defer to the inspector for that answer. Um, once they go out and actually visit the location, they can see if, you know, if it seems appropriate to fit in with our rules. Um, there are some things that aren't always just super black and white, right? So um, that sounds like one of those that I would work with your local inspector. If, if for some reason they say, yeah, you know, we need a little bit more here right now until the ivy fills in, then you might be able to move it back to be 15 feet away from that property line. Otherwise, they might, um, they might have other recommendations for you. But without being able to be on site or see pictures of that, it's hard for me to say whether or not it's appropriate right now. Like you said, if it's if it's bordering something that's kind of like vacant land or unused land, then they may say this is this is perfectly acceptable right now. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to make that judgment call without without seeing it or being there. 
Okay. Um, here's another question. Where can we find a list of certified queen breeders? So you can send us an email, um, either your inspector or myself, and we can pull that in the data um, from our database. We don't have it posted online because queen certificates expire annually. And so to have that, you know, being updated every single day online, our tech, our like software programmers just don't have the staff to be able to do that. But at any time, if you have um, a question and want to get a list of them, give us a shout and we can send you a list um, of everyone who is an active queen breeder at that time. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see. Are neighboring beekeepers informed if an infection of AFB is found? So there's nothing listed in rule that, like there's no formal process of that, but usually if, if there's a concern, then the inspector will contact the beekeepers that they're, they know in that area and let them know. Um, but there's not like a formal alert process or anything that we have at this time. All right. Um, with summer approaching as a backyard beekeeper, I wonder if there is a program in place to notify mosquito control of your hives. So each mosquito control or mosquito control district has their own means of alerting. So what we always recommend is reach out to your local mosquito control um, personnel, let them know you're a beekeeper, let them know where you're located and some of them, so each, each county provides different services depending on what their staffing and their resources are. So some, some districts have a notification list. So they will let you guys know if, you're at, if you add yourself to their list, let you know when a spray is planning to, be, to happen so that you can be informed. Some, some districts will also do a limited spray or a restricted spray zone. So you can also ask about that. Um, we don't say, we don't like to use the term no spray zone simply because if there's an emergency, if there's a hurricane, if there's a Zika outbreak or something of those, that sort, then certainly public health is going to probably come in, in front of stopping sprays for beekeepers. Um, but most norm, in most normal times, any of those districts that have those, um, those as options will absolutely respect and honor the honor your wishes to not have your area sprayed. A couple of other things that you can do as a beekeeper if you are concerned about um, mosquito spraying in your area is this is one of the reasons we like to say backyard beekeepers, right? So if a truck spray is happening on the road in your front yard, then you know put your bees towards the back so that it limits the exposure that they have. It's also good that beekeeping or mosquito applications, adulticide missions happen at night. So most of your bees are home. Um, they're not out foraging at that time um, and things like that. So, but yes, absolutely. If you want to get registered or if you want to find out about notification lists or restricted spray areas, contact your mosquito control district and they should be able to provide you with all of that information. Okay. Uh, another question here, what is the best way to find beekeepers in a region to get permission to add hives to the land, to that land, I should say? So to find beekeepers in the area, we, the list of all the registered beekeepers is available on our website. Um, so you could contact beekeepers that way. If you're looking for property or like apiary location, Beekeepers may or may not want to share depending on how much property they have available. Um, so I also always recommend working with your local county extension agents. Um, you guys, the, the agents have a lot of connections with landowners, with maybe it's cattlemen, maybe, you know, whoever it is. Um, so the agents can be a great resource for connecting beekeepers with property owners if they need, um, if they need locations. Is that, is that fair to say, Ray? I think that's good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a good way to put it. Let's see. Uh, I got a few more questions here. Um, do queen breeders prefer out-of-state breeding stock to increase genetic diversity? 
It's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I think that's completely, it's just a, it's just a preference. So I can't, there's no like, yes, everyone does or no, no one does kind of answer. We certainly have queen breeders who purchase queens from Hawaii to breed from. We have keepers who back whenever we, the border to Canada was open, they would purchase some bees from Canada, queens from Canada to breed from. Um, but then a lot of beekeepers prefer the local stock. Um, the reasoning for that is usually you're, they assume that your local bees are more adapted to Florida climates. So therefore, you know, having bees from this area are going to be more suited towards our year round brood production, our year round, you know, basic, well, mostly year round like forage availability. So it's, it's totally a matter of preference. Um, I think a lot of beekeepers who have been doing this for a long time have tried many, many things and through trial and error decided what works best for their operation. So yeah, it's, it's just a, a matter of preference for, for that beekeeper, whether they go out of state or stay local with their queens. And we'll have, we'll have questions for uh, five more minutes and then we'll move on to uh, the break period, okay? Works for me. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's a branding question. Is branding a hive part of the registration or is it a separate requirement or process? Um, so it's just like once you're registered, you, you will be given a firm number and then that number should be placed on your hive. So it does, certainly doesn't, it actually can't happen simultaneously um, because you won't yet have that, um, that firm number assigned to you. Um, but once, once you're registered, we'll ask you to go ahead and apply that, um, that number to your hives. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm starting to raise mated queens for my use, my own use. Is it legal to sell them to other beekeepers? Yeah, so you absolutely can, but what we ask is that you um, let your inspector know that you're planning on selling queens so that they can come out and take a sample of the, from the, um, the hives that you're planning to graft from or to rear queens from. Um, and we can run those to make sure that you're keeping European stock. And then we can issue you a queen certificate. The certification is $25 per year to be a queen breeder. Um, and so our inspectors can certainly talk to you about that process. We, um, it's, if you're rearing queens for your own use, there isn't a requirement to be a queen breeder or a, a certified queen breeder. But if you're planning on selling or trading any queens, then, then that is a requirement. Okay. See, I've got a question here. When you requeen, are you taking away the advantage of the survivor colonies? Um, so this is a, let's see. So certain, certain people do feel that, um, you know, feral bees are of the survival, there's a survival stock that goes on. Um, I don't, I don't have research that specifically can talk about that. But what I will say is the main reason that we require the requeening is to prevent the spread of Africanized honeybees um, and make sure that the managed colonies that are being kept here in Florida are in fact European. So um, anything that, any disadvantages that may come, may or may not come with that are unfortunately still required by by law uh, or by rule so we um, we still require it regardless of any um, potential impacts to survival stock if you will okay i've got another uh registration question here how soon after starting your first hive and receiving the first package of bees, should you register? So as soon as possible is always a good, a good um, way to put it. Um, we don't, there's no, I guess as soon as possible is the best answer because the rule says that anyone keeping honeybees must be registered. So essentially once you get your hives, you should go ahead and do that. 
But um, if you're starting a package with brand new comb or brand new foundation, obviously you're not, the, you know, you don't want an inspector coming out and opening those up the day after you installed your package. So certainly wait until those bees get established. You can go ahead and submit the application online if you would prefer to do that. And that way um, you'll go ahead and have your register or your firm number. So after you've installed your package, your bees have established, you can put your firm number on your hives and then your inspector can come out and do the inspection. That's perfectly fine. Or if you, you know, if you prefer to do it right from the start, then get in touch with your inspector and let them know you're getting bees and they can go ahead and come out um, earlier if you, if you prefer that. But certainly, you know, give your hives time to get established and, and settled into your, to your colony before we, we look, take a look through them. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question for you, Brandy. Um, sure. If you are moving to Florida, how do you go about getting bees from another state uh, here illegal, legally? Yeah, so if you're coming from another state, your state likely has some sort of apiary inspector um, who can issue a health certificate or a, um, an inspection certificate. If for some reason there are a few states who don't have apiary inspection programs, so if you're coming from one of those states, let us know ahead of time. Um, we can bring you in through the ag station under like a quarantine. And basically what that will trigger is your, the inspector in the county that you're moving to in Florida will come out a little bit quicker to make sure that, you know, once you offload your bees in the next couple days, we'll try to come out and do a full inspection, make sure that there's no pests or diseases that we need to be concerned about, get you registered, and then you'll be good to go. But ideally, best case scenario is that when you're moving from another state, you bring a health certificate or an, a certificate of inspection from that state with you. Because Florida does have agricultural inspection stations or interdiction stations at most of the incoming um, interstates in Florida. So they will stop you. You'll have to stop there because you're transporting agricultural products, which are beehives, um, and they'll check paperwork at those stations. So that's um, that's where you would want to provide that certificate or inspect uh, health certificate if you have it. All right. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate your uh, assistance with this. And thank you, Brandon, for all those extremely informative answers and, and, quick, and really quick thinking answers. So I appreciate that too. Thank you for your help. Thank I know, you guys for having me. You're welcome. And I know there are a number of questions that didn't get answered. That's uh, the good news is we have a setup for that. We're going to have at 2.30 to 3, from 2.30 to 3, we're going to have a uh, devoted Q&A question and answer session for all the panelists. So we'll be able to answer a bunch of questions that don't get answered after the talks uh, at that time. So right now, uh, we've been going for quite a while. And before our keynote speaker, uh, David Wick, at 10.30, we're going to have a 15-minute break. So we're going to take a 15-minute break from... 10.15 to 10.30, people can get up, stretch, have some coffee, do whatever you need to do, and then we'll return uh, again at 10.30, and I'm going to put a placeholder screen up for everybody, and uh, see you all back at 10.30.
Hey, uh, Brandy, are you there? Yes. Okay, I just, uh, I had a, a request if, are you allowed to share your presentation as a PDF file? Um. <laughs> Not supposed to share the presentation, but I can share the like accompanying documents. So I can share the BMR cool. and I can share a brief summary of the rules, which kind of is just like a white paper short Sounds version good. of all this. If you'll um if you don't mind emailing that to me and I'll send it out to the panelists when we are uh when this is concluded, I'll send an email out to the panelists with all the information. Okay, yeah, not a problem. And uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And any speaker that is able to share presentations, if y'all would, um, my, if, if, if you are able, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to, you know, make that a rule or anything, but if you, you could put it in a PDF file and then uh, I be, would be able to share it if that's something you're willing to do. Thanks. Hey, Matthew, did you uh, get my PDF presentation? Um, I, did you just send it? No, I sent it uh, yesterday email. I'll, I'll check. 
if you have it, you can share it. If not, I'll share okay. it with you. It doesn't have quite everything because I modified everything last minute this morning. Right. Okay. Well, that's fine. That's great. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll check my email. Uh, and, and if I don't have it, I'll send you an email uh, back. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And Matt, also on sharing our contact information, I'll send you the contact for bees beyond borders, uh, uh, state okay. association and my contact. Yeah. I'll share all that in an email with all attendees after the event. Good. There you, go. uh, you said panelists earlier, and I, I think you meant all attendees. Attendees. That's what I meant. All yeah, attendees. So, yeah, but, attendees, yeah. So, everybody will get a, uh, I'll post all this on our county page and I'll send a link to everybody through Eventbrite through the email system. Thank you. Matt, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself or I'll, I'll do it. You still there? Yeah, we're still on break for one minute, so I'll bring it back. Okay. So Scott, does my, um, when I move this off my main screen, does that, what do you see on my screen for, or do I need, I need to click share screen, don't I? Yes, sir, when we're ready for that. For now, we're um, got Matt's screen up there. Um, so if I clicked on share screen, I cannot share screen while the others. Okay. Try try now real quick, and then we'll get everything set up. So yeah, we're back. It's ten thirty. So um, yeah. So David, if you hit that share screen button, you should be able. To, there we go. And then you just need to start your PowerPoint, David, like we did the other day. You know, click on the the hat side. There, there we go. Right? Perfect. Oh, perfect. You got it. Okay. It's excellent. You get to see okay. me at all, or am I in the am I off the screen? You have a, a little window on the side. Yeah. So I'm not looking at you guys. I'm looking at my PowerPoint, aren't I? So now I'm looking at you at another monitor. So it's fine. We'll you guys are over there. <laughs> I love it. That's fine. Looks great. Matt, do you want to take it from here and introduce? Yes, it? I will. Thank you, uh, Scott, for the technical assistance, and uh, thank you, David, for uh, agreeing to participate with us. Originally, this was going to be a live event. We were going to fly you from Montana down to Florida, and, and you're going to go to the beach, maybe, and all that stuff. So, But, you know, with this corona going on, I know you're going to talk a little bit about that in your talk, but uh, we had to improvise and, and move this into webinar format. So we have 176 participants at the moment, and that's really a good good number for a webinar. So thanks everybody for sticking with us. That's pretty good. I'd like to introduce uh, David Wick. And I first heard about David Wick through uh, Jeffrey Pippen and Elmore Herman. And they made a suggestion in our planning committee meetings that we were having for about a year before this. We we, we planned these well in advance. And, and he mentioned David Wick is an excellent uh, candidate for a speaker. And so it took, uh, it, uh, uh, Jeff contacted him and Sam and sent him an email and, and made it happen. So it, it really worked, worked out great. So uh, we, we really appreciate David for doing this and, and we wanna hear his expertise. Uh, when it comes to questions, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep talking, but David, why don't you pause when you're ready for some questions and we'll let uh, Ray uh, chime in and, and bring some of those questions to you. And Ray, if there are any questions from the previous talks, we'll hold off on those and, and do those at the Q&A session at the end. Okay, Sounds great. Put this over to David. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm glad to have so many people participating. I'd like to thank the uh, uh, beekeepers of the, uh, the Panhandle. Uh, Jeffrey Pippen and I have done work before and uh, it's, it's fun. The invite was great. Uh, I've known Dave for a long time. Uh, Dave and I have done some work together and uh, Jerry Hayes before Dave was, uh, we, we did virus testing way back when. So I've been doing this for quite a while. And, and, uh, and again, um, I, I, I think my dad jokes are not going to work because I like to see the reaction of the people I talk to. So we'll just kind of go along. If you have any questions, uh, because it goes along quite a quite a bit on different details. And if you've got a question of, a, of a, what I'm talking about, uh, 
feel free to send that off to uh, Matthew or to uh, 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 Ray, I guess would be the one. Anyway, let's get going. I'm, I'm up in Montana. There's my, my name, address, phone number. Those are the beautiful, beautiful Bitterroot Mountains across the valley for me. That's about uh, four miles from my house and about uh, 6,000 feet higher than my house. So let's see if I can get this thing to work. There we go. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about research and I'm going to talk about testing. We're going to hit viruses, nosema, nutrition, gut bacteria, pesticides, mites, chemicals, and their interactions a bit. And as uh, you know, I can probably go on for an hour and a half for each one of these things. So ask questions. First, we're going to start with viruses. And they're there. And next thing you know, they're a little bit more intensive. And then they get a little bit more intensive. And then all of a sudden you're going, I got, I think I got viruses. And then boom, they're everywhere. And they're moving around. And you're going, okay, now, oh wait, now they're starting to disappear. They're going down. They're going down, they're going down. And I'm back to just a little bit of virus, and they're back again. Welcome to the world of viruses. Viruses are really small. One micron equals a thousand nanometers. Uh, those nosema spores that you look at under your microscope are about 15 to 25 microns. That makes them 15,000 to 25,000 nanometers in size. Most B viruses, are in the 17 to 46 nanometer size range. They are really small. You can't see them in your microscope. Uh, it takes uh, uh, a little bit of innovative equipment to be able to see them, or you can go to molecular biology and pick those up. A long time ago, we had a uh, uh, electron microscope. Don't have that anymore. Uh, it was, it'd be an antique now. Anyway, so. Uh, you can see them. There are pictures of them. There's my equipment. This little piece right here is the electrospray. That's where we aerosol the viruses. This little jar right here is where I stick your sample in. Uh, this is the uh, this is what separates the viruses out by their size. This is a nice little condensation particle counter that simply counts the viruses that are released by the uh, the DMA. This big box right here is just an airflow generator that we grabbed from another type of technology that was a particle counter, uh, exhaust fume, aerosol, picked up the particles in uh, exhaust fuels, uh, diesel fuels. And then we just put it into a computer onto the software and we go from there. It's based on the physics of nanometer size particle movement through a charged atmosphere. The electrospray converts this liquid samples to aerosol state and charges the particles. The differential mobility analyzer collects and groups the particles by size and the particle counter just simply counts them. Uh, this B samples, uh, we uh, get them in with baggies. You guys put them in nice little baggies, you mark them. I put them in a blender and uh, we grind them all up and, and um, liquefy them add a little, uh, we filter them out, out the big chunks, and then we uh, go back in and enter them into the electrospray. We, uh, we can do that with people. The attorneys have a real tough time on, on getting into the blender, so we don't tend to use them very often. But that aside, uh, everybody else, uh, we have done off and on, we've done just saliva testing, we've done sputum, no samples, and we'll get into that a little bit later. This is a readout from the computer. I don't send these out anymore. I used to send them out all the time, uh, but it got confusing. Off to the left-hand side, this big bunch over here is mostly ammonium acetate. It's my salt that we put in, and this 31.1 nanometer uh, Detection is a sum of a five scan average. And you can see the two peaks, one's down below, a little bit lower. And this one right here is the consistency of five different scans. They all came up with a different, uh, uh, different scan, same answer. Each scan is run from a new part of the solution. It's a continually flowing solution 
and each scan is a new section of that solution. And then in the, com in the computer, we just simply add up what we've got to bring out the lower highlights. Um, we confirmed our peaks to make sure that we were looking at them. This 32 nanometer peak is a shift of that 31 nanometer peak because of the little bit of an oblong shape of the virus. And we confirmed this with proteomics. I got a file in here somewhere. Um, this is the proteomics that comes up with a reference. Right here is the unique peptide that we picked up from that. Tells what protein it came from. Uh, it gives a uh, X core. Anything above a one is great. What this is, is it's a 2.18, very high confidence level. And this unique peptide right here only occurs in saccharide virus. That's the unique part of what we do is the, uh, in the proteomics is to be able to sort it out by their unique peptides. We also did a uh, saccharide virus real-time PCR validation uh, because I was having some people saying, well, you can't see viruses without a reagent. So we went back to the reagent modes and this is a reagent mode and it showed a, a very strong validation for the uh, uh, saccharide virus. We've done that with some of the other viruses and ended up with uh, uh, you know, very strong confidence in what we were looking at. And I know it's there. What it is is a little bit difficult without the confirmation. So well, here's the confirmation. This is a phylogenic tree that Judy Chen put up in 2004 and I, I find it a very interesting relationship between the viruses that are in their bees. You'll notice that deformed wing virus is down over here down this family tree and sac root virus is a cousin of it. Kakugo virus is a close relationship um, and so when you're looking at PCR you have to be really specific. And if there's any changes in the gene sequence, you might get uh, PCR might show up a deformed wing virus when actually you have saccharide virus. And if you're really poor on the uh, PCR, you might show up a foot and mouth disease in your bees when actually you just have saccharide virus. So it's, it helps to be able to be uh, very specific on what we're looking at. You can see the black queen cells up over here. I don't actually see it very much, but I think that might be because it's related to one of these other viruses. And my PCR is, uh, uh, might be looking at the wrong set of sequences. Acute bee paralysis virus, cashmere bee virus are very closely related. Their uh, symptoms are very similar. Um, and I find black queen cell virus is related to the broad bean wilt virus. And I've picked that up too when we were earlier on when we were doing it, which is very interesting. The viruses are all, and, and try to put all these under a microscope. These are um, uh, an electron microscope. These are all 32, uh, I take that back. They're about 20 to 35 nanometers in all of these viruses that are shown here. And it's, uh, you can go in and they're, they're very small. Proteomic, proteomic uh, data example, again, you're looking at the uh, probability score on the left. Uh, you're looking at the unique peptides. You're looking at the, uh, uh, the reference database that they came from out of NCBI. And then we got the uh, definition as to what they were. And there's a corner-like virus that we picked up in here. Uh, belongs to several different uh, honeybees, honeybee viruses. Uh, we have an iridescent virus that there was a paper written on and it's a, it shows up once in a while. It's very interesting. It does, iridescent, it does have an iridescent look to it out of the uh, um, centrifuge tube when you pull it out. Uh, very nice. Uh, and we did pick up sac root virus and the scores are pretty high. You'll also notice that we picked up herpes virus in these. It was piggybacked on the, on the bee. Uh, and we're working on um, quantifying the viruses in the bees using the proteomic data. It's interesting when we go back and look at the, uh, uh, the viral 
particle counter detection. I don't see the herpes virus. I don't see the, uh, the permanuta virus, uh, which means that I have the sequence, but I don't have an intact virion, which is uh, a, a key part of what I do, both in uh, the, uh, the honeybees and in the uh, human or mammal, mammalian uh, viral samples I do. I've done bighorn sheep, I've done birds, I've done cattle, and uh, we play with people at times. So deformed wing virus. You got viruses everywhere. Deformed wing virus seems to be pretty, pretty popular. Uh, it's in adult honeybees. Usually everybody knows what it looks like, but we have also found that uh, yeah, we can pick up deformed wing virus before it is symptomatic. And it looks like it should be symptomatic. The counts are so so really high. And I had one beekeeper that uh, didn't want to send me his samples because he knew he had uh, deformed wing virus and he wanted his bees to look really good. So he treated his bees and got rid of the mites and gave them nutrition and all the wonderful things. And his uh, symptoms went away. The bees were looking good. Sent me the sample and boom, I had an incredible count of deformed wing virus that was, that was impressive. Um, it appears to reduce the lifespan of the bee, uh, impaired learning uh, capabilities. Other papers have been written on that and we'll cover some of those. Uh, typical disease symptoms include shrunken, crumpled wings, decreased body size, discoloration in adult bees, um, and why it causes those morphological deformities of the infections, it is unclear, probably in the genetics somewhere, probably interfering. Cashmere bee virus back in the 70s, uh, more or less harmless, and I find that, unless it's associated with other pathogens such as Nosema or Varroa. So Nosema serrani is also in there. Uh, it appears to be activated to a lethal state by mites feeding on the bees. Okay, so I need to qualify this. The virus isn't activated to a lethal state. It is uh, the last sentence down here, once introduced to the bee hemolyph, it can cause more mortality within three days. It's not the only one that'll do that. So all the varroa mite does is put a hole in the bee and starts feeding on the hemolyph. And then if you got uh, Gashmer bee virus floating around uh, and it gets in there, boom, your bees are going to get sick and they're going to die. That's, uh, that's my opinion. Is really acute paralysis virus, uh, closely related to the other ones. They can kill bees in the, in the laboratory. And notice this was injected with the virus and with the virus, they die within three to five days. So on the, on the bee, you kind of pull the leg off. Oh, this is great. <laughs> From my youth. So you take and you go back, not the first leg, but the second leg back and you put an injection right there when you inject the bee, right? <laughs> okay, there's my bee joke for the day. Uh, when it's presented in their food, the death rate is about 80%. So you have to really work on getting these bees in the laboratory. You know, it's one thing in the field, it's a different thing. Uh, you have to watch out for it. So you pay attention to it. I pick up Israeli acute paralysis virus probably about 20% of the time. And I'll show you that later. Acute bee paralysis is thought not to cause disease symptoms in bees. Really, it can be common in non-infectious form in seemingly healthy bees without mites, but is activated by feeding and that's feeding by the mites. However, when, ABV, when acute bee paralysis virus is injected into the hemolyph, the bees are, uh, the symptoms are severe and the bees die quickly. Uh, thought to be a major source of midsummer bee mortality. I've had to look that up a couple times and it's just, uh, it's an older term. I don't know if anybody still uses that, but um, it's there. Brood are being brad badly cared for. Adult bees lose their orientation abilities. Huh, kind of sounds like a pesticide or a, a fungus, fun fungicide being added to it. How do you tell the difference between a fungicide and the virus since the conditions are, this, are similar? 
Okay, so sac root virus. It's uh, 32, about 32.5 nanometers in size. This is the first size that actually stood out to us when we were looking. And then we ex expanded that into the different sizes, going we don't see a difference in the uh, conformations. It affects the brood of the honeybee, resulting in larval death. I pick it up in adult bees. Uh, the adult bees tend to not show symptoms. Uh, the larvae uh, tend to fail to pupate and their, their fluid and, uh, accumulates beneath the unshed skin, forming a sac for which the condition is named. Uh, Brandy probably has more experience on seeing that in the field than I do or Dave or any, pretty much any of you guys. I am, I am socially isolated into a lab most of the time. Um, let's see, after, they, after death, they dry out, forming a dark brown gondola-shaped scale and may also, and they may also affect the adult bee. I'm not sure what those symptoms look like, but I think it's uh, reduced weight and uh, reduced lifespan. Black queen cell virus, 33.4 nanometers. I have looked at queens as they've come through. Uh, the queen, they become pale, darkened, staining the cell, mostly in association with nosema. Uh, Nosema apis. This is a pub paper in American Bee Journal uh, in um, 2006. This is what it looks like on my instrument. Uh, and I had a single queen. They thought the queen died in transit to the beekeeper. The beekeeper said, let's just take a look. And they sent me the queen. And I have this wonderful, nice peak. I've got a protein peak over 17.5 which also could be a satellite virus referring, to, which is a benign virus. The other two peaks, uh, another protein off over to the left of the 17.5. And I have my typical uh, ammonium acetate uh, prep uh, salt for the uh, electrospray. Hey, uh, the, David, we have yeah. a question. And I thought I'd just jump in here and ask, uh, 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 someone asked here, um, how long can uh, a virus be around uh, before you know that it's there? So like, how long can it hang out in that hive or with the bees before you find start seeing symptoms? I guess that's what they were asking. So I've gone to, I've taken bees off of the cold storage sheds off of the floor and I found uh, high counts of virus there. Uh, I put them in my freezer and I bring them back out after a couple of years and the virus is still there. The virus is still prevalent. It's still there. It's still active. Uh, two years, three years, uh, I've actually pulled out some. They start losing their percentage of activity. Okay, so how long can the bee actually carry it around? That's one of the things that I love about uh, honeybee viruses. They're always there, they change. Uh, they're not, uh, I look for active infections such as you see here with the, with the uh, single queen, the black queen cell. That is an active infection. This over here, if this was the black queen cell, I would go, okay, well, you've got it. It's there, it's probably gonna kill your queen. This here did kill the queen. And I get uh, smaller peaks like you saw on the sac root virus uh, right here. That's a 44 count versus the 1200 count I have on the, this one's here. That those viruses are replicating and they're active. Is it a problem? No, the bees are gonna deal with it. It's, they're just, it's just there, something to be aware of. Okay, I hope that answered that question. You know, the, the viruses are there. They're going to be prevalent in the hive. They're going to show up when they are active, when, they're, uh, when the bees are stressed, the immune system starts to fail a little bit and the viruses really start to take off. And when they take off, if they're not put it back in check, if you don't remove the stress, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit later. Okay, so chronic paralysis virus, this is one of my favorites. I see this one come out. I got a favorite virus, right? Oh man. Uh, bees go into California 
and I know what they look like when they go in. Chronic paralysis virus is not usually there. Um, sometimes it is, usually at very low levels. When the bees come out, they um, everybody's got it. Okay, so go down honeybee viruses in the almond orchards in California. I did an environmental testing in the, at the University of Montana, went to the high schools, did environmental testing, went to the grade schools, did environmental testing. That was where I took a Q-tip and just wiped down the door handles and uh, the push plates where, you know, uh, people put their hands. Uh, I also went to a daycare. The colleges had very few viruses on their plates, but they were usually pretty, uh, they were a little bit of the uh, more intense viruses, uh, influenza, uh, adenovirus. Um, there's probably coronavirus on it now. Um, high schools, uh, a little bit less. And drinking fountains, I didn't find the viruses on the drinking fountains in any of the environment except for the daycare. Um, you go back to the grade school and those kids run through the room, they're handling, handling everything on the wall. And if you could see where the dirt is on the wall and you took a sample, yes, you'd, you'd pick up the viruses. And in the daycare, you don't want to touch anything lower than your elbow. Keep them down to your side, keep your hands up, and that's where all the viruses are at. Those are pretty common little viruses and uh, not, not much more than the common cold. So chronic bee paralysis virus in orchards in California at a time when there's a lot of bees, they come out looking like they've been in a daycare. That was, there, it took a long time to make a short story longer. One of the things that comes out is that chronic paralysis virus, the bees come out trembling. That's one of the things that you can see. They're trembling, crawling on the ground in front of the hive. Looks like a pesticide or a fungicide uh, exposure. Uh, swollen abdomens, uh, dysentery, mite infestation, and other diseases. It's also a hairless black syndrome. Not all of them lose their hair. And it's they lose their hair because the other bees pull them out. But they can't fly, they tremble and they crawl about. So something to look forward to. And wonderful guys, Dennis Anderson and uh, out of Australia, they, they were looking for viruses. Deformed wing virus was not in Australia. They don't have varroa destructors and they were trying to put a unique perspective on the uh, use of the varroa destructor in moving mites Move, the mites moving the viruses around. And here's their abstract. The uh, bees are threatened uh, globally by complex interaction of multiple stressors. You got to have fun writing these things, including the parasitic mite, varroa destructor, and a number of uh, pathogenic viruses. Uh, a new opportunity that they had, they found five viruses, black queen cell, sac root, IAPV, lake Sinai viruses, one and two. And the three, that was the first time they detected the IAPV and the Lake Sinai viruses in Australia. Um, in Apis mellifera population, you can see that the Varroa destructor, uh, the viruses were showing up in spite of not having the Varroa destructor mite. Uh, put it in an international context, the results support the hypothesis that the Co-pathogenic of the interaction of varroa destructor and deformed wing virus is a key driver of intense increased colony losses. Uh, but there's other additional stressors such as pesticides, poor nutrition, and you may end up with a, a higher loss to the varroa because of the varroa destructor. Okay, but I find deformed wing viruses and no varroa destructors uh, are uh, the mites. Interesting, but it's, it's there. This is what other people are saying. Pesticides may give the honeybee virus an advantage. Deformed wing virus again is brought up in treated bee colonies, initially increased for a period before ultimate dropping when more mites died. Uh, 
they were testing the the um, pesticides and they were actually in strengthening the virus with the with the pesticide so your virus became more virulent uh, with and this one this one was in context with the with them uh, with the mites so they basically they came away with uh, make sure you know what you abs that you absolutely have to treat before treating with acrocytes. If you don't have a lot of mites, then you probably shouldn't treat because you're going to turn the viruses into trouble. Off of Google alerts, because I go and I put in viruses in Google searches for anything, comes up the viruses and it sends it to me. Rural mites and uh, viral uh, titers continue to rise while remaining below the levels observed in the untreated group. Um, they, they do have a lot of evidence that the mites cause the uh, uh, go along with deformed wing virus. It's not an absolute, but it's a high correlation. Um, and when you show that the, um, when you put the uh, miticides on the honey bee, it affects the honey bee immunity. Uh, you might end up with all sorts of complications that, that are referred to elsewhere. Chemical treatment of colony collapse disorder temporarily worsens viral infections in honeybees. Okay, that's more of the same. Uh, bees that have a low infestation, regular other controls. If you've got very, if you, the bees are, have viruses. If you've got a low level of a virus and you treat it with something uh, and not intending to provoke the virus, your B immune system is going to drop and the virus is going to take off. Uh, viruses are commonly present in any honeybee colony. However, infection of honeybees and the appearance of disease symptoms seems to depend a large extent on other stress factors, lack of space, food or water, weather, infection by other means, uh, bacterial, fungal, mites, uh, pesticides, treatments, you name it. Okay, so Detections of significance. Here's the viruses in uh, May. Pretty good, they came out. They're, this, um, the next level of testing was in April, March, or late March is the um, early one. And then the lower one is early March. So we had a jump or I didn't detect it down here. I think we actually had a jump in the viruses from uh, something else going on might have been a treatment how often do i pick things up uh is really acute paralysis virus about four percent of the time uh in uh, late winter spring this is when they're coming out uh chronic bee paralysis virus is nine percent sac brood is about 13 percent um deformed wing virus is over in the two percent range down over in this area on the left uh, it changes, spring, summer, 47%, uh, half of the, basically half of the samples I look at have deformed or have, sorry, sac root virus. Uh, chronic bee paralysis virus goes up and so does IAPV, so does, so does deformed wing virus. And I've actually have two detections here at 47 and 31. If you add those together, it goes up to a higher count. And you can do the same with the range that I have for IAPV and chronic bee paralysis virus. Late fall, bees are at the end and 44, 10, and 20%. It changes over time. It changes. Okay, so you guys all know Heather Gamper. Heather Gamper was, did a study and I did the testing. And this is up in the panhandle. This is up in your guys' neck of the woods. From my perspective, it's probably next door to you guys. Sac root virus in January. There's the distribution. She put it on this map. Um, I think this lower area down here, this water is the Gulf of Mexico. And in May, it dropped down, still spread out. And in August, it's dropped down to very, very low counts. Okay, so
that is about it for viruses. There are more, uh, one more point, and then we'll ask, then I'll, uh, uh, Ray, if you got any questions for me, I'll stop a moment and see if anybody's got any questions or Matt, if you're wanting to ask them. Uh, University of Nevada is looking to use uh, wide uh, viruses to fight bee diseases. Uh, one of them is American fowl brood. I don't know where there's add on that. This is a while back. And the bacteriophage is actually a virus specific to uh, uh, bacteria. So you have a bacteria and you have a uh, virus that is specific for that that virus which is or that that virus is specific to that bacteria sorry get my term ter terms right yeah it's been done elsewhere and it's a real novel way of approaching the uh, controlling of the bacterial outbreaks if you've got a problem with bacterial outbreaks uh, I've seen others in, in San Diego where they're using the same idea in attacking uh, cancer cells and the uh, petri dishes that i saw uh, that they had uh, growing cancer cells in and they introduced their phage ended up with a hundred percent kill haven't heard from them again wonder why okay so questions yes david this is ray i do have a question for you okay so, um, are there viruses that are harmful to Varroa and small hive beetle, but not to bees? Very good question. You must have been looking at my, my work when I'm not doing your bees. We did a virus uh, control for um, pine bark beetles, same family of viruses. And we found a virus that uh, I didn't find it. I read a paper that the Czech Republic uh, did a study on what would kill the pine bark beetles uh, in, in, uh, in the trees. And they found a virus. And their problem was is they couldn't find the virus that was growing in the field. Uh, and my ability to find viruses is very good. So we went out and we collected pine bark beetles. I did and we found viruses and we were going to take the viruses from the uh, dying colonies on the back side of the collapse on the pine bark beetles and move it to the uh, advancing side of the, the fresh outbreak. And the uh, in, in parallel with what the Czech Republic did and it would stop a uh, it would kill the, the, the pine bark beetles. So in answer to your question, yes, it is very specific. We have also looked at Varroa mites and we found a couple viruses that were specific for the Varroa mites that would uh, impede them. I don't know if it would kill them. We didn't do that, that work. But so here's, here's the issue with Varroa mite. If you can delay the maturity of the Varroa mite in the cell, the bee will hatch first and the, and the mite will die. If you can speed up the bee hatching um, faster than the uh, the varroa mite, uh, again the varroa mite will die. Uh, it's because it's immature. So can, if we use a virus to slow down the varroa mite, I believe we can. I don't have one. Got to figure. I, I'm working on it. Me and a few other guys. Okay, Matthew, Ray, Ray, any other questions? Yes, uh, one more, uh, David. What is the source of David's population that he tests? And is there a significant selection bias created by his sources? Probably. <laughs> My bias is usually I try to get people, uh, they, I talked with a beekeeper and I said, why aren't you sending me bees? He goes, because my bees are healthy and I've got a 400 things to do and I'm only going to get to 40 of them. And Dave, you're on about your, your priority is about 500 and uh, very low. And he goes, but when my bees are sick, you end up being number one on my list of sending bees to. What does that tell you? Okay, so now I'm going, well, 
that doesn't help. Does that bias my samples when he sends me sick bees and that's all I see? Uh, fortunately, when I'm setting baselines, I ask everybody uh, to send me uh, healthy looking bees. I get people that will test their bees over the year, whether they're good, bad, or ugly, and they, they send them off to me. And so, yes, if I don't know what I'm looking at, I've got a single point and I don't know of a reference that they're going better, going worse. If I have their bees prior and the beekeeper says, these are best bees I've ever had, that tells me that I'm going to get a viral load that's going to tell me that it's not affecting the bees. And that'll be my reference point. If I got sample number two is higher than sample number one, the bees are being stressed and the viruses are taking off. Does that answer the question? Maybe. I think so. I think it does, David. Um, here's one more. Um, do you think the increased viral load is associated to colony density, forage um, activity, or maybe both? Uh, depending on the virus. Uh, okay, so you've got a, several parts to that. If you've got a virus, um, Uh, Nancy Moran, I'll talk a little bit about her work out of the University of Texas a little bit, but she goes in and she talks, uh, the viruses will change uh, uh, and the gut biome, they change the bee behavior. And, and that it does affect the bees and on their ability to forage and um, get around, okay? So yes, when the viral load goes up, you're affecting your bees' ability to get about and get around, and they're also not going to live as long. Did that kind of answer that? I believe so, David. I believe so. Uh, here's another one, too. Um, will small cell help to slow down viruses by speeding up hatch time? Might, might, might beat the uh, varroa mite, but it's not going to change the virus. OK. Okay, so let's let's move on. We've got a lot of stuff to cover here and Okay, so on my reports, this is what I do. I test. So I'm testing for viruses. Here's a here's a header that I put on just kind of a summary chart and these are the viruses that I've detected in this report. On the left is the sample ID, the Nosema spores, the viruses detected. Uh, and I I provide details for all of these. These are just summaries mites I pick up. Uh, interesting thing about mites in uh, I found in my testing is that when the people send me bees in a baggie, I throw them in the freezer because I want them dead when I pull them out to put them in the blender. It, they really don't cooperate going into the blender when they're flying around. It just causes problems in the lab. How do I know that? Well, you talk to you later. The mites drop off the bees when the bees die and the mites die after the bees and the bees and the mites are just little specks of sand in the baggie. We just simply count them. We've correlated that with what I, uh, beekeepers are telling me they're getting from their washes uh, and their field testing. We're really close. And even sometimes I will pick up mites where they did not on their, uh, uh, on their testing. And sometimes, um, you know, if we had some, a little bit of discussion, we might be picking up those uber mites, bringing in bees from the neighbors. And we've got a pesticide chemical scale of testing and I will pick up your treatments on that. Okay, so here's going back to one of your previous questions. How do I know uh, if the, uh, what the trend is? Here's a beekeeper that we've tested for a long time out of California. October 16, he was, uh, he was just recovering from a good collapse and he started testing his bees often. And in October 16, we were picking up high loads of mites, high, I don't know if you guys can see the yellow bars in that, but they're in there down in this region. Here's uh, coming up. They, um, uh, he had high, uh, 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 Nosema serrani spores, uh, he had sac root virus, his bee weight was eh, okay, but you know, it was still there. 
he treated his bees, he treated the nosema, he put some nutrition on, went through winter, that next August, okay, a lot happens between then and August. And then August comes along and his bees are, have no real viral load. We've got one over here, that tall red peak, peak and that's probably from the end of a, uh, a honey flow for him. Um, the, because his bee weight is so high, or it could be that the bees are getting ready to collapse. Off in September, uh, he's maintained his bees and he doesn't have the viral load. He doesn't have the, the uh, Nassima Sarani. His bee weight is really good. Uh, and so, yeah, there you, we can track it. We can help management uh, over time with your bees. Okay, so going back to an earlier question, dose response curve for Nosema uh, treatment. This is, um, uh, the beekeeper didn't like that I, we did this, but uh, not that I, my data was wrong. But um, prior to treatment, he's the red line. That's uh, this one right here in the middle. Right, that, that's what he started with. And so he treated with fumagillin and treatment plus 10 days, his viral load went up. Fumagillin is uh, also used as a immune suppressant in mammals at the veterinary lab. Isn't that interesting? And the viral load went up. Treatment plus 16 days, he's all the way down here at the bottom. His bees are looking really good virus wise. Doing well. Okay, so bee, viruses as a biomarker, which is what I've really found is the useful part of these. You can use the, you can look at the bees and look at their virus loads and go, your bees are being stressed. Look at the bee weight. They're doing great. That looks like a, uh, uh, a honey flow, like I mentioned in the previous slide. It really looks like a honey flow. Everything is looking good. Your viral load is high and you know, your frame counts are good. Now, when your frame counts start to drop and you got high viral load and your bee weight stops to drop, you end up with, with a, uh, you, you can see it start to collapse just by looking at your bees, looking at your viruses. And then which virus do you have? You got a lot of mites and you got uh, uh, cashmere bee virus. Well, your bees are going to die. That's, I'll, I'll stay with that. If you've got cashmere bee virus, well, in my opinion, it'd probably be really good to uh, make sure you don't have any mites because the literature says that cashmere bee virus doesn't do anything unless you got mites with it. Okay, great. I have viruses, now what do I do? Okay, you can do nothing. A lot of people do that. You can treat and you can treat with, by nutrition. Uh, I have found that if you want to be more specific on the nutrition, go to uh, good quality protein. Okay, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Essential oil seems to have its place. I know beekeepers that use essential oils and that is their primary treatment and it seems to work well for them. Treat the mites. I don't know of any good idea of not treating mites. Treat for nosema. It's a, both of mites and the nosema are just drains on the bees. Get rid of them. We've got ways of doing that. Use of probiotics. I've just added this in the last uh, probably couple of years of using the probiotics because it helps that bee immune system. Use them, use the viruses as measurement tools. Use regular virus monitoring as a tool for evaluating your bees. How are my bee health doing? Are we going up? Are we going down? Or where are we? Uh, and their reaction to outside factors. I think, uh, Brandy, you had a question about uh, um, mosquito spray coming in out of Florida. We've done a fair amount of Florida testing on I, my bees got hit with, with, with a pesticide. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, let's take a look at your viral load. No, these bees didn't get hit with an acute spray. They got, uh, it may have been their viral load is what killed them. And it's, it stands out pretty ob obvious, kind of like that uh, 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 black queen cell virus peak that I showed. Use the virus screening as a tool for evaluating bee viral resistance. If you're a breeder, 
I have breeders across the country that come back and they pick their hives that they want to use for breeding and I'm the last test they use. They will, let's see if there's, which ones have viruses and we're not going to use those. We're going to use the ones that are a bit more resistant to viruses. Uh, is there a chronic pesticide problem? Ah, chronic means your bees didn't die. They're bringing it back to the hive and their viral load keeps going up and the bee weight starts going down and eventually one or the other is going to kill them. You know, the mites, the nutrition, if you don't have any nutrition, we'll, t we'll get a nutrition a little bit later. Okay, this is one of my, one of my jokes. I think I need antibiotics for, it's a virus. You can't put antibiotics and expect anything to happen to a virus. Does that make sense? I hope everybody nodded their head. Uh, you can't do it. I saw that and I'm just going, oh man, that's great. Um, so think about that with the uh, COVID-19 coming around. Okay, bee gut microbes, research. Uh, a lot of publishing, a lot of stuff on this. This is out of the Royal Society, Pollen Born Microbe Sheep Bee Fitness. Pollen Born, okay, did you get that? Marla Spivak talked about this. Uh, Gloria de Grande Hoffman talked about this. It was a few years back that uh, Marla was talking on a convention. I was talking at a convention and Gloria was talking at a convention. We hadn't talked with each other, but we all came up with the same conclusion is that fresh food, fresh food, pollen is the best food. Teaming with pollen provisions. This is the uh, diverse communities of symbiotic microbes, which provide a variety of benefits to bees. Where do they get them? They get them off of pollen. Uh, microbes themselves may represent a major dietary resource for developing bee larvae, despite their apparent importance in sustaining bee health. Just the bee health, but in the bee larvae, there was a test that will come up here with a little bit on this. Convergent findings from amino acid and fatty acid trophic biomarker analysis revealed that larvae derived a substantial amount of nutrition from microbial prey and occupied a significantly higher trophic position than that of strict herbivores. They thought the bees were herbivores while well, they're out farming the bacteria. Uh, larvae feeding on increasing sterile diets experience significant adverse effects on its growth rate, biomass, and survivorship. This is your larvae. When compared, when completely deprived of pollen-borne microbes, the larvae consistently existed marked decline in fitness. And one of the things that they did measured for fitness was uh, bee weight. We've got a chart that we'll uh, come up to on that. Uh, microbes associated with aged pollen provisions are central to bee health. Okay, go back to your probiotics. Do the probiotics have everything in them that they need? Maybe, maybe not. If you put them on and you say, I didn't see any changes, well, you didn't need those probiotics, you needed a different one. Here's the chart with the bee weight. The, uh, the bee weight is the highest chart is the bees that were on untreated pollen. Sorry guys, I'm also a volunteer fireman. Somebody, somebody just started a fire. <laughs> um, the lower one is the sterile pollen that the lar and this is the larvae weight. And it goes from a 0% sterile, which is the top one, and 100% sterile, which is the lower one. No bacteria on the pollen and the larvae weight is significantly lower. Okay, so back to these guys, Honey Bees LLC, and you can see that I'm on their mailing list and they send me stuff off and they're gonna give me 15% off on my next order, I see. I wonder if it's still good. Pollen, especially when obtained from a variety of plants is the ideal source of nutrition for bees. Monoculture by nature limit the biodiversity available to bees. Okay, so Bees going into almonds. Okay, so we spend a lot of time building the frame strength, building up the hive strength, building up the bee weight and getting rid of the viruses and 
boom, you go into almond pollination. And out of the almond pollination, what happens? What we're seeing more and more of is bees that are struggling when they're coming out of pollen, out of the almond pollen pollination. And I wondered about that and I started doing a little work on that. And almond pollen is one of the best nutritions that is out there. You can argue back and forth on that, but it's really good. Their bees should be thriving. They should be ready to split when they come out of almonds. There should be bee beards on every hive. There shouldn't be this bee lackluster ability in the orchard. One of the things I was looking at, okay, you go back to the pollen on the almonds. And I uh, uh, was looking at a paper and I was trying to find some digestive uh, relationship between the pollen and back to the bees. And there is an enzyme when the pollen enters the stamen on the top. You know, you got the flower and the pollen comes up, the bees go around and, and pollinate that. When that pollen goes down that stamen, there is an enzyme that is released in the stamen that is um, essential for dissolving and digesting or, or breaking up the shell coat on that protein. Interesting. So when the pollen is going down, that enzyme attaches on that stamen and it's going down to form the seed and it's going to start developing. This is botany, okay, botany 250, of course, 200 level, of course. And it, you know, it's not in the bee culture magazines. It's not in the uh, virus magazines, back in the botany magazines. But you go back to what do we do to the pollen? We, we try to extend the bloom of the almond orchard, right? To so the almond orchard, they put a fungicide on it to keep the leaf, the flower open for longer. One of the byproducts of putting that fungicide on is that you are now killing the bacteria off of the top of that pollen. The bees go out and harvest the pollen. We'll get to the pesticide and the fungicides, but they bring back that pollen that has no bacteria on it. The conclusion and the, bee, the, the bacteria are farming the enzymes that the plant's producing so that the bacteria can harvest the pollen as well. The bees bring back the pollen to the hive without that digestive enzyme. If, if the bees don't have that digestive enzyme, they can't eat the pollen. They can break it up, but it, it doesn't digest. It just goes right through them. Your bees don't thrive when they should be thriving because we wanted to extend the bloom of the almond tree. So when you go back and you're looking at the diversity of all of the pollen that your bees are bringing back in, wildflowers up in Montana, up here in Utah and Dakotas, um, the diversity is we don't have sprays up here until you get to, uh, we, we don't have, really have sprays. The bees thrive because they're able to go out and get this huge diversity of, of uh, pollen from wildflowers, from crops, not sprayed crops. Um, and they bring back the bacteria and the enzymes with them. Boom, your bees thrive. Florida, mm -hmm. you guys have got some really good uh, diversity in crop. Uh, you also have some real good diversity in sprays. And boom, get those places that are isolated where there's no sprays and your bees are probably gonna do better. Oh, I'm speaking the obvious now, aren't I? Okay. Okay, let me stop right there and because I went off on one of my, I, I put my soapbox away and I'll answer questions for that, Ray, if anybody's throwing them at you. Sure, uh, David, I do have one and it's uh, back on uh, the topic of probiotics. Um, the question in the chat is, um, I just read an article in one of the industry periodicals that the use of probiotics has not been proven and that there is not enough research on it to say if it is good for the bees or not. It also went on to say in the article that the scientists that published this recommended not wasting your money on this at this time, your opinion. 
Well, I think uh, I think I might have just kind of hit on that. Um, I've talked with a few of the probiotic people, and the bacteria are important because they harvest the enzymes. The enzymes are important because they break down the shell coat of the protein shell on the pollen. Uh, so if your probiotic does not have that, <laughs> if you're going into almonds and you don't have the almond bacteria and enzyme and you have all the other probiotics on there, boom, it's not going to work. It's not going to show you any evidence that it's, that it's good. It doesn't mean that it's bad because that bacteria is essential for the bees and the pesticides affecting the pest, the chemicals affecting the bees are, uh, most of them have a detrimental effect to the bacteria and the gut bacteria. And Nancy Moran, I'll get to her in a little bit. How am I doing for time? Okay, 11.30, what time we got till? We'll make it. Well, we have, we have until, um, we have until 12 o'clock for your talk and then we'll have a lunch break. Okay, let me, let me keep on going. But I think that answers the question, yes. I am an avid supporter of probiotics. And I think there's enough evidence out there if you read the, read the papers about what the uh, bacteria does for the bees and what the probiotics are trying to provide. They do provide the basic uh, um, um, gut bacteria that your bees need. Okay. So I want to cut back on this, this lactobacillus cunicae, isolated from the bee gut, uh, is a common species in the cut bee gut honey. Great potential in the relationship to the bee, the gene protein delivery vehicle in honeybees. Uh, seasonal dependent. The bacterium is pre prevalent in the gut during foraging season, but disappears during the Nordic winter. You guys know about Nordic winters, right? <laughs> uh, when the bees start receiving a defined mixture of sugars and food as food replacements. Okay, so this supports that the gut bacteria is important to be in there. Okay, my testing for bee gut microbes. This is a, uh, an LC mass spec the tandem mass spec. The instruments on the left, uh, there's the auto sampler, there's the ion injector, then I have a, my computer's off to the right. Uh, all the tubes contain chem or uh, solvents that flow through. This little thing near the tag on it is the column that spreads out the items. And this happens to be set up in the uh, chemical testing. Here is the, uh, mass spec results. This is the bee gut bacteria. This is what we're seeing in the bee gut bacteria. Um, 188 total peptides. We refined that. I'm up in the eight to 900 peptides that were unique peptides. There's thousands of them. Um, here's the groups. There are seven of them. These are the ones that we have in our instrument. We're always looking and adding more to it as we go along. Here's, the, here's what comes out on a report. The numbers are the sample number on the top. And then your ID number. This is four samples from a beekeeper. And the uh, numbers are the number of unique peptides. There is no data that I can refer this to that I've been able to go, what's my standard? I'm going to be making a standard. We're going to compare these numbers over time with uh, beekeepers and watch these numbers go up and down. And that's where you can sit there and go, well, do I have the right gut bacteria? Is it effective? And when I see a probiotic on, so these numbers will go to zero because they're, they have an, I mean, the total column will go to zero uh, because I'll have an interfering uh, group of, of uh, bacteria that we're looking at. And uh, we're working on that as well. That means we don't have a complete set. We're working on it. This data is new for your reports. It appears that the consistency of the numbers across the different samples is good and the values appear normal. The zeros may be normal because they don't need that bacteria. As it said in the earlier article, they go away. It appears that a higher count would be better. I don't know that for sure. We're working to understand the total data. 
this is brand new. There's, uh, if you go to look on the internet, you'll have a hard time finding this. If you do find it, I'll pay you for it. <laughs> it's uh, difficult. I put this up here on that, that uh, introduction sheet where I've got the Nosema spore counts and I got the viruses that we picked up, B weight. And over here, I put a B gut quality index. And basically all I do is for this sample, going across this way, I put in, uh, just I just add them up. So I'm looking to see if that is relevant. Higher should be better, we'll see. And environmental quality index. Okay, so these bees are little electromagnets flying around and they're picking up everything. I used to pick up, well, I still do pick them up, but I don't look for them anymore. I pick up the uh, plant viruses that the bees have gone to. I pick up the plant genome. I pick up the soil stuff. I pick up the water contaminants. And we were sitting there trying to decide, what do we do with this? Well, I don't know what normal looks like, but my intuition is telling me that a lower number would be better. And is it a lower number than the column to the left of it? No, wrong comparison, but um, compared to each other, yeah, that might, might have something to do on that. Okay, quick questions on this. Any, any questions on that one, Ray? No questions so far. None? Okay. The B weight. How important is that B weight? So the way I do B weight is I take, I take a bag of bees, I uh, freeze them, I put them out on a, uh, I put them in a scale, I put them, in, I put them on a tray, and I count out the number of bees that it takes to uh, make six grams, which is my standard, and then I just do the math and six grams divided by uh, this one's probably uh, divided by 70 bees. It should be only be about 40 bees, but these bees are really light. Uh, typical weight that I see is, uh, I'll get that on the next, well, here's that slide again about bee weight. Here is how I compare. So when I send you back a report, those bee samples down here, here's your bees. That's the ones that we shout out saw on that uh, previous header compared to what everybody else or just a handful of everybody else that I'm seeing at the same time. And this is what it looks like. These bees are really light and their viral load with that light bee, that would be bad for the bees. Nosema, I do the same thing. Nosema is, is, is affects the bees. Uh, this is from Eric Musson and back in 11, that's getting to be nine years ago. A uh, lot of research been on Nosema. Specific negative effects on honeybees. They are, uh, bees that are less than a week old do not digest their food, not capable of producing brood food secretions. Infected bees tend to skip brood rearing phase of its life and become foragers of very young ages. Lifespans can be reduced up to 78%. Sound like something you want in your hive? Get rid of your, control your uh, nosema. Young queens are superseded. Where did I, superseded within a month. Uh, colonies go queenless for those that, uh, that overwinter and dwindle away in the spring. Uh, Minnesota suggests that an average colony of one million or more nosema apospores uh, per bee can lead to increased winter losses. Okay, get rid of the nosema. Here is this, if you haven't looked at nosema under a slide, this is, uh, uh, I forget, I think this is uh, a couple hundred spores per bee. This is fewer, this is probably about 50 spores per bee. And it's the white, uh, uh, shapes that look like rice grains spread across it. And here I've got a red arrow and a, a star around spores. This is probably about 75 spores per bee. Uh, not that I've looked at very many of them, but this is um, hmm, probably a couple thousand of these things I've looked at through the microscope. Then I put it on your chart and I put it out in your million spores per bee. Treatment levels are typically 5 million spores per bee. 
And then we run it through the proteomics and we end up with a great detection that you've got no seamless spores. And okay, here's a question, a brief question. I get best answer. Who's, who, does anybody know what this is? I saw this in the microscope. I jumped when I saw it. Anybody got a quick answer for this one? Randy, I need a true false on this one too. <laughs> no answers yet. No answer yet. Okay, so this looks like this might be off of the hind leg or off of the, the wing interaction or off of the body side. Um, but look at that detail. I just love that. I come across this occasionally. Okay. Make microbiome. This is this is all of the microbes that go into the bee. And there's a study on this and going, it's really important to the issues that I just went over. You got Kirk Anderson, Michelle Flanagan, you've got uh, uh, Jay Evans. I mean, this is quite a quite a group. Dennis Van Engelsdorf is on here. It's it's really a group. And then what they're trying to do with this is to get all of us on the same page so we can share data. That's kind of the crux of their paper, but they brought out some interesting things. Cornerstone of terrestrial ecosystem stability and key components in agriculture productivity. Really, I didn't know all that. Uh, diverse community of microbes. It's the bee microbe is likely to be a crucial factor in infecting the host health. Okay, the takeaway, um, it's poorly understood as the question was asked earlier. Further, and, and the data I'm seeing is pointing to what I'm looking at. Then by the way, that paper that had the, uh, uh, the enzyme on the digestive stuff, I forgot one little factor on that. That paper was written in 1926 with references going back to the 1800s. It's an old paper and there hasn't been a lot written on it since then. Uh, my botany uh, experience in college uh, and going, well, duh, of course it is. Okay. Okay, so if you guys want to test for it, these are the uh, 16S RNA genes you need to look for, the quantitative PCR, which you guys all have to run their microbial proper metadata are needed for interpretation, comparison of results, or uh, uh, tracking over time. Standardization of protocols, this is what they want. I agree with that. Insulation, uh, isolation of host, bacterial and viral RNA DNA is necessary for cross-study analysis. Right, you guys have all that equipment. You guys can push it, process that through. So when I opened it up and I started looking at a, a few B samples, this is many B samples that I looked at. I want to see what a trend was. And I have a few trends that I saw in this group of bees. This is all that I detect out of the, uh, this is the plants the bees have gone to. These are the microbes that are in the bees. These are the viruses, the bacteria. Uh, the nosema is the, actually the red chart in the front, I believe. And I also I look for uh, American fowl brood, European fowl brood. Um, my problem is, is that if I'm on a forensics level detection, Forensics levels means that we have evidence of it being there. We don't have proof that it's there. I can't put that out in a report because of the regulations going. You know, if you have uh, American fowl brood, you got to burn your hives. And I don't want to send out a report that is not conclusive enough to support that. Forensically, we have it. Glyphosate. Okay, Roundup. Uh, kills off the get bacterium. Research found the loss of gut bacteria is pronounced uh, three days after exposure to glyphosate. When some bees were exposed or returned normal to the hive, some types of gut bacteria were more vulnerable to glyphosate than others. However, they found that young worker bees became more susceptible to known bee pathogen called serratia, increasing their risk of death. Okay, so if you go back to that group of bacteria that I showed you, there is normal serratia in the bee gut. The strains are different. And in my environmental package, we have a whole lot more serratia. The bee biome. Okay, so this is the gut bacteria, again, that we're looking at out of the mass spec. 
Uh, we look for uh, quite a few things in the bees. Here's, the, here's that group of bacteria that we look for. Here's the eight colony, eight, eight types. We have serratia right there, lactobacillus, uh, gimiella, fasciilla, uh, snodgrassiella. I always like that one because it just kind of makes me think of a gross one. Here's the Nancy Moran paper and talks about the uh, early life family groups, side levels of strain diversity within symbiotic species, gram negative, gram positive bacteria, uh, current nutri nutrient poor distal gut can utilize compact plant polymers, right? Characterized by enderobacteria say, such as serratia. Host immune system modulate community composition, host immune systems, okay, that's your that's your bee, uh, how's the bee gonna deal with this thing? Um, history of antibiotic treatment, presence in the resistance of many strains. And they only found that nine species of those bacteria make up 95% of the microbiota biota in healthy bees versus hundreds that we carry around. Okay, one of the things that, that point out, it's nine species composed 95%. That is the process in the bee that the bee is looking to, this is what I need. And then that incredible diversity of all those flowers, I just need that small part to, do, to make everything else work out of that flower. I need that one little enzyme coming in with that bacteria. And so that's where a lot of this data ends up on our reports. Chemicals, I haven't done a lot of chemicals before. Uh, glyphosate perturbs the gut microbiota of, in honeybees. You ever heard that? And that's again from, that's from Nancy Moran. Hundreds of worker bees. Now, go back. Bees were marked. Okay, so this is just telling me how they, what they did it. Did they determine the, uh, the effects of glyphosate on the size and composition of the gut, gut microbiome? Increased mortality of bees have been attributed to several factors, but it's not fully understood. The herbicide glyphosate is expected to be in, uh, innocuous to animals, including bees, because it targets an enzyme only found in plants. Remember, targets an enzyme in the plants? Uh, yeah, which enzyme? Uh, the bees, uh, most gut bacteria contain an enzyme targeted by glyphosate, but vary in whether they possess susceptible versions, and a correspondingly intolerance uh, to glyphosate. Exposing bees to glyphosates alters the bee gut community and increases susceptibility to infection by opportunistic pathogens. Didn't I talk about viruses earlier? And, you know, uh, if you got the bee gut right, like protein, 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 fat bees or healthy bees, um, maybe that probiotic with the enzymes uh, that are appropriate for what is needed might help. Okay. Abs relative to absolute abundance of gut bacteria, they were assessed using deep amplicon sequences of the D4 region, the bacterial 16S RNA gene, and quantitative PCR. I got one of those parked in my garage, don't you guys? And that's why I brought that up. You're not going to see them. This is the method I use. I use a catcher's method uh, for rap, uh, rapid uh, processing. I freeze dry the honeybees. This is not my paper. This is um, an open access journal um, out of Poland. Representative of one gram of sample, they extract it, salt it out, centrification, extract cleanup, centrification, put it in the mass spec. Boom, it's there. This is what we get. This gives us the qualifier. This is what it breaks it up to in the ions. Um, it's not too hard to follow. You get the molecular weight of alicor. It's this that's uh, when you hit it with a, a uh, uh, the energy coming out of the mass spec. It is the energy over here is 13 and 6. It's 13. You hit it with an energy charge of 13. It breaks it up and you produce these things. It also shows up and you can quantify it by adding up how many of those things end up in the... I knew you guys wanted to know that. 
Hey, David, do you have a second for a couple I of do. questions? Go for it. Okay. Um, uh, from the chat box here, uh, in your samples, is it only the workers you test or are drones a part of the makeup and do viruses react differently with drones? I've tested a few drones. Drones are going to be susceptible to the viruses like everybody else. And I take, I usually ask for worker bees because they're older and it gives the viruses a little more time to replicate. So I get a good idea as to uh, what is the, uh, the virus community look like in the hive. Uh, it's a correlation to the uh, brood bees. I get brood bees and I sample those all the time. It's nice to know on the, when the sample comes in and which is which. Um, I can usually guess by the bee weight and the viral load uh, and the appearance of the bee. Um, so yeah, the, the viral load's a little bit different, but uh, in a, in when I take a yard sample, which means I get a little bit of bees from everywhere, uh, I get a good feel for what the yard looks like and what the health of the yard looks like. Uh, single samples out of single colonies, yes, sick bees look different than healthy bees, and it doesn't matter if it's from the uh, brood, brood chamber or from the, uh, whether it's drones or whether it's uh, uh, worker bees. Any more? Okay. Yeah, um, what about, uh, are viruses able to genetically be transferred via mating? Via what? Via mating. Mating. I don't know what that is. Mating, M-A-T. Oh, mating, mating. Yeah. Well. Sorry about that. Uh, not if they go through social isolation and mating. <laughs> The viruses are transmitted through, uh, they carry them on their backs. They, uh, they pick it up in their hygienic methods. They uh, pick it up in the fecal matter. They pick it up in uh, saliva. They pick it up in, uh, uh, in their digestive juices if they're quick. They'll pick it up off the mites. They'll pick it up out of the, uh, um, um, the frames. They'll pick it if it's, if it's covered with the, uh, um, if it's covered up, the virus is still there. When the bees die, break down that and they uncover that virus, that virus is still viable. So yeah, it kind of depends on how many viruses you got. Okay. I asked Jay Evans, I said, Jay, how many viruses, how many virions does it take to make an active infection? And he came back and laughed at me and goes, well, you know the obvious answer, Dave. It's, uh, we don't know that. <laughs> we don't. So bacteria, you can actually grow it up in a Petri dish and know how many, uh, what, form, what makes a plaque forming unit, how many bacteria do you need before it starts growing? We have not been very successful at doing that with viruses. Some have, but it's not, it's not easy to do. Any, any more, Ray? Yes. Um, if bees are not within foraging range of agriculture and chemicals associated with associated with that, do you feel that a probiotic supplementation is still necessary? Uh, it's only necessary if the bees are lacking the bacteria in their gut. How do you know whether it's there or not? You can test for it. If I get all the bacteria, I can, I can tell you. Uh, it's, it, that's, going to be a, that's going to be a, sorry for the pun, that's going to be a gut instinct of the beekeeper. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, some some people here's another question. Some people suggest that you can safely treat unwanted plants with glyphosate when bees are inactive in the evening. Is this true? Uh, finding the glyphosate will be around for a couple of days. I don't care what they say on the label. So if the bees go to it the next day. It'll they'll it'll be there. They'll bring it back to the plant, and that'll. That would lend itself to a uh, chronic infection of glyphosate. You like my background, chronic infection, chronic contamination response. <laughs> um, one more question, David. Um, uh, going back, we talked. you talked a little bit about um, bee weight a while back um, and about a good bee weight. What would be a, a good, healthy bee weight? Uh, 
The lowest I've seen on live bees is 0 0.6 grams. 0 0.06 and the best I've seen is 0 0.14 grams. You can do that in a bathroom scale, you know, if it doesn't raise it that low, you just hold it in your hand and step on the scale, right? Right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, um, the best bee weight we came out of a beekeeper in New York, a hobbyist, and she had been losing her hive every year starts over loses her hive starts over loses her hive the last year that i did any testing for her and she we were doing bee weight and her bee weight was down virus loads were up you know the sema was out of control and she got all of that under control and she sent her the last sample of bees i did for her and she had the heaviest bees i have ever seen isn't that nice okay mm -hmm. so that's the range of of what i see Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can get through this and have a few questions at the end. Pesticide or chemical scale. I use a Raman instrument to come up with this. Raman is a, uh, I just stick the sample in. It actually takes longer for me to write the, the, uh, into the computer to put the uh, reference number so I can, I can pull that out. And when I get that reference number, this, the uh, Raman's already done. So I use it. It picks up pesticides, chemicals. I scale it a one to 10. Uh, I've run a few chemicals through it. it this is a, a high level test. That is, a, that is what the spectrum looks like. All the peaks are in the plastic tube that I've taken off. And that is a, a contamination of a chemical. And I don't exactly know which one it is, but that means I need to do a better in investigation. This is a minocloprid. Uh, and it gets down to four nanograms. I need it to go lower and the higher is, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, it goes down to 400 picograms, which is pretty, pretty low. Um, very fun. Most of my chemical work is done here on the mass spec. Still set up for chemicals. This is how you, well, some of the gauges you do. Here is a report, and here are the 15 chemicals that I'm currently using. Uh, two glyphosates are in here. Uh, both of those are herbicides. I use, uh, I'm looking at dicamba. Uh, dicamba is a herbicide, but it's in, it's being, re, uh, it's filling in for glyphosate, and it does have an effect on bees. And these are all, all these numbers over here are all in parts per billion. Uh, I look for some of the uh, neonics, uh, say and and aminocloprid. Uh, the very bottom one is uh, flipernol. It's also a uh, neonic. And I'm looking for a couple of uh, fungicides and I'm adding them. This is this basically was uh, suggested by uh, a couple beekeepers that I know that said these would be good ones to look for. Common names, uh, I'll work on it. Okay, so the part of the data on this chart are measured in parts per billion. So you have a standard reference that you can go to. Uh, you wanna look at the, the contamination on these things. Uh, the horizontal reference is for, you know, do, do my colonies have a, a difference in, in uh, my, in, in any of these contaminants, in any of these chemicals? Or does my B sample have any divergence? The aminocloprid down here, the 2.067 parts per billion, that seems to be normal, but it is higher than the, the others out of, um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit higher than the others that are in here. Okay, chemical detections, parts per billion. Uh, I've, I've run these against a standard that was uh, uh, my numbers were 600,000 or 40 micrograms per milliliter. And I came up with a uh, calibration that I can use against that. And I didn't realize I was gonna have to do math, do chemicals. There is half of my lab. This is what it costs to do samples and where to send them. That's where I live. And here is what I'm doing with my instrument for nasal swabs 
and uh, taking what I've learned from the beekeepers and from you guys and doing a rapid detection it takes me about five minutes to get through all that. And that's about it, guys. Look at that. I got two minutes for questions. <laughs> that's great, David. Uh, I do have a question here. What brand of scale do you use? What brand of scale do I use? I've got about five of them, and they're all different ones. I started out with a postage meter scale, and I've got one that measures down to 0 0.0000 grams. Uh, and if I breathe on it, it, uh, it changes. <laughs> I, I, got one, I got a couple out of lab supply that were, that were pretty basic. They go down to 0 0.00 grams. Okay. That works really, uh, really well. Any recommended fun. tests a backyard beekeeper can conduct without really breaking the bank? You know, I do. So going back up to this, this is what I charge commercial beekeepers. If you've got a bee club, I will charge the bee club $29 a month to maintain the cost. And the sample rate is $50 a sample. That just covers my, my plastic test tubes, my swabs, my baggies, my gases, my chemicals. Um, I wish it would cover my coffee, but it doesn't. And um, it just covers the expense of the lab. If I'm going to do a drop to $29, I limit that to beekeepers, to, to uh, clubs to 10 beekeepers because I got, it takes a bunch of time to write the reports and it just eats me alive if I, if I, you know, I don't have it. So $29 for a bee club. Wow, that works. 10 beekeepers. If you have 20 beekeepers, do, buy two subscriptions. Then your cost is $50 a sample. If I, do, if I do an individual beekeeper, it's $10 a month to guarantee your sample rate. The sample rate is 75 bucks a sample. And actually, I just looked at another chart and for my, my group rate for beekeeper for clubs is uh, actually $65 a sample, mostly because I got to write, it's not one report, I got to write 10 reports. Is that, uh, and I, you know, it's what I do, it's what you guys hired me to do as beekeepers. I've been uh, doing this for 14, 15 years. Dave, you'd probably know that about as well as I would. and. We've run thousands and thousands of samples for you guys and trying to get it to, so I didn't starve to death so that I um, keep the crew in the lab happy. This is what we came up with. It seems to be working. I'm, I've got lots of people that have signed up for this right here, commercial land groups. And I've got a couple of beekeepers that didn't want to be a part of a group. They just want to keep their data. So they send me $10 a month and I bill them $75 a sample when it comes in. I used to have a flat rate for the year of a thousand bucks. And uh, no, you know, smaller groups didn't want a part of that. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, David. And you're right on time there. I saw your last slide was really interesting about the human testing for, for viruses. So that work you're doing there is, is really, you told me about that earlier, is really interesting. It's the same process that I do for the honeybees, except for the sample collecting. <laughs> I don't, okay, there you go. I, I, I don't run the sample. I don't run the sample source through the blender. It's, so we'll uh, see. We'll see. You might be on the news in a few in a few weeks, huh? <laughs> I might be. I'm in front of the FDA right now, looking for using that as an application. Just briefly, Matthew, the technology came from the Army. At their point detection team to protect the troops in the field from an engineered virus. And multiple years ago, I licensed it and did a tech transfer. And we found the opportunity with Roman Shank and Jerry Hayes and Dave Westerfeld uh, to look at honeybee viruses in Florida. That's where I started was Florida. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, are you going to stick around for the Q&A this afternoon? I will. I'll hang around. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Well, um, any other questions we can do with the Q&A? And we've got lunch for until 1230 for everybody. So go ahead and stretch your legs. Go ahead and walk around.
and we'll reconvene this at 1230. I'm going to put on a, a screen for lunch and we'll see you all in about uh, 27 minutes.
So everybody, uh, got about two minutes and we'll begin the, um, the return of our uh, beekeeping in the panhandle session. And we're going to hear from Jeffrey Pippen and James Davis, and, and he'll be doing an open hive presentation. And uh, so I think it'll be just be Jeffrey Pippen on this one though. Um, but it'll be like a presentation with a lot of pictures that he's taken of his open hive demonstration. So he'll talk you through an open hive demonstration. Just here in about two minutes. I see you getting ready there, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Let's see if I can pull up this. Here we go. Do that share screen button deal. Yeah. How's that? Is that looking good? Let's see. Let see. Uh, pretty good. Um, if you'll, on that PowerPoint, there's at the lower right hand corner. There you go. You got it. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I guess, you know, have like one minute just. Okay. Just that says 1230. We'll just get make everyone will be back from their lunch and we'll we'll get started with this. All right. Okay. And you can you can actually share your keep sharing your screen actually. Okay. We're about to, that's a good placeholder too. And there. Do what? Okay, there we go. Can you see perfect? Me? Okay. Yes, perfect. <clears throat> <laughs> We're ready to get rolling, folks. Ready to roll. Uh, let me introduce um, Jeff Pippen here. Jeff Pippen has been a fixture in beekeeping inspections in Florida for a number of years, and he's been uh, one of our uh, most avid participants. When, when all this started, we had David Westerville and Doug Corbin and uh, Elmore Herman and uh, Jeff Pippen, I mean, and uh, Gary Van Cleef, you know, our, our old crew there. And so, um, and just been with, with this for many years and, and doing our open hive demonstrations out at the, when we have this in person in Chipley, Florida. So uh, he's been, I'd like to thank him again for coming and giving this talk today and we will uh without further ado let's uh let jeff pippen uh uh begin his talk thank you well hey, he's introduced me um what i've done here i've got a little powerpoint set up and uh we're basically going to go as if we were inspecting a hive um there is a few points i like to pull up though about uh what dave wick just told you um I know a lot of you guys are new to beekeeping and you're getting all kinds of data and you get overwhelmed with a lot of this. What he's generally telling you is if you keep your hives healthy, keep healthy, strong bees working on a good source so they're getting mixed nutrition, lots of different pollens, lots of different nectars, they're gonna be a lot healthier and able to fight off most of these viruses and just about any of these other pathogens that they're gonna face. So it's just super important that you uh, keep in mind the health of that bee is probably the crux of all of this. What I'm going to do is walk you through a bee yard just like we were coming up to the bee yard and tell you some things to look for and things that will help make your bee yard a little stronger. Um, this second slide here is uh, Dr. Jamie Ellis's information from the University of Florida Extension. Jamie has some excellent videos posted. You can pull them up on YouTube or you can go to the University of Florida site and pull them up. They're about 15 minutes long. The longest one, the shortest one's about five minutes. All of these pests and pathogens that we're going to discuss today, he has the information in these videos, very in-depth. Uh, one of the questions earlier was, can we check for some of these things without breaking the bank? Each one of these videos, he shows you how to test for these different things. Uh, the most expensive one is you'd have to have a microscope that has about a 400 power lens. If you've got that, you can check for nosema spores like Dave Witt was showing you on the screen earlier. I actually did that about three years ago. I checked all of my beekeepers for about three months. What I found is we did have those nosema spores in about a third of the bees that I was checking. 
So it is important to monitor the health of your bees, but Jamie can give you a lot of good information on the specifics. I'm gonna to try to stay away from the specifics and just kind of skim across and show you what you're seeing in the hive and describe what it is instead of going too in depth because I've got 45 minutes and that's a lot of ground to cover. So let's move on. Now here is a sample, um, the viruses and stuff that Dave Wick's been talking about. These keep bee kills from back in the 1800s, different portions of the world and different portions of the United States were unexplained massive bee kills. They were probably could be contributed to the viral loads and a little bit of lack of nutrition because we didn't have varroa mite and most of these pests I'm gonna show you today were not prevalent in our bees until the 1980s. But you can see these bee kills were occurring all over the world long before that. So nutrition is very, very important for your hives. Now this first uh, slide here of placement of bees. When I walk up to an apiary, one of the first things I do is I look and see which way the hives are oriented. If you orient the entrance of that hive towards the southeast, not only does that mean in the really cold months of the year when you've got that northwesterly wind, it's not blowing in the entrance of that hive and taking the heat away from it. Um, it also, you'll see the trees behind these here, you have that morning sun that rises in the southeast generally, and it warms that hive up, shines some light in the entrance, and your bee activity will start a little earlier. Well, the earlier they start and the later they work, the more nutrition they're gonna be able to bring into that hive. You're gonna have a stronger, better hive. Also, you'll notice the tree line behind the bees. If that tree line is behind them like that, they'll get really good morning sun, which will warm up that hive really well. But in the hot summer, they'll have a little bit of shading in the afternoon as the sun moves over behind those trees. So that's, that would be an ideal placement. Now, you're not gonna be in an ideal situation. Sometimes your, your land, you have a small plot of land, you have to put them in whatever corner you can get them into. But this is just an ideal situation and you just have to get as close to that as possible. Here's another example, um, larger apiary here, but you see the nice tall pine trees there. When the sun gets over in the west, you know, in the afternoon, you get a nice shade from that. Um, morning warmth also keeps hive beetles from infesting your hives. About 80% of the, the beetles that would be there if it was in a nice shady area will not be there if they're out in a nice open sun. So that's one of the biggest factors in fighting off hive beetles in your hives is keep them so that they're getting good sun till like late afternoon. Okay, there's always questions in the summer about bees laying out on the front of the hive. So I've got a couple examples here. This first one, you've got a few bees laid out on the front of the hive. This does not mean this hive's going to swarm. It does not mean they're overpopulated. It simply means that the hive's a little warm inside. The bees will come out so that there's more air space in the hive. The bees actually fan and circulate a current of air in one side of that hive, up and through it, and out the other side. And they will carry water droplets in there and place it in there. And that air circulation, those water droplets, help maintain that temperature in the hive during the summer. They're trying to keep the hive at around 92 degrees. And by doing that, if you've got a 102 degree day, they can keep that hive down to that 92 degrees. Um, generally, you'll start seeing this type of appearance on a hive about this month, April. And you'll generally see this right on until we get into cold weather. So like late September, early October, if the hive's really strong. Now you won't necessarily see them out there as the hive's developing and growing. If there's not a lot of population in the hive, they can make enough airspace without laying out. Here's one that's very healthy inside. Now, if you see one that's laying out this much, you might wanna check inside and see if you need to add another super and give them a little more space inside. Um, you, generally this means there's a lot of honey in there and the bees are kind of cramped and they're coming outside to make space in there so that they can fan and circulate that air. They also use that circulation to dry out nectar, get the moisture out of it before they cap it off as honey. So when you see a lot of bees out like this, you may have a super good nectar flow going on. Check inside, see if you need to add another box. Now you see these bees are kind of hanging down under the bottom of the entranceway there. Now this is not an absolute, yes, there's gonna be a swarm from this hive, but it's a pretty good indicator. A lot of times when a queen comes out to do a flight, if she's going to swarm, she'll touch on whatever area she wants to, the bees to cluster to and leave a little of her scent, her pheromone, and she'll fly away. And she'll come back and touch it again and fly away. And she'll leave a little of that pheromone. The bees will cluster to that scent 
And when they start clustering to the scent, there's a ball about this size, the queen will land on it and the, and the rest of the bees in the air will gather onto the swarm. So if you see this, you may have had a young queen that was doing some mating flights. She may have flown out, came back, landed on the bottom board here, crawled in. She may do that a couple of times. If her pheromones on that bottom board, the bees smell it, think maybe she's there and you'll see a little clump like this. So this can indicate that, hey, there's going to be a swarm out of this hive in the next week or so, I need to keep an eye on it. Swarms will generally come out in the morning time after the dew's dried, between 9, 10, 11 o'clock, something like that. Probably 75% of your swarms come out between 10 o'clock and about one o'clock. So if you do see this on your hives, you might wanna check out around the hives every morning around that period of time for a few days. Um, they generally will swarm out of the hive, fly around the air, and settle in them out 20 or 30 feet of the hive, sometimes 50 feet, but they're usually fairly close when they first settle. So you may be able to hive your first swarm, but just keep an eye out if you see this, it can indicate there's gonna be swarming, okay? Now these hives, um, you see one hive over here, there's no bees on the entrance. The other one, there's a few bees. The reason for that is we've just been in this hive and we've shaken some bees off to do our mite roll, which you'll see here in a minute. And these bees were the returning bees that coming back in after we disturbed the hive. That's not uncommon after you go into your hive because you have a lot of bees that will come out and get a little stir. That's nothing to worry about. That little ball of bees, they'll, they'll go in, that hive will calm right back down within an hour. What I'm looking for here is I'm looking on the ground in front of the hive. If you see an excessive amount of dead bees on the ground, it can indicate that there's problems within the hive. Now, I don't see any dead bees out here. Um, I just took this picture a couple of days ago. I was trying to find some hives that had some dead bees. I wasn't very successful. When I'm talking about excessive dead bees, I'm talking about several hundred dead bees on the ground. Normally when bees bring out a, a bee that's sick or dying, they will fly off with it a certain distance and drop it. Or if a bee knows that it's sick and dying, it will try to get away from the hive, crawl away from the hive and die. So you should see, shouldn't see a great accumulation of dead bees on the ground in front of a hive unless you've had a poisoning incident or there is a really bad viral kill or mite kill or something going on within the hive. If you see an excessive number of bees on the ground, you need to go in that hive and inspect it. Just another shot of the ground here, you can see it's nice and clean. I don't even see the first dead bee. It's not uncommon to see 10 or 20 dead bees on the ground out here in front of this, but this is very clean. These were very healthy bees. This is another symptom you can look for. Um, if you see bees crawling up the grass out in front of a hive and, and disturbed and falling off, trembling, as Dave Wick was describing a lot of the viral symptoms earlier, many times when a bee knows they're dying, they'll try to crawl away from the hive. And if they're too weak to get very far, you'll find them trembling or shaking or laying on the ground in front of it. If you see bees doing this, you need to check the hive. Here's another sign you look for on the entrance of a hive. You see these brownish streaks on the front of the hive here? This is diarrhea. This is usually caused from Nosema apis, apis which is a, a Nosema that's been around. It usually occurs in the early spring, like February, March, April. Usually clears during the summer. You won't see much of this. If you do see these streaks though, it's the bees they are trying to fly out of the hive and get away and they don't have control of their bowel. They're having a little accident, basically. If you see that, you need to check the hive. Um, you've got some nosema going on. Generally, that nosema apis will clear up with a good honey flow in the spring. Nosema serrana will not. Uh, but the serrana has some other symptoms. It usually doesn't have a lot of these streaks like you're seeing here, uh, but it can. But this is just another indicator that you need to go into the hive. Okay, so we've got our hive opened up here and you can see the hive there on the right um, in our you see the top of the bar, of bars there, you can see it has a pretty good cluster of bees on it. That population we're looking for is we'd like to have that hive completely covered across the bottom. Then it's time to add the super. And the super is this box standing up here on the left. And that's the super we took off there. Now this hive was a split three weeks ago, but it had three or four sheets of good brood in it, a couple sheets of honey, and a, a laying queen was introduced. So they've really done well and they filled up the box since they're finally strong enough, it's time to add the super and that's what he just done there. So that's why you don't see many bees on the box, but you do see some down in the hive. And here's another shot of that brood chamber. You can see the bees a little clearer. You also see my thumb, I'm not a very good photographer, but you can see the cluster of bees throughout the hive and in the center you see they're a little more concentrated. 
the brood of that hive is gonna be in the middle of those frames and the, there are probably those six frames in the middle and about from uh, a quarter of the end to each end. That's gonna be your primary brood cluster. So that's where our, our bees are laying young workers and creating young bees. When you open that hive, many times, what we saw there, the, the, the tops of the bars were clean, but after a hive's been developed and they put honey up in that upper super, you'll see they'll build drone cells. That's what these are. This is the regular brood that's made into drone cells. When you open the hive up, it tears these open. You can't help it, it's just, you know, because they're structured between the frames. Since they're already open, it's a good idea to take a look for varroa mites. You can see the four black circles or five black circles there. That white drone pupa, when you tear that cell open, if there are any mites in there, you can see the contrast, that reddish brown mite shows up very well. If you open a hive and saw this many mites on your drone brood, you would know it's definitely time to treat for varroa mites because you have a pretty good infestation. So this would be a, a bad sign. This would say, hey, it's time to treat. Here's our friend, the hive beetle. Now this small hive beetle, he's another contributor to the stress of the hive. These hive beetles can fly for miles. They move from hive to hive. They can raise in watermelons and pears, any kind of rotten fruit. Um, so they're, they really show up around April and May. They start showing up in your hives. And you can check your hive one day and just find a few of these beetles. A few days later, open it up and find hundreds. You need to put traps in your hives to catch these beetles around April of every year. And you need to keep them in there through October, November. I suggest keep them year round and keep fresh bait in them. Let's go and see what, this is the young version of the beetle. You can see the larva there. Um, you see the little ridges on its back. These get mistaken for wax moth larva all the time because wax moths are white and they have these little convolutions, but they don't have this little row of horns down the back here. And on the other side here, these larvae, they drill through this comb. They can eat pollen, they can eat honey, they can eat brood. They ferment the honey and you can see the bubbling going on inside there. That's fermented nectar, it's soured. This creates a brown, orangish brown slime all over that comb. Bees cannot and will not clean that up. Once they slime the hive, as we call it, once that frame gets slimed, you have to take it out, physically wash it, clean it up, freeze it to kill any beetle eggs and larvae that haven't emerged and try to reuse it. Many people just cut it out and throw it in the fire. It's just too nasty, okay? Here is before it got slimed. You can see the adult beetles all over. They're crawling around here. They're laying eggs in these cells. Those eggs will turn into those larvae. You see the bees, are they're not even trying to get some of these. Occasionally a bee will grab one of these beetles drag it out of the hive. I've seen them get away from the bee and be back in the hive before the bee could get back to the hive. They're very hard to control and bees are not good at trapping and getting rid of them. In fact, they will actually feed them. In one of those videos that Jamie Ellis will show you, they actually, the bee comes up to the beetle. The beetle manipulates the mandibles of the bee and forces him to feed him some nectar. Uh, so beetles are hard to control. Bees can't do it, you have to assist. Here's some methods. Direct sunlight, as I was speaking earlier, if you keep that hive out in good sunlight, at least through the middle of the day, that hive stays warm. Beetles do not like warm hives. They like shady ground, they like thick undergrowth to, to pupate in. Um, a lot of people wanna use an inner cover. Uh, you know, most bee hives come with an inner cover and an outer cover for the top. I've seen beetles hide in that inner cover between it and that top, hundreds of them. Um, that's just a good dead space that beetles can hide away from your bees from. Try to avoid those if you can. Don't have extra boxes stacked on that the bees cannot cover. If you've got four supers sitting on top of a hive and not enough bees for just that one box in the bottom, there are no bees working in that comb up there, that's a good place for the beetles to go hide. They'll hide up there, they'll come down, lay some eggs, eat a little nectar, and go back up there and hide again. And they'll harass your hive until they kill it. Uh, Clear what ground around your hives you can. If you can cover it with, uh, some people cover it with metal, some people will pour a little concrete pad and set their hives on that. Beetles, when they form into that larva, they crawl into the ground and pupate to form the adult. If you have that ground covered so they can't crawl into the ground, they can't complete their, their transition into a beetle. 
Um, many of the commercial beekeepers move the apiary several times a year to different spots to get different honey flows. In doing so, they break the cycle. They'll leave that area, the beetles hatch out and there's no hives there to go into. But if that hive's sitting there all the time, those beetles, they start emerging about every 30 days or so once the ground temperature gets above 70 degrees. So you can hatch a lot of beetles in the summer. Screen bottom boards, a lot of people wanna use them for ventilation and stuff, it's a wonderful idea. But I've seen clusters of beetles hanging under them look like clusters of grapes. They go under there and hang out, then they'll move into the hive and feed and go back out there and hide from the bees again. So just be aware if you use green bottom boards, you're really gonna to have to concentrate on controlling your beetle population. Uh, there's several different traps that work very well with beetles. There's the beetle blaster. Uh, when I'll show you another screen on that in just a minute. You can treat the ground with Guard Star, but that's a pretty strong chemical and a lot of people don't want chemicals around the bees, they can help it. Um, the old hive tool compression method works great. You just crush them with that hive tool and every beetle you crush is a thousand eggs that will never be laid. Um, the, uh, there's a, another thing called, it's called tangle foot or BB gone. It's a fiber that you can put in there that they tangle up in. It helps to a certain degree, but if you have a heavy infestation, it won't kill them fast enough. Um, your hive can still get overwhelmed. If you do use beetle blasters, here's the proper placement. See how these are towards each side and up towards the ends? The beetles love to hide in that end frame rest. So if you sit them like this, that's a good place, a good location. If bees start chasing them, they can they run in there to hide and they get trapped and die. Now, I wanted to show you this particular screen because you'll notice these beetle blasters, if you look, they're not pushed down flush against the top of the frame. That little gap there is where the beetles love to hide out from the bees. Make sure you push them down good and flat against the top of those frames. That way when the beetle gets chased, he runs down through those vents and down into the oil inside and dies. This is a shot from that same hive we went into. You can see the queen there on the right. Uh, and you see it's kind of a blurred shot because I had to take a quick when she was moving rapidly. A lot of people want to see their queen when they go into a hive. If you see her, you may catch a quick glimpse. When you're holding a frame up and looking at one side of it, the other side's shady. Queens love to hide the shade. You can see this girl, she's going around the end of that frame, going to the back side to hide from us. But she was a pretty girl and I did manage to catch a quick image of her. Here's another shot of that frame. You can see this is a pretty well-developed frame. Um, the young bees are raising there. That in the center is nice cat brood. Um, you see that's a pretty consistent pattern. The queen, there's very few cells there that aren't uh, capped over. A good queen will start laying in the center of a frame. She will lay one egg in each cell and she'll start working in a circular fashion toward the outside of the frame. She'll check every cell. If it's clean, she drops an egg in it. An older queen will miss cells. She'll think she's laying an egg and she's not, or she, you know, and it'll look spotty. And we'll see some of that in just a minute here. Here's the same frame after we did a mite roll. So we shook the bees off of this frame onto our thing. And we'll see that in a minute. But this is after we shook them off. You can see that pattern's pretty good. There's a few empty cells there. Most of those, if you look down in them, there's some pollen or a little nectar where the bees put in there. Um, that's not uncommon, but that's a pretty good pattern. And those, if you'll notice uh, the top of those, each one of those brood cells, it's got a nice dome over it. If that beetle is, when they cap it over, if, if that larva is very healthy inside, it'll spin a nice cocoon and you'll have a nice raised uh, cap over that cell. Down in the, towards the left and on the bottom there, you see those cells look a little different. What happened with this frame, there was a portion of that cone that was cut out, probably from some wax damage, wax moth damage or something. When the bees build it back, you'll notice the size of those cells is a little bit larger than the size of the cells up on the frame there. When bees replace comb like that, when they add in bill comb, they generally build that cell a little bit larger. The reason is when a queen sticks her head down into a cell to see if it's clean so that she can lay an egg in it, she's measuring the size of that cell also. If that cell is very large inside, when she drops that egg, she drops that egg and she does not put any sperm on it, she leaves it unfertilized. That will form into a drone, which is the male bee. If she puts it into a regular cell, she and says, okay, this is for worker bee. She drops that egg and she puts a, one sperm on it so that it'll be fertilized and it'll turn into a worker. So she can determine what that bee will be. And generally by the size of the cell she lays in, that's how her decision's made. 
Okay, here's one you can see all, all this yellow and, and reddish color around. You see that there's nice brood there in the middle, but down in those cells, there's a lot of yellow and stuff. That's pollen. And what happened, these things are on a tremendous honey flow right now. And they're getting a lot of pollen. And this queen's laying as fast as she can, but they're putting pollen in fast too. So they're, they're kind of overwhelming each other a little bit. Um, this is not a bad queen. It's just that they're on a really great pollen flow. Okay, now this frame is one from another hive that we went into. The queen here is laying more poorly. You'll see a lot of cells there that are missed. There's no pollen in it. There's no nectar. It's just an empty cell. What happened, the queen, she put her tail in there and tried to lay, but there was, she didn't lay. She thought she was, but she didn't. She's running low. Another way you can tell is on about the 11 o'clock position on that frame up there, you can see a couple of bumps that stick up there higher than the other brood. Those are drones. When she dropped her eggs in those cells, she was trying to fertilize it with a sperm, but didn't have any. And it ended up being a drone. In other words, she, she misfired. If you'll look on the right hand side over there about one o'clock, you'll see a couple more cells there that are that way. And when she's dropping eggs in a normal size cell, but it's making a drone, that means she's running out of sperm and she's going to be failing very soon. So that sporadic pattern and those drone cells laid in the center of that worker brood uh, cell lets me know this queen needs to be replaced. Here's another frame where we got the bees off of it. You can see this queen's laying very sporadically. She's missed a lot of cells there. She definitely needs to replace. She will die within a month or so anyway. If you don't kill her and introduce a new queen, you end up with a queenless hive. This is something I call it ball face brood. You hear different names. If you'll look down in these cells, you'll see a fully formed bee pupa. You see the little purple eyes? That's the bee laying on its back there. That's their head. These bees died before they could hatch. Um, when they get to this stage, they're about two or three days before hatching and they died. The bees are opening this up, opening the cells, see how they kind of stand up, and they'll have to drag those little carcasses out there and throw them out. When you see this, you know that you have a virus that is killing your bees before they can fully develop, they're dying. About 75% of the time when I see this, I'll do a mite roll on this hive and I'll find a high mite count. Not every time. Sometimes that virus is not being moved by the mites, but many, many, many times a high mite infestation causes the virus to, to really act aggressively and kill lots of bees. Now, this is a bad sample. If you see four or five of these open cells on the side of one sheet of brood on the whole frame, you've got a problem. If you see this many, you've got a major problem. So this is just a good indicator that you need to do a mite wash and you need to check on the queen and check the nutrition of the hive. This is just some cells with eggs laid in the bottom of them. I just want you guys, when you're looking, when you have a new queen, whether she's, you've had a swarm come in or whether you've got a newly mated queen, you wanna see if she's laying. This is the way it should be. You see there's one egg in the bottom of each one of those little cells. And it's a very defined, you can see it's tiny there. Um, you may have to get glass or magnifying glass and get the sun behind you just right, but you can see those eggs. And I just want you to have an example to, to go by. Now this is about two or three eight day old um, larvae. What's happened here, that egg is hatched and they've, you see that milky substance in the bottom? That's royal jelly. That's produced on a gland on the top of the worker bee's head. When they're first hatched young nurse bee, after a few days of age, they'll, they'll start to develop these glands on their head that they can secrete this royal jelly. A regular worker bee is fed this royal jelly for just three or four days. Then they'll start feeding them a mixture of the pollen and the nectar they bring in, they call it bee bread. That gives them the protein and the nutrition to grow and develop into a nice strong larva. And then, you know, they'll cap it, they spin out and become a bee. But if you're gonna develop a queen, a queen is fed this same royal jelly the entire time it's a developing larva. That increases the hormones and stuff in that queen that helps her to develop the spermethica to hold the sperm from mating and helps her ovaries be a little more developed so she can lay eggs longer. But that's the difference in a worker and a queen. That worker's just only fed royal jelly a couple of days, whereas the queen fed royal jelly the whole seven days before their cap. I just want to show you a shot of that. These are some very nice little sea worms. Now see, these worms are probably about four or five days old. 
they're nice, they're pearlescent white, and they're very healthy looking. And that's, that's what you like to see, okay. And here's just a good shot of pollen. It's a good close up. You can see the different colors here. They're getting pollen from a lot of different sources. See some of this is yellow and orange and white and they'll mix it in one cell. You'll have two or three different types of pollen. When you see multiple colors of pollen coming in, that means they're getting a broad band of nutrition. And that's usually a very healthy sign for your hive. And also that cat brood on the left there is really nice. See, it's got a nice dome over each cell, very nice color, really good. Okay, here's a couple of queen cells. Um, I hear many, many people saying, all right, I've got a supersedure cell because my queen cell's here on the frame or it's, or et cetera, et cetera. What I found from a practical standpoint, if you see queen cells in a hive, normally they're going to rear queens from a late February through about April or May. That's their normal swarm season when they should normally be raising queens and casting off swarms. That's when hives reproduce. If you see cells any other time of year than that, it indicates either the queen is getting old, and if they don't smell her pheromone once every day, they'll start drawing queen cells, or the hive so crowded with bees that they're not smelling her during the day, and they'll start pulling queen cells. So I don't know how to judge supersedure and all that. I, I grew up in bees. We did it commercially um, from the time I was about 10 years old until now. Uh, what I do know is if you have queen cells, it's an indication that they're not smelling your queen and you need to investigate it. Probably gonna have to replace her. Um, if it's not during that swarm season, last of February up through about April. Here's a beautiful little girl here. Here's our queen. Um, now this girl, I would call her Italian. She's pretty bright orange. She's got a little bit of a reddish hue. Um, if she's got a really leathery reddish hue, they call it a Cordovan. Um, how do you tell the genetics of a queen? Most queen breeders, they look at the coloration on the queen and that's how they determine it. Uh, but queens are, are mutts in many cases. They're mixed up, they have mixed genetics. Uh, there's so many hives in so many places that it's hard to get pure stock. Breeders try, they try to isolate their queen breeding yards and stuff and, and they'll try to get them to a certain genetic. Um, but honestly, they usually look at the coloration and say, she must be this or that, okay? But there's a pretty pretty little Italian girl there. And this is more of a, a Carniolan. You see the dark tiger striping on her tail, but she's a beautiful girl. She make you a lot of nice bees. Okay, now let's talk a little about evaluating for varroa mites. Um, you can see I've got a very expensive kit here. That's a dollar store bowl there. Um, that's a mason jar. It's got about four ounces of isopropyl alcohol in it, 70 or 90%, either one works fine. Then I've got a mason lid there and some eighth inch hardware cloth that's been clipped off to fit into it. And then a manila folder, very expensive kit. I mean, there's a dollar and a half worth of stuff there, easy. First, we're gonna find our frame. We're gonna look at and make sure the queen's not on there. The reason I use this manila folder is when we shake these bees onto it, you can see that the outline of that bee is very, very pronounced against that manila. It's easy to pick out a queen's rear end. So even though you've looked that frame very closely before you shake the bees off of it, you may miss her. When you hit her, when you shake it down onto the manila folder, it gives you another opportunity to make sure that you're not shaking her here because these bees are going in alcohol. And if the queen goes in alcohol, she doesn't come back. Here's one more quick look to make sure she's not there. Then you can take and fold that folder, give it a little bump, and then you turn up and see that's our jar of alcohol there with the lid off. Now what's on that folder is probably two to 300 bees. You only want about two to 300 in that jar. Do not shake a whole jar full of bees. There's no sense in killing those. The normal attrition rate for a hive during the day is about two to 300 bees. That's how many are gonna die out in the work, you know, working in the field each day. So what we're doing here is says, oh my gosh, you're killing all my bees, we should use powdered sugar. Well, in the powdered sugar jars, I've done com comparisons before where I would shake the same bees, some in the powdered sugar, some in the alcohol. I did it uh, eight different times at one event. I would get about half as many mites with the powdered sugar off the bees as I did with the alcohol. Sometimes I get two mites with the powdered sugar, eight mites with the alcohol. You do not have a definitive number using the powdered sugar. When you use alcohol, it kills all the mites and they all come off the bees. 
but that's about 200. You shake them in a jar and you can see you'll end up about two to three ounces of bees in there. Okay, put our cap on it. We shake it into our bowl and you can see there's some debris and stuff in there. It's kind of hard to distinguish what might be a mite and what might be debris. Well, the mites are shaped like a plate, like, and when you swish that alcohol, they'll flip and flap back and forth, kind of like a plate. And here's a little close-up view. This is what they look at. If you'll get a magnifying glass or get a really close look, these are what the mites look like in, in the bowl. Um, now, this particular, I, I stole these mites. I did a wash on a hive, and it produced 50 Varroa mites, and these are some of those 50. Um, you'll see some of these mites are a little bit lighter in color, uh, some of them towards the bottom down here, like here and here, kind of a light reddish color, where these others are darker brown, that was a little light. Those were young mites that had just hatched out on the bees. Now, the mites raise on that larva inside that cell, and when that bee hatches, if it survives to hatch, the average is about three and a half mated female mites. When those mites hatch like that, they'll harden up and then after about six days, they'll feed on bees for about six days, then they'll crawl into a cell and lay more eggs. Um, that egg, the first egg they lay inside there turns into a male mite. And let's show you what they look like. You see these guys over here at the, about the four o'clock position, they're really kind of small, the two of them there. Those are the male mites that came out of the cell. They hatch first and every 30 hours after that, a female hatches and that's like this white mite over here at the eight o'clock position. Now, they mate with this young female, those males do, then they usually stay in the hive and die. Usually about, th the average is three and a half, but let's say four of them will hatch out during the time that that young worker bee is developing. So then they'll hatch out and they'll look kind of like this mite on the left here at the 10 or 11 o'clock position. And that's what comes out of the, the cell when the bee hatches. And then after a few days of feeding on the bees, they'll look like the girl over here at the one o'clock position. That's a fully adult female that's ready to lay eggs. She crawls back into a cell that has an egg with a little bit of that royal jelly down in the bottom. She'll crawl down and hide under that royal jelly. And she's got a little uh, periscope she'll stick up there and breathe through. And she'll stay under that royal jelly where the bees can't get to her until they cap that cell. Once they cap the cell, she starts to lay eggs on the actual larva. Now this causes the larva not to be able to make a very good uh, cocoon inside the cell and the top of the cell be very flat. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. This is a very important article. I hope all of you will go and read this. If you will read this article, this was composed uh, by some of the, the most informed researchers and bee professionals that I know. I respect each and every one of them. The ones I've worked with personally, I have great respect for. This will explain to you how a varroa mite works. So I'm just putting this out there, give you some, some homeschooling. Here, uh, take this and you've got some spare time, read this article and you, it will get you up to date on varroa mites. This is one of the things people always wanna look at their bees and see the varroa mite on their bee. You generally won't. And this will show you why. You see on the abdomen of that bee, on one side there about 70 to 80% of the, of the mite contact is on the right or left side under that stomach and they crawl in under the scale. So most of the time when that mite's feeding on that bee's fatty body, which is like their liver, I mean, it, it, the, that's one reason the mites are, are such a problem. That bee's fatty body acts like our liver does. So in other words, any, any type of disease you're trying to fight off or any kind of problems you're having in your body, it filters through that fatty body for the bee the mite feeds directly on it. So they ingest viruses directly to it. They inject bacterial infection directly to it. So they're devastating to our bees in the adult stage like this. So, but they hide here and here, this is some electron microscope. Up here on the second slide here, this is a mite crawled up under that scale. You see, you only see a little portion of that mite sticking back there. Uh, this is in slide C here. This is where a mite was hooking onto the bee and feeding in the center there. Those two little prongs on the right are its forelegs. When they pull the mite out, they pull loose in there. Um, there's the wound there on that slide D. You can see the actual wound where they were feeding on the fatty body of the bee. 
And then down here on the bottom left, you can see those are the little four legs sticking up there. That's the two portions there that are impregnated into that liver. And then the bottom right is the mouthpiece of the varroa mite that he chews inside of that bee and feeds on the a fatty body with. And I just thought these were some very good images. They're in that article and uh, their, their description of each one. Now here's, let's talk about something positive for a change. <laughs> Everybody says that I'm a downer because all I talk about is the pestilence and everything else. This same hive, this was one of the frames uh, that we pulled out of the top. And you can see the nice fresh nectar here. And there's some pretty good cap across here. People ask me, when do you pull a frame? When do you extract it? This frame is about 35% covered. You want it to be at least 75% cap before you sling it because a lot of this open nectar, it hasn't been dried out enough, still has a lot of high moisture content. So a frame like this, in order to extract it, it should have a nice cap coating over about 75, 80% at least. Better if it's capped all the way, then you get really good honey out of it, okay? Now here's just a really nice sheet of brood. You see the, the nice, you know, most of the brood we've been looking at, the covering on it's been kind of a tannish color, and this is really bright yellow. The reason is this is a brand new frame of wax. So just pull the wax out and you have that nice cap. As they raise brood after just a matter of a month or two, most of that comb will turn to a brownish color. And that's because each time a bee spins a cocoon in there, they leave a little bit of fiber. And the bees will go in and remove some of that fiber, but it does cause some discoloration to the wax and you will have a, a comb. So when you first put them in, it'll look like this. Then it'll turn to that brownish tan, don't panic. That's natural, it should do that. <laughs> but this is a beautiful pattern. You can see a little bit of honey on the left and right up at the top where they've got it capped over. Nice brood in the middle. And if you look on the left down here toward the bottom corner on the left, you can notice some little white uh, sea worms down in those cells. Just a beautiful frame of brood. Now this is that flattened capping I talked about that I said we'd see early, a little bit later. Um, when you have mites in the cell with that larva, or if that larva gets infected with um, any type of virus or bacteria thing, it doesn't spin that nice cocoon and you don't have that nice domed cover over the frame. And you look at each one of these cells, you'll see they're flat. They're almost as flat as this honey you see across the top bar there. They're not raised up. Each individual cell is not pronounced. You don't see that nice little dome. Uh, this tells you you've got a problem. This hive, when we rolled it, we found 12 mites in our alcohol wash. So that was the problem with this one. They had a heavy mite infestation. Um, most of the time, that's what you find when you see a comb like this. Sometimes it's viral, but generally the mites are there exacerbating the viral infection. Here's another shot of the same frame. You can see a little clearer. These cells are really flat. They're just not pronounced at all, okay? And here's some shots of American Foulbrood. On the, the left-hand upper side there the, at the 11 o'clock, that's healthy, nice brood. See that pearlescent white, those little larvae in there, nice and pearly white. See a nice dome over the cell. Then down right below it, you see this is AFB. See the sunken cappings and the little holes, permeations in there. On the right-hand side up top, you can see a larva. The, the, the difference between American Foulbrood and European Foulbrood American foul brood is a spore and it hangs out in that hive. When a, a young nurse bee feeds it to a larva in a cell, they cap it over. That larva spins a cocoon and they start to develop into a pupa. Then they will die and rot. And that's what that image on the right hand upper side is. That's the pupa that's died. And now it's starting to rot as that bacterium is eating up the body and producing more spores. And then down on the bottom on the right there, you can see where you take that twig or that stick and you smear it around in there and you pull it out. You see how that strings and that grayish brown looks like the worst sinus infection you ever had. If you see that, drop the twig in the hive and call me. I need to come check that hive. You've got probably got AFB, but don't burn it until I check it. Um, there are some things that mimic it, but generally, if you see these signs, uh, you got a problem and I need to come out and check it. We can send a sample off and get it checked you know, to make sure you have it or not. They do sell test kits. They're about 15 bucks a piece for European and or American foul brood. Um, but the difference is the American foul brood is a spore. It can stay in the wax and the comb and the woodenware for 30 or 40 years. 
that shell that Dave Wick was talking about will stay over that bacterium and keep it viable. When they feed that to that larva, the temperature and the moisture gets right, that shell breaks down, and that bacterium starts reproducing rapidly. Okay, um, now let's see, here are treatments. Generally you have to burn the hive that's there. Okay, if it's infected, we burn it. You can use radiation, but as Brandy said, it's so expensive, it's, it's, easy, it's cheaper to buy a new hive, basically. Um, you can treat with teramice and ortylose, and both those are antibiotics. Generally what we do, if we find, have 10 hives there and we find American foul brood in two of them, we burn those two treat the other eight hives with these antibiotics so that if any bees happen to drift over there or any kind of cross contamination occurs that hopefully that will kill it. After 30 days I will come back and inspect those hives again. If I find any more that are infected we burn again. So generally the antibiotic is administered to the healthy hives to make sure they don't pick up or contract any of the infection. Now this is European fowl bird. European is a totally different animal. This is a bacterial infection carried by the queen alone. When she lays an egg in a cell, it's already infected with that bacterium and it starts to eat on that egg and larva. You'll notice these larvae are twisted and they're yellowish and browny. They're not that nice pearly white that we were looking at earlier. This is classic sign of European fowl brood. Sometimes these will rot and stink. What happens is they get some viral infection there with it too and it makes it break down and it really smells nasty. So it's kind of hard to distinguish if this foul brood is from the American or European. If you have a question, please contact me. Sometimes you can send me some pictures and I can tell. Sometimes I need to come visit, but do let me know, okay? Treatments for, um, anytime I see European, I go ahead and requeen. Uh, if a queen has that type of infection, usually she's getting on in life, she's a little older, she's probably a little weaker and she's probably not going to over it. She's probably going to die anyway. So I generally requeen, it saves some time. You can treat with teramycin or tylosin. Sometimes it will straighten up and be okay for a month or two, but then she usually falters on you. Um, so, you know, I generally requeen, that's, that's what cures it. Sometimes a fresh honey flow will cure it, but generally requeen is the best option. Here's our friend, the wax moth. I always hear about wax moths and how they kill someone's hives. Wax moths do not kill beehives. What happens is you have a problem in the beehive, your population starts to go down and you only have five or six frames covered. These wax moths, they start flying about this time of year, April and May, and they, they stay in the air until about September, October. Every night, they're going out looking for somewhere to lay eggs. Well, beehives are a wonderful place because those young larvae feed on that wax in that hive and develop that nasty little mess you see over there to the right. They eat up the comb, the young larvae get in there, they, they spin their little cocoons and they raise more moths. So a beehive is an excellent source of nutrition for wax moths. They will try to get in the entrance of the hive every night, okay? If you have a nice, strong, healthy hive and they have all the frames covered, they won't be able to get in there. If it gets a little weak, they will, and they will lay eggs in there and you'll have half your hive covered with webs and the bees will be on the other side. An indication, if you look on the entrance of that hive and on either side, if you see something that looks like Copenhagen snuff, or just a little mound of black granules on either side there, what those granules represent is bees normally keep that hive swept clean. When you have wax moths starting to do damage in there, they will try to clean that out and those little black, black granules will be showing up on the entrance because there's not enough bees there to keep it cleaned up and cleaned out and they're just getting it to the entrance of the hive. If you see those signs that day, go into that hive and see what's wrong. Cause you've got a queen that's gone bad. You may have a queenless hive. You may have a mite problem, but something has weakened the hive to the point that they cannot keep that damage cleaned out. So when you see that, that's your indication. I need to check this hive today. If you don't, those wax moths lay eggs every night and it doesn't be, it's not long before the whole hive's covered with web. So react rapidly if you see those signs. Um, Here's some varroa mite treatments. I didn't know if we'd make it this far or not. Um, we could take some, I guess I could take some questions at this point, because you can look up most of these treatments. There's caveats to each one. Um, if you want to give some questions, we can shoot some questions. Sure, uh, I've got, Ray can do that there. I think he has um, two questions there that he can do. Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of questions here in the, in the chat. Hey, hey, Jeff, good to see you. Yeah. 
Um, how often do you see American fowl brood and is it common or rare in Florida? It, it's a lot more rare now. Uh, generally people find some old equipment their grandpa had in a barn and they go out there and put some bees into it. And then that spores there and it shows up usually two or three times a year. We'll run across some fowl brood and have to burn some hives. It can be devastating. I burned 18 hives on a guy a few years back. Last year, probably 10 hives all year long. Um, the thing is catch it early and get rid of it. A lot of commercial beekeepers, if they run across it, they don't bother calling me. They go ahead and throw it on the fire. Um, and you know, they may call me to help check some more of their stuff, but they react to it rapidly because they know it can devastate your entire apiary. That hive gets weakened from the fowl brood. Other bees come in there and rob out the honey and stuff from that hive. And when they take it back to their hive, they're taking spores with them. So you don't just have one hive and the hive die from it. The whole apiary can end up dead. So they react rapidly to it. It used to be very, very bad until the varroa mites and stuff showed up in the 80s and a lot of the hollow trees and stuff were killed out. And the beetles and the varroa mites ate most of that comb out of there. Um, and I think that's where a lot of our spores were hanging out because it was a constant trouble in the 70s and early 80s. And once the mites got here and most of the hollow trees were killed out, our AFB problem went down considerably, but it is still there. We still burn some every year. Okay, and also what, what percentage would you say maybe of American fowl brew cases are first identified by the beekeeper instead of the inspector? Uh, probably about half. Uh, and I'd say that because most of the commercial guys, they'll catch it and go ahead and deal with it. We catch it usually in the backyard beekeepers, um, if they're, especially if they're doing cutouts and stuff like that or hiving these when we try to check them. But just beware of any equipment that's more than 20 years old. If your grandpa used to have bees in it in the 80s or the 70s, do not put bees in it because you will have fowl brood. <laughs> okay. Good deal. Thank you, Jim. Okay. okay. Right, Excellent. Yeah, uh, so the use of vintage equipment of being an equipment collector is not a good thing for old hive box. Not for American fowl brood. <laughs> it's not good okay. at all. So how's our time on about Well, we're time? just you're just right there at like okay. 11, 19, so we're, we're we're cruising right along. Okay. So uh, I've got um Brandon uh Stanford there for 115 to 2 o'clock, so um uh I'd like to uh turn the floor uh introduce him and turn the floor over. Okay. Um, so I, I've never, I, I don't believe I've met Brandon um, in person, but um, he, he works at the, uh, at the UF IFSB lab um, it, over there at, at the University of Florida with at Jamie Ellis's lab. And Brandon, why don't you tell us uh, what you uh, do over there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me... Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so I do uh, uh, quite a few different things here. Um, I don't actually know what my title is now. Uh, I'm the lab manager, so I'm kind of in charge of supervising everything that goes on into the lab. Um, I'm the apiary manager, so all of our hives uh, that we have here, which range between 100 and 300, depending on the projects, um, I manage all of those hives and make sure that they're managed um, optimally. Um, and then as of today, I got a new title as research coordinator. Um, so I, I do a lot of different things, my hands and everything that the lab does. Okay, so for this presentation, are you sharing a PowerPoint or going to be doing a, the, the demo? Both. Okay, so one thing we need to make sure to do is if when you're doing the demo part to, to not uh, share the screen so that we can see the, um, the demo part. I can turn it off, but I can't turn it on. Oh. Yeah, I think you should be able to go back and forth from okay. um, Hey, Scott, will you help us to where we can, when he's doing the demo part so that the, the uh, people can see the, because I'm trying to view him, uh, his demo there and I can't do it. Can you do it? Yeah, I can turn it off, but I can't turn it back on, I believe. I'll try. Also, there's a spot in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that's, um, it says, it's a square with a little square inside of it. 
And if you click on that, it'll allow you to swap the screen with the video on your own. So if anybody wants to switch those, um, they can they can do that on their own. And that may be the easiest part. Yeah, you should be able to just go back and forth. Okay. Do you see that button? Do you, do you see the button? Yeah, if you click on the, if you click on his screen a couple of times, it pops up. Okay, Welcome. good. Thank you. You ready? Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so uh, thank you guys um, for attending. This is uh, a little different for me. Um, this is my first time ever doing a Zoom class. I've used Zoom quite a bit in meetings in the past. Um, but this is definitely a little bit different. If there's anybody on the call that has taken classes with me in the past, you know that uh, I really like the participants to get a lot of hands-on experience. Um, so this is a, a little challenging, but it's kind of neat um, because I'm going to try my best to give you that, that hands-on experience from a safe distance. So I got a lot of stuff out here I can show you guys, but also I know that the it's difficult because it is on video, so I also have the PowerPoint, and you should be able to click back and forth um, depending on what you want. I kind of I like to use PowerPoint as a guide; uh, otherwise, it trips me up. So um, I'm going to use it as a guide um, to keep me on track. Um, but yeah, so I hope everybody is staying safe uh, right now, um, and it's very unfortunate uh, everything that is currently going on. But I also think that. Uh, if there is a positive, it, it gets us out of our comfort zone. So us as educators, we're learning how to uh, reach people. And we're learning how to reach even bigger audiences where we can, can do these types of things. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, I think Penn State has a, a Beekeeping 101 certificate that they're doing. And Auburn had a weekly conference where they have 5,000 participants. And Matt had to uh, completely reorganize the beekeeping in the panhandle in order for us to do that. This, and I think there's 175 people online, which is, it's pretty neat. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about me. I am the laboratory manager, research coordinator, apiary manager, head beekeeper, whatever you want to call me at the University of Florida Honeybee Research and Extension Lab in Gainesville, Florida. And if you've never met me, or if you don't know who I am, you might know who my boss is, Dr. Jamie Ellis. Um, and if you don't know who he is, go to YouTube and look up some of his videos because it's pretty awesome stuff. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, you probably met my wife this morning, uh, Brandy Simmons. She's the chief apiary inspector, or Stanford now, sorry. Um, so I have a couple personal goals every single time I talk to a beekeeper, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or if it's in a group setting. Um, or at a, a bee club or an extension event, I always have the same two go goals. I want to explain beekeeping topics as simply as possible. That way you do not have to overthink when you're in the field. You don't have to overthink when you're going to Dayton or Man Lake to buy equipment. Um, because we have a saying here, if you ask 10 beekeepers how to do something, you're going to get 30 different answers. No lie, you will get 30 different answers if you ask that beekeeper, I guarantee you. Um, but also, if you wanted to, to Google something, if you went to Google and you said how to split a colony, you're going to get pages and pages and pages of information all contradicting one another. So I like to basically get rid of all that noise, simplify it as much as possible. That way you don't overthink as a beekeeper. And I feel like it'll be more fun that way as a beekeeper because you're not going to feel overwhelmed. Um, I also like to develop personal relationships with all beekeepers, no matter if you're in Florida or if you're in Nigeria. Um, I've, I've taught beekeepers from all over the world on every single continent other than Antarctica. Um, so uh, I like to develop that personal relationship. That way, if you see something in your hive or if you have a question, you will not hesitate to reach out to me. I get phone calls and emails all the time from beekeepers all over the place um, to get my opinion. And if I don't know, I know who to send you to that will know. Uh, so those are my two goals every time I talk to a beekeeper. But today, in particular, I'm talking about beekeeping equipment. So uh, I'm going to really focus on the Langstroth Hive, um, just because that's what most people um, are going to use, especially when they're getting started out. Some people now, they, they might use a top bar hive, um, but don't fear, a lot of this is overlap. The only really difference will be the actual hive body itself that we're going to talk about as far as equipment is concerned. Um, so I'm going to 
start there with the Langstroth Hive. And a little bit about the history of the Langstroth Hive. It was de uh, designed and developed by Reverend L. L. Langstroth in the uh, 1800s. And a very important part is that it has removable frames. So these removable frames allows you to uh, inspect your colony, which is extremely important. It allows you to take the frames out to extract honey, which as a beekeeper could be extremely important. Um, it also provides something called bee space. Bee space is, is very important as well. Um, each frame is spaced out just uh, an exact distance from one another to make sure there's not a ton of overlap. Because if you do get a ton of overlap, a ton of wax developed uh, in between the frames, uh, that could be very messy whenever you're going into your hive and cause a lot of issues as you're going through it um, and carrying up that frame and there's possible honey in the wax and then that, that honey just gonna leak all over your hive, which is not good, uh, could potentially cause a lot of different issues. Um, yep, yeah, so. So a, a typical hive setup is made um, from boxes and bottom boards and frames and foundations. And I'm gonna go into each one of these in detail. Um, a hive cover, a hive stand, which is optional, a queen excluder, which is also optional. So to the boxes. Now, when I'm teaching beekeeping equipment, I love to tell people that most everything is personal preference. Um, and that is especially true when it comes to the boxes. Because uh, if you, uh, depending on your goals, and you personally as a beekeeper, you might want a larger box, and you might want a smaller box, depending on um, uh, you. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as I'm going through this, that, you know, my setup might be a little bit different than your setup, but I'll explain everything uh, in detail. So uh, typically in a hive, you'll have these boxes. You'll see these boxes. Um, you know, if you see boxes on the side of the road, they're easy to identify that, hey, that's a beehive. So um, there's three different ones. So you've got the smallest one, which is called a shallow. Um, actually, let me back up a, a little bit. So uh, the correct term for these boxes is called supers. And that's because you can stack these on top of each other and they are superior to one another. So we call them supers. Now each super that is a different size have, has a different name. So the smallest one is called a shallow super. I don't have a shallow super to show you. I've been hunting for one for about 30 minutes today and we do not actually own any shallow supers. So the next size up is the medium super. Now this medium super, if it's filled with honey, it can weigh about 50 pounds. So it's actually, it, it's a pretty good, decent amount of weight. But the next size up is a deep super. So that's this one, it's much bigger. If this was filled with honey, it could weigh probably uh, around 100 pounds, 120 pounds. Um, so this can be extremely heavy. So you might already have figured out if, if you struggle to lift 100 plus pounds, you might want to incorporate these medium supers in your operation. Now, you might hear people uh, call these supers um, either just supers, or you might hear them call them by um, their sizes. So you might hear them say deep, or medium, or shallow. Um, you also might hear people call them um, based on what they contain. So in this particular setup that I have right here, the deep is used for the brood box. So you might hear it called the brood box. So that means that the queen is isolated in this deep and she is laying eggs in those frames and those eggs are developing into larva and they're completing the life cycle of the honeybee inside this deep. So we would call that a brood box because that is where your brood is located. Now, in this particular case, we have a queen excluder, which I'll talk about in a minute but we also have a medium on top. Now with that queen excluder, I know there's not gonna be any brood in here. Now, hopefully, if it's the right season, the bees will be bringing in nectar and they will be converting that nectar into honey into these medium supers in this, uh, in this setup. So I would then call this 
a honey super. Um, you might hear that term uh, quite a bit. Somebody would call honey super, and that's what they're referring to. Um, the super that contains the honey. Um, so those are just a couple of terms that people use in general when they're talking about brew boxes. Um, so there's a few different uh, sizes of those. You could get, uh, typically you have eight frames or 10 frames. Obviously the eight frames are a little bit lighter because you have few less frames in them. Um, but if you're somebody that wants lighter uh, supers, that might be a huge benefit to you to um, run eight frame supers. However, that's going to be less room for your uh, queen to lay. That's going to be less room for your hive to uh, make honey. So you got to keep that in mind because if your hive's growing like crazy, um, it might require a little bit more management to make sure they're not running out of room. Uh, you might have to rotate frames around. You might have to eventually split a little bit sooner because they don't have as much room because they only have eight frames. Um, another size is a five frame hive. Now these five frame hives are called nucleus colonies. Now you might hear this pronounced very different depending on where you're from. Uh, I typically call these nukes, uh, but some people have different ways to pronounce that. Uh, so don't get confused, uh, no matter how they pronounce it, this is what they're talking about, a five frame colony. Um, and this is a fully established colony, it's just much smaller. So why would you have a nook? Um, typically, if you purchase an established colony, you're going to be buying uh, nooks. And a lot of times, uh, best case scenario, you're going to have three to four frames of brood inside this nook. Um, and then a couple frames of resources, a couple frames of honey, a couple frames of pollen, and then you will buy this and install it into a, um, a full-size colony. Or if your full-size colony is getting weak for whatever reason, and you don't want them to have all this extra space to have to defend, then you can uh, downsize it. So you can put it into a nook, that way there's less space to defend um, and allow them to kind of grow out a little bit uh, to build up strength. Um, and then uh, another thing, some people will like to split into nooks, so that could be another use for the nooks as well. Um, so as far as bottom boards are concerned, there's two uh, different types, different styles of bottom boards. And the first style is a solid bottom board. All right, so this is really good at um, regulating temperature. Um, so up north, it's really good to make sure you have these during winter. In Florida, it's, it's less of a problem because you guys know uh, we don't get many cool days uh, for an extended period of time. But up north, when your bees go dormant during winter and you're trying to keep them warm, you don't want additional air coming in, especially cool air, uh, because they're going to have to work that much harder to thermoregulate the hive. Um, so, a solid bottom board is a solid choice in those situations. Um, another option is a string bottom board. Now, in Florida in particular, it's a great place to have string bottom boards. Personally, I run string bottom boards year round because it never actually gets cold enough for me to, to worry about. Um, one benefit also is it's one of the only mechanical ways. I have to be careful how I say this, uh, but it is a mechanical way to help with Varroa mites. Now, what I mean by that is if you are doing other things uh, for your Varroa mite problem, um, this is just one tool in your toolbox that you can use to mechanically control. So what happens is as the bees are grooming themselves um, and they, they knock these mites off, it's a way for the mites to fall and go through the screen. Now, this should not be the only thing you're doing because if you purchase a screen bottom board in hopes that this is going to solve your mic problem, you are going to be in for a really rude awakening down the road when you lose your colony um, to the various viruses that they um, vector. So, but it is, it is a, just another tool in the toolbox to use for that. Another great thing is um, it allows airflow into your colony. Um, during summer, it gets really, really hot here. It was so hot last summer 
that I could walk out to the apiary and I could actually see wax melting outside of the hive. So it was coming through the entrance of the hive. So this is a great tool to just add extra airflow into the hive to kind of cool it off a little bit. Uh, the bees will thank you for that for sure. So there's um, obviously, if you've got different size boxes, if you have shallows, if you have beets, if you have mediums, you need different size of frames. So this right here is a deep frame. This is a medium frame. Both of these frames have uh, what we call foundation. Now you have different options for foundation in these frames. Uh, so this in particular has a, a wax foundation that is coated, or this has a plastic foundation that is coated with beeswax. This coat will encourage the bees to draw out wax naturally inside the hive. It doesn't take very long if it's the right time of year. Um, so springtime uh, around here is typically uh, March to, uh, to May. Um, and the bees are really good at drawing out wax during that time if they're in an area with ample nectar supply uh, readily available to them. And they will draw this out fairly quickly. Uh, some people, however, will use wax foundation rather than plastic foundation. So this uh, also they have to actually go out, they have to come back, they have to draw out the wax themselves um, in order to do uh, whatever they are doing with it, whether it is depositing nectar to convert to honey or if the queen is laying in it um, for, for a brood cycle. Uh, however, one downside to this is you when it comes to honey extraction, it's really hard to keep these intact in whenever you're using an extractor. Uh, a really good thing about this is these are really durable. So you can put this in an extractor and it can sling these frames around and usually you're okay. And then you can just put them straight back into the hive and continue your honey production uh, down the road. So this is plastic foundation and wax foundation in the different sizes of frames. Now, one thing uh, I want to point out is it's really important if you have a deep body to use a deep frame. If you happen to only have medium frames and you were to make a split for because it's that right time of year and you're like, well, I don't have time to buy deep frames, get them here, I need to make it now. And you put a medium frame into a deep body, what the bees are going to do is draw out comb on the bottom of this frame and start using that comb inside the hive um, and you're going to end up with a mess when you come back to inspect your hive uh, because you kind of messed up the bee space that we kind of talked about. So it's very important to make sure you match up the size of the frame with the size of the hive body that you're using. So your options for lids, uh, you, you really have two options. One is called a telescoping cover. Um, this telescoping cover is really, really durable. Um, it's much more expensive than the other option that I'm going to talk about, but it lasts a lot longer. Now this does a really good job at closing up the hive, uh, which is really good if you're up north and you're trying to make sure your hive is really well insulated. Um, it comes with an outer cover, which is this part, and it comes with an inner cover, which is this part. Now, you might be wondering why this inner cover actually has a hole in it, and that is for a device called a Porter V Escape, and that allows you to put this in between supers, um, put the Porter V Escape right there. It allows the worker bees to get out, but it doesn't allow them to get back up to the super. So you can leave this in between the supers, your honey super, um, whenever you're extracting honey uh, and leave it there for a day or two, come back. And theoretically, that honey super should not have any bees in it uh, and that'll allow you to extract honey. But that's a, a little bit down the road. Um, but yeah, so this is the telescoping cover. Uh, biggest advantage of this is more durable. Uh, it makes your hive better insulated, which is really important if you're up north or in colder uh, environment. It also, it, 
Another cool thing is it's a clean look, um, so it looks really nice. Then you have a migratory cover. So migratory cover is usually just kind of a, a piece of plywood uh, that is flush with your high body. So I will put this on and show you guys that. So it's completely flush. The good thing about this is one of these costs 10 bucks uh, here in High Springs at Dayton. Um, I don't know about other places. So it's fairly cheap. Cheap. It does not last as long. It's not as durable. Um, it warps. So there are times a year where there's gaps, which could be a problem. Um, at that point, you probably need to change it out with another one. Um, but one really neat thing, most of the time you have a hole in here. So I'm going to show this. For those that haven't got started in beekeeping yet, you might wonder what's the big deal about having a hole in your hive. You probably don't want a hole in your hive because if you do, when it pours down rain, you're going to get water in your hive. That is true. So you need something to cover that. And hopefully, and you, that would be a feeder. So I was trying to get ahead of myself. So the good thing about the migratory lids with the holes in them is you can actually use a feeder jar on top of the hive um, whenever you need to supplement your hive's uh, diet. Now, if you don't have the jars, what we typically do is just take the lid off, leave it in there, um, and then the bees will actually seal up those holes so you don't have to worry about rain actually getting into your colony that way. Hive stands, so you can pretty much make a stand out of anything. I've literally seen stands on a lot of different objects. Um, it's, it's pretty insane. Uh, here, we basically use four by fours and blocks. Um, commercial guys will just use pallets. They'll put four per pallet and they'll haul them all across the country. Um, and, and I didn't mention this before, but a lot of the commercial guys will also use pallets specially designed and the pallets will actually uh, serve the purpose of their bottom boards. Uh, so that's pretty neat as well. Um, but yeah, you can pretty much make anything a high stand. So queen excluders. So I briefly mentioned queen excluders. Uh, some people love them. I personally really love them. Um, but they serve a very unique purpose. So this is a queen excluder. These gaps on this queen excluder make it are big enough for worker bees to get through. But they're small enough that the queen cannot get her abdomen through, which means that the queen is going to stay down here in this situation, be the deep, down here in the deep, and lay all her eggs underneath this queen excluder. Now, above this queen excluder, the worker bees can get through to everything. Uh, so this will allow them to go out and collect nectar. They will then bring that nectar back, deposit it into these frames, um, they will then uh, dehydrate down that down to moisture content about 15%. They will then put a wax capping over it. Um, and at that point, it's honey. So you will fill this entire um, medium super full of honey, and you don't have to worry about any brood inside your honey, which is really good because I don't know about you guys, but I don't like larva in my honey. Um, so that is one huge benefit. Now, there's a lot of people... Uh, that will refer to queen excluders as honey excluders. Um, I don't know how much truth there is to that. Um, one of the really neat things about beekeeping is you can exper experiment on your own. Um, I've, I've managed a lot of colonies, and majority of the colonies that have queen excluders have no problem uh, with the bees actually making the honey. Um, now, I've seen a few that for whatever reason, the bees just weren't going to the um, honey super to draw out the foundation or um, store the nectar. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the queen excluder or if it's because of another reason, but I would say it's a very, very small percentage of hives that I personally manage that I've actually seen that. So we use queen excluders here pretty regularly. And there's, uh, there's different types of queen excluders. So we have metal ones, there's also plastic ones, 
the plastic one, you gotta be careful because uh, you gotta remember everything in a hive is propolized. So uh, propolis is basically the bee glue. So the, the bees will basically glue all their equipment together. So if you have a plastic clean excluder, you might wanna be extra careful um, because it's, it's much easier to break those when you're trying to pry it uh, from the, being stuck to uh, your, uh, your brood box, um, which is important. Uh, the metal ones, sometimes they can bend. Uh, so you wanna make sure if they are bent that you bend them back uh, like they're supposed to be. Make sure it's flush um, because if it is bent, the queen could possibly um, go up into your honey super and start laying eggs, and that is a horrible thing to find whenever it's time to process honey. So a really, really important tool in beekeeping is the hive tool. So it's got a really creative name, this bee hive tool. I recommend buying more than one uh, because you will lose your hive tool. It happens all the time. There's a couple different styles. So I think I actually have both uh, in my hand that are up on the screen. Um, so this one has a hook on it. A lot of people like to use this. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, use this because they like to use the hook to uh, take out clean cells or clean cups. Um, I personally like to use uh, this one. Um, it's all the ser serves the same purpose. So because everything is propolized together, you have to pry it apart. So these little tools, high tools, allow you to pry everything apart, allows you to pry the frames apart, and that way you can handle them much easier. Everything is much easier with a high pull. Uh, so smoker is extremely important part of beekeeping. Now, I believe Stephen is teaching the next class and is gonna show you guys how to light a smoker, which is extremely important, but this is a smoker. Now, we use pine straw here, uh, because it's all over the place, um, and we try to create a very cool smoke. Um, and I'm sure Steven's gonna show you guys how to do that. Now, a cool smoke is extremely important because you, if, it's, if it's too hot or if you have flames coming from the smoke, smoker, it's not gonna calm the bees down. They're just gonna get mad and they're gonna come at your hand. Uh, you're gonna drop the smoker. Uh, whoever you're with is gonna be like, wow, you're really crazy. Um, but basically, what happens is, the smoke, the cool smoke, masks the pheromones, the alarm pheromones um, in the hive. So bees communicate with each other um, off of chemical pheromones um, in order to tell each other if there is an issue. So if you were going into your hive and they thought, hey, this person's coming to destroy our hive, they will then start telling all their sisters that, hey, there's this weird looking bear who's coming to destroy our hive, we need to attack it. However, if you smoke them, they can't do that. They can't communicate with one, one, one another, so they don't know that there's potential danger. They also don't know that you're actually there to try to help them. Um, so I like to use the analogy that it's like uh, in a football stadium. If you're going to, I'm gonna use the Gators, because I'm literally in games though. Um, if you're going to the Swamp, uh, which is the name of the football stadium, um, and your team is on defense, you as a fan are going to yell at the top of your lungs. And if you've ever been to a football game, you know that you're yelling. That way the opposing team's offense can't communicate with one another. And it's the same concept. Uh, you're just blocking that communication uh, by smoke instead of yelling, which is pretty neat. Uh, so, uh, PPE, uh, protective equipment is extremely important, and you've got a few different options. So, it's really important to have at least a veil. I always, our requirement here at the lab is everybody has to have at least a veil. Uh, and this one is, is my favorite style, uh, it's called a cowboy hat veil, and it's very easy to put on, you have straps. And you got the veil on. Now, the reason why we are, about six years ago, uh, Jamie implemented that everybody was required to have at least a veil on. The reason is he went to, on sabbatical to Germany, and he talked to a doctor over there. And they started talking about what happens when you get stung in the eye by a bee. And he found out that the venom will actually melt the cornea in your eye. So you can literally go blind by getting stung by
by AB. So when he got back from sabbatical, he said, that's it. If you are in the A period, you've got to have at least a bell on uh, to protect your eyes because we don't want anybody going blind. So other options, if you want more protection, I know I'm going out of the screen here, but it's for a very good reason. Uh, so this is a jacket. So I, I enjoy wearing a jacket if, if the hives are a little more defensive. Um, I might wear a jacket. Um, it's a little bit cooler than a full suit. Uh, if I wear a jacket, it's always a good idea to wear pants with it. Um, this jacket has a hood that is connected to it, uh, which is great. So if you need more protection, you also have a full suit. So you can literally get decked out in protection from head to toe, and you shouldn't have any issues unless you don't uh, zip it up all the way. Um, now bees are relentless and sometimes they can actually crawl into your suit. So if you ever are in a situation where you're working a hive and you have a bee get inside your suit, your jacket, or your belt, please try not to panic. Slowly back away from the hive. And once you're away from the hive, take care of the problem. Because if you do it while you're in the hive and you take that bell off, you just expose yourself to thousands of bees because one bee got inside your protective equipment. Feeders. So you guys may know that during certain times of year, there is nothing available for your, for your bees. And um, we've, uh, we've tried to figure out the top things that are killing bees. Number one, we've identified varroa mites. Number two, um, is good quality queens. Uh, and actually number two and three is kind of interchangeable at the moment. Uh, good quality queens. And number three, nutrition. So if the bees do not have plenty of nectar out there to go forage for, if they don't have pollen to go forage for, they are going to starve to death. So as beekeepers, as a good beekeeper, you're, you're going to make sure that your hive has ample supply of feed. So during certain times of year, you might have to supplement their diet with sugar syrup. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. So I already talked about the top feeder, which is basically you get a jar and you get a lid. Now they actually sell these at these stores, but you can also just get a lid and put a couple holes in it with nails. Make sure the holes aren't too big. You don't want the sugar water leaking all over the brood. You then put it straight on the migratory lid and this will allow the bees to come up and they will get it as needed. Now, if you're, if you're up north where it gets kind of cold and you want to make sure your bees have something during winter, um, this is a good option. Uh, but this is just another option for a feeder. This is an in-high feeder, so it's, uh, it's, it's very similar to a frame, except you actually put syrup into this in-high feeder and you put it in the hive. Now the downside about that is you're taking away a good amount of space for your hive to, uh, for the queen to lay eggs, for them to store resources. You're kind of taking away a good bit of a space for that. Um, but it is a good option, especially up north when it gets cold and you don't want your jar exposed to those weather conditions. Another option is an entrance feeder. So this right here is an entrance feeder. And it's very simple. You put it at the entrance of your colony. And you put the jar there. And it allows the bees to, uh, to actually feed outside the colony. The downside of that is it could encourage robbing because you actually have a feeder outside the colony. So if it's during a time of year where there's not a lot of resources, you might have other hives that are out looking for resources. And if they see this outside your hive, they might try to come take that. And then they say, oh, there's also a hive right here with a lot of resources. So you might have an issue with bees coming in robbing because of that. So that's kind of the downside of an entrance feeder. Uh, entrance reducer. So entrance reducers, you have a couple different sizes. They go in the front of the hive and you have this little space, which is really good uh, for winter. And you have this larger space, which is really good um, during summer or times when it's really hot when you want an additional airflow. 
this allows a smaller space for the guard bees to protect. Uh, that way, uh, if you have robber bees, uh, they can gather right here in this space and try to uh, prevent them from coming into the car. I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to go through this a little bit quicker now. Uh, bee brush. So this is a really good tool whenever you have to brush bees off a frame. So uh, times you might use this is if you're for honey production and you have bees all over your honey frame, this is a honey frame, um, then you would brush the bees off. That way you can take it to your extractor and you don't have to worry about getting bee parts in your extractor because you brush all the bees off. This is a, what's it called, frame grip. So you can literally use this if you're worried about, you know, putting your hands in the hive, grip the frame and pull it out. Now the bad thing about this is it's really important to be able to feel what you're doing. And you can't feel what you're doing when you're using this, so you have no idea how many bees you're killing because you're not pulling these out straight. Are you rubbing this against other frames, uh, making the bees even more mad? Uh, if you do it with your hands, uh, then you get a better idea of how you're handling the frames and it allows you to manipulate it a little bit better. Um, but starting out, you could always start out with that until you build up enough courage to actually do it with your hands. A hive lifter is really nice. Uh, it allows you to move hives around. Uh, so these are some other things. So you have queen cages. Uh, if you ever purchase a queen, they will actually come into, in these queen cages. A lot of times these queen cages have candy in them. This candy allows the bees inside the colony that you're introducing the queen to, to chew through that candy to release the queen, and she will then crawl out um, the, ca the, the cage. Uh, if the candy is done very well, it will take a couple of days, and that will allow the other bees in the colony to actually get used to her pheromone before she is released so they can accept her, hopefully. Uh, you also have frame spacers that will allow the frames to be spaced out evenly in the hive uh, to help um, with the bee space. Uncap, so we're going to get into honey. So whenever you do pull your hives off, you will then have a nice looking frame like this that is fully capped of honey. And a couple things you would want is a, a knife to scrape the wax capping. So you might have a scraper to scrape it, or you might have a hot knife. So this knife you can actually plug in and get it really hot and it makes it really easy to actually take this wax capping off. Or you could just have a regular knife to actually take the wax capping off. This is a capping bucket. So the capping will actually fall here, and then any honey that's left in the capping will drain to the bottom here, and you can actually bottle up the honey that is separated um, in this situation. But once this is uncapped, what you will do is put it in an extractor, which I don't have one right here, but this extractor will spin the honey around, and it will sling the honey out of the uncapped frame. That honey will settle, and once it settles, you can take a bucket or um, for, for, a side line, for a hobbyist, you could just take a bucket and this is a sieve that allows you to filter out the wax, put it underneath the extractor, open up the gate and the honey can flow in here and um, you can then bottle it from the bucket once it settles. So here's, a, here's a, a few different resources on where you can actually purchase some of the equipment. Um, Daydan and Man Lake um, are two of the bigger bee suppliers. Um, so feel free to uh, you know, check them out anytime. Um, and then here's a, a little bit of contact information. If you guys want my email, feel free to email me anytime. I will get back to you uh, eventually. Um, everything's a little chaotic right now, but uh, once we get back in the groove of things, I can respond to emails pretty quickly. Um, so, any questions? Uh, hey, one question, Brandon. Are you going to stay for the Q&A at 2.30? Yes. Oh, great. So now that we're, we're, we're just right on track for uh, Stephen Cutts' talk, so if you don't mind taking the questions at 2.30, we'll just do Stephen's talk, and then we'll do all the rest of those questions. So. 
uh, we'll go ahead and, and transfer over to uh, Stephen Cutts' talk. And Stephen, do you, do you want me to, um, Stephen, do you want me to uh, push your content from here or do you want to do it yourself on your own? Push it from there, please, for me. Okay, will do. I'm pulling that up right now. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic and I will briefly introduce you. Uh, Stephen Cutts is a uh, bee inspector with uh, uh, FDAX, uh, Apiary, Bureau of Apiary Inspection, and he has also been a, a longtime fixture at our programming doing the smoker lighting contest. And uh, Stephen comes from a long gener uh, fa multi generation beekeeping family. So I'll let him uh, further introduce himself and I'll begin to share his content. I was asking one of my brothers, trying to remember who taught me how to light a smoker. It was, uh, you just sort of picked it up. And if we hey, can get Steve, the PowerPoint up. Slide. Just say next slide when you want me to advance the slides and I'll do it, okay? Okay, I'm not seeing the slides this moment. Matt, go ahead and see if you can share. There we go. There we go. So you'll need to start. There you go. So smoker lighting and safety. There's a bit of safety to be involved. Smokers get really hot and can do some damage if you're not careful. You are dealing with fire. You don't want to get burned. Next slide. You want to avoid your flammables. You want to be careful when you're back up one. Back to slide two. You want to be careful that uh, you don't want to light your smoker with your veil on. A lot of your veils are flammable or worse. They won't support a flame. They'll just melt to you and just continue to burn and just take high, take a layer of hide with it. Your clothing that you wear, your nylons will melt. So you wanna be very careful that you're not wearing any kind of nylon material when you're working the bees, that hot smoker leans against it, uh, you've got a problem. That was my good jacket that I've burned a hole in. Your pine straw, your fuels that you're using, you want to bring that to the smoker. You don't want to take your smoker to the pine tree to light your, light your smoker. You'll turn around and your uh, pile of pine straw will be on fire because you've dropped an ember that you didn't, you weren't aware of. Next slide. Next slide. For some reason, it's not wanting to advance. There we go. Okay, what is the smoker for me? It's a little hard to tell that one on the far right is around 10 to 11 inches in diameter and stands a good 18 inches tall. That is one from South America that they would use to smoke African bees. And that is the small version of a smoker in South America. They have a bigger one. Um, commonly you see the small one that we'd use at a queen yard or the larger one that is usually an out yard smoker. Uh, the little small ones that they sell for backyard kits. How many hives do you have? How long are you going to be in the bees? Um, how much money do you have to spend on your smoker? All that's going to come into play to what smoker is right for you. Next. What are the best fuels? Well, common fuels are pine straw pine pellets or pine chips. 
Uh, those are the chips like you would use in uh, chicken bedding or small animal bedding. Uh, hardwood pellets are popular. Uh, I have a few beekeepers will burn sisal twine. Burlap is, is rather common in some areas as well as cotton. And how much do you need? You need to have saved and stored up three to six loads of smoker fuel per hive. My can of smoker fuel there, a pine straw has a cover that go over it. You want that fuel saved up, kept and stored in a way that it'll be ready to use when you need it. We've just had several days of rain and if you try to go out and gather up pine straw uh, yesterday afternoon, it would still be wet. One, it would be hard to light and two, it would be giving off more steam than smoke. Next. So things not to burn. Your Spanish moss, most of your mosses uh, are considered to release toxins when they burn. A lot of your grass and straw um, and hay, it'll smoke, but it tends to be a little hot. Um, you don't want to use sawdust. It'll pack in too tightly and it, it won't um, allow the smoke to come through good. You'll end, you can burn it and get it going, but you'll end up backfiring your smoker uh, because you can't get that fire to come up through. Uh, leaves and twigs. I've had people complain that their bees are mean and I ask them to light their smoker and they start picking up leaves and twigs. So I show them how I light my smoker. They're amazed at how much smoke I can get out and then they're amazed at how calm the bees are and that I can work through their hive barehanded without getting stung. So a well-lit smoker with a proper fuel is your best friend. Next. You want to clean and clear your smoker uh, of previous fuel. Check your smoker for the integrity of that smoker. A lot of these small smokers uh, that they have in the backyard kits, you want to make sure your grate is in there. First time you get it, that grate will be laying flat. You need to pull it out, bend your tabs out so it's elevated up. Uh, that way you'll get good ventilation off of your bellus through the hole up into the fire base and get a good smoke out. So you want to make sure you don't have any holes in the bottom of your can, sides of your can, where embers can escape and start a fire. You want to check your bellus, make sure you don't have any cracks where you're losing air off your bellus and you're not getting the airflow where you want it through your smoker. Next. Growing up, we had a three match rule. If you can't light it in three matches, you got to turn it over to somebody who can. Uh, with pine straw, you want to get that fire down below. I start with a very loose handful there in the center. That's a sacrificial starter. I grab a decent handful. Coming in on top of that, you need to keep that smoker puffing and keep it keep that fire going as you slowly feed that in. If you pack it in too quickly, you'll smother your smoker out. So you slowly feed that in, you keep that bellus going, keep that fire coming up. That second good handful is almost sacrificial because then you're going to take That's, that's getting it lit, uh, keeping that fire down below and keeping it lit. And then over on the right, you can see that smoker's getting good and hot and you're even glowing that stainless steel with the fire down below there. Next. Now you're going to pack the smoker. 
Not only do you light the smoker, get a good fire base below, but now you need to pack it. That good fire base below is gonna keep that fire lit. The more fuel you pack above it, the thicker and cooler your smoke will be, the longer your smoker will remain burning so that you can continue your inspection, finish your hive without having to repack your smoker. If you're always having to repack it and always having to add more, you're not putting enough in to begin with. So I've got a good double handful and I'm gonna to continue to puff the bellows, keep the fire going and get most of all that, in that into that small smoker. And you can pack somewhere between two to three gallons of loose pine straw into that small smoker. Next. So you've got it packed up, closed up. A nice thick cool smoke is what you're wanting to to calm the bees and disrupt those pheromones. If your smoker's getting hot, if your smoke is hot, it's going to do more damage than good. So you gotta keep your, your smoker fuel, full of fuel to keep that smoke nice and cool. Next. So a lot of beekeepers will use pellets. So we need to clean and clear that smoker I use a metal can to dump my embers in, my ash into, in case there are embers still there. I don't want them in the plastic bucket that'll melt. Um, a lot of people think the pellets are expensive. Well, if you're dumping them out on the ground each time, they are. You can dump them in that can and, and get some reuse. I prefer newspaper, but who gets a newspaper anymore? Uh, so I'll use the, the copy paper that we use for our documents. Once I'm done scanning them in, I'll take the first piece of paper loose, loosely crumpled, light it down below, get that fire down below, add another piece of paper, uh, a little more crumpled up, if you're starting with new pellets, you might need to add more paper to get a good fire base below and then start adding your pellets too. You can use shredded paper as well. You just wanna be careful of envelopes and uh, envelope windows and plastics, uh, any high gloss uh, that might be in that paper. But any of the papers work well. A little bit of pine straw will work well if you're using that as a starter for your pellets also. Next. So I've taken the, the charcoal from where the smoker was lit previously and I've smothered it off. I take that charcoal and sift off the ash and some of the smaller particles. Keep that fire going, keep the bellus going. As you add these, um, your first few minutes here of keeping that airflow going and keeping that fire hot underneath it is key to getting those pellets re uh, burning themselves to get that charcoal reignited. You want to be careful that you're not using more than half of your volume of, of fuel as charcoal or your smoker will be too hot to hang on to and you won't get the nice cool smoke that you're looking for. So load about half of it or so with your used fuel or amount of charcoal, then add additional fuel that, as needed to fill up the smoker. That bottom right picture is a little hard to see. I'm holding there with a pair of pliers, a bottom grate the same bottom grate that would go in the, in the bottom of the smoker, get a replacement one. And that's what I use on top of those pellets to keep the pellets from falling out and into the hive. Um, a pellet falling into the hive isn't gonna do a lot of damage unless it, you've gotten your fire up too high and you drop an ember into a hive. You certainly don't want that to happen because beehives are highly flammable. 
that bottom grate is completely charred up with with uh, tar, but that doesn't hurt it. It actually works as a damper to keep that fire down, and there's plenty of space around it to for the bellows to push the smoke up around it to get a nice, thick, cool smoke. And you tend to get a nice long burn time with that as well. Next. Once I get my smoker lit, you want to test it to make sure you have that nice, thick, cool smoke. I smoke my hands good. That way I've disrupted the pheromones that might be on my hands from petting the cat and the dog on the way out and any other pheromones that I might be carrying with me. I now smell my hands that I'm using in the hive smell like the smoke that I'm smoking the hive with. Next. You want to be careful uh, if you're dumping your smoker out. As you dump it out, that pine straw can, can catch up and flare up on you. Have a way to extinguish that handy. Uh, the garden hose works real nice. You can stomp it out, but depending on your shoes, you might not want to. It could damage your shoes, and you certainly don't want to do that with sandals or flip-flops. Even though you've dumped it out, you want somewhere to set that hot smoker. That smoker can is still hot and itself is hot enough. It can be hot enough to start a fire on its own. Always be careful where you set your smoker. If you set it on top of the hive next to you on a wooden lid, you can scorch that lid. Uh, so you want a cinder block or a metal table or somewhere clear, a, clear dirt spot, somewhere safe that you can set that smoker that it's not going to ignite a fire. And even after you've dumped it, you need somewhere nice, uh, a non-flammable space to set that smoker and let it cool before you go to storing it in a shed or, or around other flammable materials or potentially flammable materials. So, a metal can to set it in. Um, a larger ammunition box that you can close off. A trash can that you can put it in. Any of those, uh, anything you can do to make sure that you've kept it in a good, safe manner. Next. I sort of ran through that a little quick. Um, one thing about pellets is usually the pellets you get from your bee supply places are white pine, uh, which is the sawdust compressed from making the boxes. If you go to different feed stores and ask them for pine pellets, they don't have them. If you ask them for horse bedding pellets, They've got that by the pallets, uh, fairly economical. You flip the bag over, it's all natural pine, no additives. Um, and that is yellow pine. So it will tar up more than the white pine will. The, if you get the pine shavings, you want the large chips, not the small shavings. The small shavings are too, too tight and will cause a problem. The other thing with using shavings, just like with the pine straw, you light the smoker, you get it good and hot, get that fire below, and then you need to pack the smoker. You need to add fuel to it, take the butt of your hive tool, pack it down, add another inch to it, pack it down, and the more fuel you have above your fire base, the thicker and cooler your smoke will be. And the longer that smoker will continue to burn. Any questions? 
Thank you very much, Stephen. What what we can do now is is do a um, set this up for the the panel, so we can answer the questions from Stephen's talk first, and then if there are any other questions and from Brandon's talk, then any other questions, just please um, type your questions into the the Q and A box, and we can answer those questions about anything you heard about today or any beekeeping questions in general. So if all the panelists would, uh, I guess they could share their, show their videos So turn on the video and, and audio uh, and then uh, for the, for the panelists. And then we'll just let the, we'll let Ray moderate those questions that are rolling in and then go ahead and do that until three o'clock. So we have till three till we answer these to answer questions. So thank you everybody. Yeah, this is Ray. I can go ahead and start uh, on the question about are honeybees classified as livestock? Brandy was kind enough to quickly research the Florida statute um, and she sent me the information which states that honeybees are not defined as livestock. So livestock really means grazing animals such as cattle, horses, sheep, swine, goats, any kind of hoofed animal. So just to clarify on that. Excellent. And we've got um, all uh, audience out there in, in Zoom land. We've got the whole panel here. We've got Stephen Cutts, Brandon Sanford, Brandy Sanford, Jeff Pippen, uh, David Westervelt, and David Wick all here. So keep them coming. We've got more than half an hour. Okay. I've got a couple for Stephen here. Let's see. Um, um, how do you hold the smoker and work with the bees at the same time? It's got to be a challenge. You smoke the bees sufficiently and set the smoker to the side in a safe manner. And the effect of the smoke will last for a period of time, depending upon the wind that day and the strength of the colony and the quality of your smoke. Okay. Then as, Go ahead. then as you see the bees are starting to, when the bees start to get a little agitated, you'll start to see it's not so much the bees crawling on the top bar, it's the bees that are lined up along the top bar looking up at you. Those are the ones you have to worry about. So when you start seeing a lot of eyes lined up looking at you, you think, yeah, they need a little bit more smoke. Send them back to what they need to be doing. Um, when they start to get agitated, the first things they'll start to do is, as you're moving your hand across the top of the hive, they'll fly up and bump your hand or bump the hive tool. That's an indication of agitation and time for a little bit more smoke. Okay, do you use a top grate for every fuel? Just for the pellets. Okay, just well, you might would want to use it for the shavings as well. Okay. What kind of maintenance uh, does a smoker require and really how often? If it gets tarred up to a point, then sometimes you may need to put a lighter load of pine straw in it and or paper and burn it out and burn that tar and then scrape it off your belluses will get to a point that they will need to be replaced or repaired. And if you can't, if you have an older one that is actual steel and it's rusted out and you have holes in it, then it's time to replace it. Okay. And what do you use for a smoker or stopper? I use a bolt. I took my smoker into the hard, unlit into the hardware store and walked down the bolt aisle and found a bolt that would is about an inch to an inch and a quarter long that would fit through the hole fairly snugly. Um, corn cobs work fairly well. If you've got pine trees around and squirrels, the squirrels do a nice job of chewing that pine cone down to a core that pine cone core makes a nice stopper as well. Okay. 
what is your preferred smoker style or brand? As a state employee, I cannot show preference to brand or, or product. Style, I prefer the bigger, uh, a larger smoker to the smaller one, typically. Good answer. The smaller one for me is, is what I would call a queen yard smoker. I grew up as a queen breeder, so when we're out in the queen yard catching queens, uh, the smaller nooks typically didn't need as much smoke, and the smaller smokers are easier and more manageable to get around and move around through the queen yard. Okay. Um, let's see, I think I've got a question for Brandon. Um, what about robber screens? That's a great question. Um, so for those that don't know, people will use robber screens um, whenever it might be a time of year, it might that they notice that their hive's kind of being picked on by stronger colonies. Um, so they'll use robber screens to try to prevent those robbers coming in. Um, now what it does, it, it usually has some kind of path for the uh, resident bees um, to get out and kind of go forage um, while trying to block the robber bees. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, another thing that you can use. Uh, it's another tool in the toolbox. Um, I've never personally used it, so I can't attest to whether, how good it works, um, how, if it's bad or not for the, the hive itself, the bees that are in there, if it causes a lot of confusion with, with them, I would imagine it would probably cause a little bit of confusion, um, but it's just another thing that you can do. Um, a, you know, a, a really good thing to do is make sure your hives are kind of on the same playing field, make sure your hives um, are very well fed, make sure they have plenty of resources, um, and that will do a lot at stopping rock. All right. Let's see. Um, another one for Stephen, maybe. Is there anything to use in a smoker such as essential oil that could help calm the bees? Not that I'm aware of or have used. There are some products uh, like a vanilla extract when you're doing a smokeless working an artificial smoke uh, that mixed with the right amount of water, which I do not know the recipe, but a couple people on the call might, uh, that can help disrupt the pheromones and calm the bees. We typically use that when we're doing a bee beard. Um, but as far as something to put into the smoker, nothing that I'm aware of a good that we already have products that work well enough on their own as far as calming the bees and and doing a good job with the bees okay I think what I'll do now is um, I have some questions that uh, I think I'll just pose to the group just some that have come in um, here and there um, and let's see if somebody wants to uh, um, tackle it. Um, here's the first one. My bees are hanging out by compost filled containers in the yard. It seems they are feeding on something that they can access through the holes in the containers. Does this mean they are deficient in something or would you consider this just a normal feeding behavior? That's a great question. Actually, uh, you can put me on, Ray. Okay. Uh, what they're doing is they're looking for two possible sources. Uh, water source, because your compost or your uh, actual uh, soil is leaching water out and it can have minor nutrients in there, uh, which they can be attracted to the smell of the minor nutrients. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, here's another one. We just purchased hives this week. Uh, just put them on our 60 acre property yesterday. They are deep on our property and we have no trespassing signs up. Do I still have to put up a fence? So if 
if your property is not zoned agricultural, then you should have at least the portion where the eyes are located fenced off. Um, but it sounds like you're on 60 acres, you probably some type of ag land, so you wouldn't be required to have that fence. It might be a good idea to have a bear fence around them in most parts of Florida, though. Yeah, for sure. Um, bears are really good. If you haven't found your bears, bears will probably find you if you have bee colonies. So putting up some sort of um, bear fence to prevent access for them, or at least hopefully restrict access for the bears um, from destroying your hives. It's a really good idea. It's a good point, Stephen. Okay, I've got another bee yard fence question here. If your bee yard fence is six foot tall, you know, like a traditional wood panel yard fence, do you need an additional flyaway barrier or does this fence meet both fencing and flyaway requirements? No, if you have a six foot fence around your apiary, you're totally good. That will certainly serve the purpose of the flyaway barrier. All right. Now, if it was a chain link fence, that wouldn't work, obviously, because it's not a solid structure. But if it's a wood panel fence, then absolutely. Okay, I've got a question here about can you describe where we are in North Florida and the Panhandle with respect to the honey flow? Mm. Anybody have a good idea about honey flow in the region? Yeah. Tupelo is blooming right now, yeah. just starting to bloom. Um, there's going to be some. Uh, pretty good palmetto flow, a lot of bud on it in about two weeks. Um, be some low bush gallberry. You'll, your best table grade honeys will be produced from now until about mid-May. Uh, I would pull my honey and extract then because the honeys that are made after that will be the popcorn and uh, uh, palm tree honey, stuff like that. It's going to be thinner, waterier honey. Um, so your best high grade table honey will be made in the next five weeks. So I would extract whatever honey's on there. That's going to be wildflower, basically. It's a mix. And your good table grade honey will be made over the next five weeks. Hey, Jeff, have you done any um, recent surveys, maybe, on the Tupelo tree population in just the region? Every, just every day. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just starting to kick up right now. All that north wind, the dry air, that's caused the nectar to kind of hold off. We need some good south southerly breezes with lots of humidity to kind of prime the nectar in those blooms, but the bloom's there. Uh, it'll be blooming really well for about another two weeks, uh, especially around Gulf County, man. Okay, good. I, I know we've, we're still uh, in a way kind of bouncing back from Hurricane Michael with these trees and the overall health. I think I just wondered how far along we were. It's looking good. Um, you know, it's been about a year and a half now, and I'm seeing a lot of good growth and bloom on the trees. So they're trying to rebound. Um, so it, it's looking better. I looked at some of the Apalachicola and Chipola yesterday, and uh, there's more there than I figured would be there this soon after the hurricane. That's great news. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, here's another equipment question. Uh, is it necessary, necessary really to wear gloves when inspecting a hive? No, not at all. And I highly recommend once you get, you know, comfortable in the hive that you try to uh, kind of turn away from doing that if, 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 it's, if you're comfortable enough. Because it's difficult to get a, a good feel for the colony whenever you're wearing gloves. It's a lot easier to agitate them um, because it's harder to feel what you're doing. So it's harder to know whether you're actually pulling that frame up, if you're scraping bees, if you're squishing bees. And usually when you do all this, the bees are gonna be releasing pheromones because you're killing them or you're making them very agitated. Um, so also if they start stinging your gloves, um, those stingers are going to also have that alarm pheromones on it. So I see a lot of people that um, are inspecting hives with gloves on the real thick gloves, um, and they're just covered in stingers because there's just alarm pheromones. And then if you don't wash those gloves appropriately, the next time you go out to your hive, if it's pretty recent, you can also still have those alarm pheromones on you and the bees are going to try to come straight to that spot. Um, what I like to do is if you uh, are okay, kind of going to the next step without the gloves, 
maybe try a nitrile gloves. Um, they're much more flexible. It allows you to feel what you're doing a lot better. Um, but also the bees can still sting through it, but they just don't like you because they're not gonna get uh, a much impact on your skin as they would if you didn't have those nitrile gloves. Um, so that's a really good tool. And a lot of people um, at the lab actually use those. So I'm also the volunteer coordinator here. So I have about 30 volunteers that aren't quite comfortable being in the hives without gloves. And I have them start with nitrile gloves um, in order to feel a little bit more comfortable, but also maybe they won't get stung on their hands as much. You also learn uh, by, by, you know, doing. So if you're wearing big, thick beekeeping gloves and you squish a bee, um, you might not know that like what you're doing is making bees agitated, what behaviors you're doing because you have those gloves on and it's such a thick barrier. Whereas if you don't have gloves or you have the nitrile gloves on, you kind of learn a behavior in the hive. That way the bees uh, are agitated with that particular behavior. That was a long answer. No, but a good answer. <laughs> yeah, I think you learn to respect the bees a lot better barehanded. <laughs> yeah. Another thing about Good. gloves, if you're not using, if you're using traditional bee gloves, don't use your bee gloves to do anything else. If you're using a non-traditional bee glove, you're using gardening gloves or other kinds of leather gloves, you need a pair that are designated to be your bee gloves and don't use them to go mix up fertilizer and dig in the dirt and then turn around and bring that back to the hive. Right, no, no contamination there. Don't use them for your grocery shopping during the social distancing either. Yep, <laughs> right. Um, I bet there's a number of you guys that can uh, have an example of this. Though. Can any of the presenters recommend a comprehensive reference guide for beginning beekeepers? I thought Brandon would say something. Yeah, I was, I was waiting. So I, I don't know about a guide in particular, but the lab offers a lot of really great programs for people that want to get started in beekeeping. Um, a couple things that we always recommend uh, to new beekeepers is a find your local beekeeping club. Um, usually, most counties in Florida have a beekeeping club, um, and I'm sure Jeff could uh, talk more about the, the Panhandle area. But most counties have at least a beekeeping club. Next, we have a lot of resources here, so we have something called uh, Bee College, where people can come um, and learn hands-on. It's a two-day workshop; they can pick whatever classes that they want. Um, you know, that's something to take advantage of as well. But also our online beekeeping, or our master beekeeping program is, uh, is fully online now. So people can go through this multi-year program that teaches you how to get started in beekeeping, the very basics, and it will walk through your journey and grow with you as a beekeeper as you are learning. Um, and it'll teach you what you need to know during that part of your beekeeping journey, which is pretty cool. Yeah, what Brandon said, uh, Florida State Beekeepers has a place, uh, you can go to their site, it's got all the bee clubs listed, and you can check in there and find out what clubs are close to you. All of them are great. Um, the Appalachia over here uh, in Tallahassee and Crawfordville area, they have some of the greatest mentorship I've seen anywhere, but then there's one in Jackson County has you know pretty good mentorship. They really try to concentrate on the new people and help them out. So. Any of those clubs are a great source. And the University of Florida, I can't say enough, uh, Jamie's got videos and stuff on there that are 15 minutes long that will advance your bee knowledge to about three or four years of what you'll just do accidentally on your own. So spend those 15 minutes instead of three years killing bees. Good point. You'll, learn a, you'll learn a lot more coming to the bee colleges just talking with the other beekeepers around there than spending the money to purchase 40 or 50 books to read. Most of the books that are written anyhow are produced uh, in the Northern states. We have two or three that are produced here in Florida. Uh, Malcolm Sanford has a good one out. Yeah, beekeepers are social also. So uh, much like the bees, they learn from each other. 
I know, I know this real well. You eat well at a B club meeting. <laughs> yeah, another incentive. Um, okay, uh, another equipment question. Um, what is the opinion on slotted bottom boards? You mean screen bottom boards, you think? Maybe. Yeah, uh, do they mean screen bottom boards? Oh, you said maybe. Um, I mean, uh, if they mean screen bottom boards, then in Florida in particular, uh, I love to use them um, just because it gets extremely hot here. It allows for additional airflow into the hive. Uh, bees thermoregulate, so they like it about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And so they're constantly trying to achieve that temperature. However, in the summertime here, it gets much hotter than that, uh, potentially in the hive. So it allows them to not work as hard at cooling it off. Um, and on the flip side, during winter, if you're further up north, uh, or if you're joining us from the northern states, uh, it could be something that you might not want to use during winter, uh, just because bees thermoregulate. And if it's 20 or 30 degrees, or if you have snow around, uh, it's harder for them to keep that constant temperature like they want to. Um, so that's kind of the, the pros and cons of these screen bottom boards. Versus yeah, I think he, I think he was referring to slatted racks. There, there is a slotted bottom board. It's in the new bee supplies. I haven't seen anyone using them to get feedback on it. Uh, one concern is keeping debris cleaned out from that tray underneath or having a catch tray underneath it. Uh, it's supposed to be for a small hive beetle um, control, but I don't have any feedback on it as of yet. Uh, so the person questioning, uh, try one out and let us know. All right. Um, another equipment question for Varroa mite treatment. Do the thermal hive heaters work? because they are really expensive. Uh, I'm sure everybody here has probably heard feedback from that. Uh, the feedback I've received is it, it tends to kill some brood, uh, which if you think about the life cycle of the Varroa mite, uh, the Varroa mite's life cycle is dependent on the honeybee life cycle. So when that cell is capped over, that mite is inside the brood reproducing. So if you're killing brood, then you might also be killing Varroa. Uh, but I will, let everybody else tell me their opinion on that. Yeah, it's a very narrow wall or very narrow temperature that you have to reach between killing the bee brood, bees, and the varroa mite. So it's very difficult. Like uh, Brandon said earlier, bees like to thermoregulate. So if you're trying to heat up a hive to reach that temperature to kill the varroa mite, the bees are working against it, so they're stressing themselves out also, uh, the brood and the bees, the adult bees. So. And but what do we know about stress? <laughs> stress is bad, right? <laughs> stress is not good, especially when you're socially distancing. Yeah. <laughs> I will add, though, there's a lot of um, different mite treatments on the market, and um, uh, uh, Jeff, sorry, Jeff, uh, Jeff did a really good, uh, in his talk, he talked a little bit about monitoring, uh, with different roles and he, he talked about the alcohol wash. It is, it, it's really important that if you wanted to try one of these mic treatments to make sure you get, uh, a sample, a role of your, and get an idea of where your mic population is before and after the treatment. That way you know if it works or not, because if you go into it blindly, there's, you, do, you have no way of knowing if it works or not. So if you did want to try the, the thermo uh, mic treatment, um, make sure you do a mic check before and after and let us know. Yeah, any treatment you use on mites, please do it before and after. Do it before to determine if you even need to, because any treatment's going to be some stress to the hive, but especially after to see if it's effective, because I've seen treatments work really well during a really dry time, not work at all during a humid time, depending on what you're using. 
there are caveats with every one of these treatments. And I could have spoken an hour just about the treatments. So please research them closely and check before and after you treat. And I'll add the Honeybee Health Coalition has a really great guide on their website for varroa monitoring, varroa treatments, um, just varroa everything. So if you go to honeybeehealthcoalition.org, I think, or well, Google Honeybee Health Coalition and um, find their pages on varroa. It's really, really great. They talk about step-by-step -step how to do monitoring. They talk you through every treatment. They have a decision tool so you can type in your mite loads, type in what time of year it is, if you're on a honey flow or if you're not, what your goal is in your apiary, if you're trying to be more natural or organic with your treatments um, versus if you're okay with more harsher chemical treatments. Um, and it will help you with determining which treatments and which applications to use in your operation. So that's a, that's a really, really great, great resource as well. All right. Um, there's sort of a, a rules and regulations question here. Are, are there any more state rules being added in the near future? Is there anything coming down the road that people should be aware of now? Um, so right now, the rules aren't open for any changes. Um, one of the things that I would say is maybe on the horizon down the road is we're trying to work on improving our clean certification program. Um, but again, that's not something that, like, there's no proposed rule changes or anything at this time um, that, that I am aware of, at least. So. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a good one, um, and this is something that I've run across. Um, it seems like every year. If bees have found a pool as a water source, what can a pool owner do to deter bees from using pool, the pool as a water source? Put up a screen. <laughs> That's about the only thing they can do. Set the bees down and talk to them and tell them you don't want them coming to the pool. <laughs> you got this explain social distancing to the bees. So, yeah, it's very hard once they've found a swimming pool to deter them. Uh, the beekeeper can move the hive that's closest to them, and yet you'll still find out that the feral bees are going to the swimming pool. They're attracted to the actual, either the salt smell or the chlorine smell that's coming out either way. Yeah, if you're, if you're a new beekeeper and you're getting ready to, you know, buy your packages or buy your, um, your nuts to set up your apiary, go ahead and establish your water source before or around at the same time that you're installing your bees. Um, that will help them if they have a water source that's more conveniently located in their own yard, then it will deter them from traveling farther to find water at the neighbor's pool, for example. Um, but yeah, Basically, the best the best thing to do in that case is try to set up your water source ahead of time because, they, like David said, like once they found the pool, there's not there's not a whole lot you can do to train them to not go there. It's a big bee pool party. Exactly. Yeah. And, and when you set up your water source, it's a good idea to add something either like a little bit of Sprite or lemon lime soda, something to attract your bees to it. You might attract your neighbor's bees too, but at least you'll get them trained. I, I wonder if they serve uh, Corona beer at the bee pool parties. Bad bee pun. <laughs> All right, uh, next question here. What does it cost to have a state inspector come out and inspect your hives? So there's not a fee for the inspection. There is the registration fee every year that beekeepers have to pay. So that's based on the number of colonies that you maintain in your operation. So if you maintain between one and five colonies, then you pay a $10 a year registration fee. Um, your inspector will come out and do your inspection. That's included in your registration. If there's an a need for additional inspections within the year, let's say, you know, you just have something going on. If it's, if it's a pest or disease concern, then we're not, you're likely not going to be charged anything extra. If you know it's a repeated occurrence, then there is a $25 plus mileage special inspection fee that can be charged. But for the most part, um, 
inspectors are able to go out and do inspections. There are certain additional fees, like if you're trying to move fees out of state and we have to issue an out of state permit, there's a $25 fee for a special permit, or, or sorry, for an out of state permit. Um, and for queen certification, there's a $25 certification fee. And if samples need to be pulled, there's $10 sampling fee. But just your routine, normal inspections, there's no additional charge other than your registration fee each year. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I purchased a split hive with a young bee, which is not a good layer. Anything I can do to help her start laying? If you purchased a nuke that has a new queen in it and she's not laying very well or not doing correctly, I would talk to the person you purchased it from if it's a commercial beekeeper and getting new queen. Uh, a queen that's not properly mated cannot be boosted unless it's a bee numbers. If there's a very small number of uh, bees in the hive, then it could be, you know, that you don't have enough bees in there. You might need to boost it, meaning add more bees. Yeah, you got to remember the bee queen, the queen will only lay as much brood as the workers there can take care of. So until you get a larger number of bees, she's not going to lay a full box. So it takes a little time for progression. Uh, you look at the pattern. Is she missing cells as she lays? Then she's there's a problem. But if she's only got a hand sized pattern, but every cell has got a, a larva in it, then it's just because there's not enough bees there. Okay. Uh, another equipment question here. How do you wash your bee suit? What detergents or bleach should I avoid? So here what we do is we made sure that we had a washer that did not have what's it called? Agitator, Agitator in it. Um, and we just wash them with whatever detergents on sale. Um, I don't know if anybody else has a better answer for that. I know this much. You don't want to wash and dry your bee suit if it has a lot of propolis on it in your wife's brand new washer and dryer. <laughs> you will surely get an upset wife. Same with your shoes coming in, your carpet, or your gloves in there. Uh, you've got gloves that you've been handling, you know, Bego or Honey Robber or anything. You don't want to leave them in your car. Uh, and you don't want to wash them and throw them in the dryer because they'll still smell. Okay. All righty. I've got a, I've got another uh, inspection question here. Can you talk a little bit more about the typical hive inspection? Or what are you looking for on the frames? Yeah, what I generally look for, um, I'm looking to see how well that queen's performing in the hive. I check her pattern to see if she's filling each cell up and if I've got good cat brood. Then I'm gonna look at the health of the brood itself. Does it have a nice raised cap? Do I have pearly white larva? Are they nice and healthy looking? Then around the edge of that brood, I should find a band of pollen. So I'm gonna look for the pollen and see if I see different colors of pollen being posted there. And then up in the top edge in the corners, I should see some cat honey or fresh nectar. If I see all of that, I know they've got good nutrition, they've got a good laying queen, and the pest and pestilence doesn't seem to be a factor. And those are the three keys I look for, good queen, nutrition, and disease and pest. If none of that, if all of that's in order, the hive's gonna be in pretty good shape. Um, but those are the main things I'm looking at in the hive. I don't necessarily look at the queen, you can't really tell from her, you look at her performance. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, let's see. What kind of preparation needs to be taken when inclement weather, um, like a hurricane, is imminent? Any, any, any tips on that? On any kind yeah, of you can answer that one. Sure, go ahead. Who? David. What did David? No, let Jeff answer it. Oh, <laughs> I thought you said you got an answer. 
Uh, if it's Hurricane Michael, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, but if you have a storm coming, uh, putting a ratchet strap around the hive so that it can't be blown apart, um, leaning up against a building or tight screwing it off to a building or something so that it can't be blown away, something heavier um, are good ideals. A lot of people put rocks and stuff on top of their lids. We have to get some really nasty weather before a lid's gonna blow off because the bees propolize that pretty well. Um, but during a storm like that, you try to get them you know, as, as much as possible stabilized. If they get blown over and they're still together, you can just stand them up. But if they get blown over and those boxes are pulled apart and it rains inside the nest, it can kill the queen, it can hurt her. Um, so the ratchet strap's essential. And if you can kind of, you know, strap them off to something a little heavier, that's great. <laughs> uh, but wind damage is the biggest thing. It has to get pretty nasty before it blows a hive over most of the time. Just to add to that, um, like Jeff said, it's gotta be really nasty for it to blow the hive over. A huge problem during hurricane season is actually flooding. So it's really important to kind of identify where your hives are in your apiary. And if there's areas prone to flooding, get them to higher land, pick them up. Uh, like I said, some, some people will have their hives on uh, pallets or maybe the stands will be a little bit lower to the ground. So make sure they're picked up off the ground. That way you're not going to have an issue with flooding because if you have water entering into your colony, it could be really bad. But also if you have feeder jars or anything that could blow over in the wind, uh, make sure you take those off your colony. Otherwise you're going to have glass all over the place and it's going to be, uh, be an even bigger issue. And also to add to that, um, if you have your colonies like out under a big shade tree or oak tree in your backyard, um, you might want to think about moving them. Um, at the bee biology unit here at UF, we had a few years ago during one of the storms, um, a huge tree limb fell down and busted about five or six of the colonies open, um, broke the boxes, broke the frames, there were bees everywhere. So. Um, Watching out for trees or other things that might fall on the hives, flooding, making sure they're in not in too much of a low lying area, and securing the hives um, if there's expected to be a lot of wind. Those are kind of the three main things I can think of. All right, great info there. Um, let's see. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So in Northeast Florida, when we do have a few cold spells, should we switch to a regular bottom board from the, instead of the screen bottom board for those few days and nights? I think that goes back to trying to figure out how strong your colony is. If you have a, a healthy colony, um, I don't think it's going to do much harm um, because it's going to, it's probably just going to be staggered. You might have a couple of days where in the morning it's pretty cold um, and that might go on for a few days. It's not going to be uh, weeks or months that it's below freezing. Um, it could be an issue. But if you have a healthy colony, uh, they should be able to thermoregulate for a day or two or three and be completely fine. Now, if you have a colony that has one or two frames of bees um, in a 10 frame, in the 10 frame um, hive, you probably have bigger issues than, than just switching out bottom board. Apparently it's not the freezing night that is the problem. They can withstand the freezing temperature and thermoregulate if the hive is adequate. It's the wind chill that is going to cause the damage. So you're looking at whether or not you're going to have a wind with the cold and what your wind chill will be is more of a factor than the actual temperature. If you're going to try to block that, you could replace the bottom board or put something underneath the, that screen bottom board or preferably slide something in on top of the screen. That way the bees can still keep cleaning it. If you set anything of solid surface under that screen, you're going to have to clean that out periodically. Uh, so you don't want to leave it in there long term. It uh, diminishes the purpose of the screen bottom board. Something else to pay attention to in like colder weather is making sure that your hive has enough resources, has enough like leaves some of that honey in that honey super. 
That way, if there is an extended period where, you know, it's too cold for bees to go out and forage or there just isn't any nectar available, um, they might be able to thermoregulate in the hive, but if they are completely empty of food stores, then that could be a problem um, for them and they might starve out. So just making sure that before cold weather comes, your hive has adequate nutrition um, will try to will also help, help with survival. Yeah, up here we like to go into winter with at least one super above the brood chamber full of honey. Um, that way you've got enough resources there. If you have a week of cold weather, they've got enough food to, to keep the hive warm. Jeffrey, what do you mean by one week of cold weather? <laughs> well, we haven't had that in a few years, but way back when I can remember when we actually had frost on the ground for more than one day at a time. It actually Whoa. several days that we don't um, The last few winters haven't been a big issue. <laughs> we kind of moved towards the uh, one day of above freezing is a, is a good week. Yeah, you, you're a little bit different environment up there. <laughs> <laughs> what we call cold weather, you call summer. <laughs> well, I know. I had an inch and a half of snow yesterday, or a day before yesterday. <laughs> Haven't seen snow in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just I just picked blackberries yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a bunch of blackberries, picked a big old bag full. So it's it's really fun to watch the dandelions poke through the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Ray, are there any more burning? Are there any more burning questions that that uh, haven't been already addressed uh, today? Or I know we're here at the time limit here, the three o'clock time. Uh, there's a, I'm gonna make a couple of announcements uh, here. Uh, please, uh, like. Uh, everybody, I'm going to be sending out a survey on Eventbrite to all the participants. And so all the participants, if you would please fill out the survey that helps us with um, with knowing how we did with this program and also uh, getting the results from the program that we share with our uh, stakeholders to show that we were an effective, uh, an effective activity. So please fill out the survey and I'm going to share all the sh survey results with, it's an online survey, it's very quick and easy and I'll send the survey results to all of the participants when we have those compiled. So, I mean, all the uh, panelists, all the panelists here will get the copy of the survey. So you can use that for your own uh, reporting if you need it. Um, another thing, um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for, for taking time out of their busy schedules to, to uh, make this possible. We couldn't have done it without your expertise. Uh, and, and there's lots of valuable information shared today. And what, what's great about, you know, it's sad we couldn't all get together and because I know the beekeeping in the panhandle is uh, as much as a learning activity is a good, really good networking activity for everybody to meet all the different beekeepers in the area and even from outside of the state and to share our stories. But hopefully we did some of that today and hopefully in the future we can gather again together in person. So um, were there any more burning questions, Ray, for the panel before we sign off? We have a number of questions remaining. My thought is maybe we can take some of the answer some of these questions in some of, uh, maybe a, a newsletter, like an email, like a newsletter, and then get back to everybody. I think so that'd be great. And compile them and send them out to the 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 the, the Eventbrite list. Then, yes, that'd be terrific. It registered. Okay, uh, is there a way to save these questions? Um, that might I think be a Scott. That might be yes, a Scott. yes, there is. Okay. So we'll get those would, panelists. Would you mind answering some of these questions uh, through email and we send them out to the people? Sure. Okay. I think I've already so, answered one or two. Okay, great. So I'd like to thank all of you and thank all of you participants for joining us today. It was a great event and we hope to see you in the future uh, soon in person or at another one of these. We might do another one of these before the, the fall. Who knows? We might plan something else. So Thank you all very much. And I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dave. Bye. Bye.